Talmud, Mosque, Eretha, A-C-H-A-P-T-E-R, I Mishnah, there are in the Torah 36 transgressions which are punishable with extinction when one has intercourse with his mother, his father's wife, or his daughter-in-law, when a man has connection with a male or covers a beast, or when a woman allows herself to be covered by a beast, when one has intercourse with a woman and her daughter, with a married woman, with his sister, with his father's sister, his mother's sister, his wife's sister, his brother's wife, the wife of his father's brother, or with a menstruous woman, when one blasphemes the Lord, serves idols, dedicates of his children to Molech, or has a familiar spirit, or desecrates the Sabbath, when an unclean person eats of sacrificial food, or when one enters the precincts of the temple in an unclean state, when one eats hell of blood, not heart, or pickle, when one slaughters, or offers up a consecrated animal outside the temple precincts, when one eats anything leavened on Passover, when one eats or works on the Day of Atonement when one compounds oil of anointing or compounds incense or uses unlawfully oil of anointing and when one transgresses the laws of the Paschal offering and circumcision from among positive commandments for these transgressions one is liable to extinction if committed willfully and if in error to a sin offering and if there is a doubt whether he had committed the transgression to a suspense of guilt offering except in the case of one who defiled it. Temple or its consecrated thing, since one is liable in this case to a sliding scale sacrifice, thus are many while the sages say also the blasphemer is an exception for it says, Ye shall have one law for him that doth not in error. This is to exclude the blasphemer who performs no action. Talmud, Mosque, Hirath, Bikamara, why has a number been mentioned in the Mishnah said, Are Yohanan to tell you that if one commits all these transgressions in one spell of unawareness, he is liable to it. Sacrifice for each of them again as to that which we have learned there are 39 principal categories of work prohibited on the Sabbath why has a number been mentioned there to tell you that if one does them all in one spell of unawareness he is liable to a sacrifice for each of them again as to that which we have learned there are four who require an act of atonement why has a number been mentioned there to exclude the view of our Eliezer B. Jacob who holds that there are five as we have learned our Eliezer B. Jacob says a proselyte who requires atonement and may not eat of sacred things until the blood of the sacrifice has been sprinkled this is why the number four has been mentioned again as to that which we have learned in four instances one brings the same sacrifice for willful transgression as for transgression in error why has a number been mentioned there to exclude the view of our Simeon for it has been taught our Simeon holds that in the case of the false oath Concerning a deposit, willful transgression is not executable by a sacrifice. This is why the number four has been mentioned there again. As to that which we have learned, there are five instances where one sacrifice is brought for several transgressions. Why has a number been mentioned? Because it wishes to state in the sequel and a Nazi right who became unclean several times. Now this is rendered possible if he became defiled on the seventh clean day and then again on the seventh day and in accordance with the view of our Jose, son of our Judah, who maintains that the Nazi right ship of cleanness begins to operate from the seventh day. For according to Rabbi who holds that the Nazi right ship of cleanness does not become operated before the eighth day, how is this rendered possible if he was defiled on the seventh day and then again on the seventh? The whole is one protracted period of uncleanness, and if he was defiled on the eighth day and then again on the eighth, since he had passed the time when it Sacrifice became due, he should be liable to a separate offering for each defilement. It is thus proved that that mission is in accordance with our Jose, son of Arjuna, where is the dispute between Rabbi and our Jose, son of Arjuna, as it has been taught, and he shall hallow his head the same day refers to the day of the bringing of the sacrifice, says Rabbi, our Jose, son of Arjuna, says to the day of the cutting of his hair again, as to that which we have learned, five must bring a sliding scale offering. Why has a number been mentioned there? Because it says in the sequel the same applies to the ruler, he thus mentions the number five to exclude the view of our Eliezer, who holds that a ruler brings a goat as an offering again, as to that which we have learned, there are four principal categories of damage. Why has a number been mentioned there to exclude the view of our Ashai, who holds there are thirteen such categories, but then why has our Ashai mentioned a number to exclude the view of our Hayahu? Holds that there are 24 such categories, but then why has our high mentioned a number to exclude an informer and one who renders a sacrifice? Pickle the master said, if one commits all these transgressions in one spell of unawareness, one is liable to a sacrifice for each of them. It is well that you could not declare him exempted altogether, for it is written, for whosoever shall do any of these abominations, even the souls that do them shall be cut off. But why not say if he commits one transgression of these, he is liable to one sacrifice. If he transgresses them all in one spell of unawareness, he is still liable only to one offering. Replied Aryohan, and it is for this reason that the penalty of Karath has been specially mentioned in connection with his sister to intimate that each of them requires a separate atonement. Rbbb Abedimer to this, why not say in the case of his sister, which scripture has singled out a separate offering is required, but as to the other. Transgressions there should be but one sacrifice for them all since they have been committed under one spell of unawareness but as to RBBB Abbe does he not accept the general principle which has been taught if a law has been included in a class and has then been singled out for some specification this specification applies not only to that law but to the whole class for instance scripture reads and the soul that eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offering now was not the peace offering included in the general class of consecrated things why has it been singled out to make consecrated things analogous for the purpose of this law to the peace offerings as the peace offerings are dedications to the altar and for this reason one is liable on their account to Karath so also whatever are dedications to the altar one is liable on account thereof to Karath this excludes dedications for the temple repair fund RBB might reply from this very very the one can prove the contrary did you not say that dedications for the temple repair fund were to be excluded likewise here argue in a similar manner just as his sister is distinguished in that it is a relation which can never be permitted in the lifetime of the man who renders her forbidden so must the others be such relatives as cannot be permitted in the lifetime of those who render them forbidden this excludes a married woman who can be permitted during the lifetime of him who renders her forbidden said Arjona or as some say Arjuna the son of Arjashua scripture says for whosoever shall do any of these abominations etc all other forbidden relations are thus made analogous to his sister just as in the case of his sister one is liable on her account to a separate offering so also in all other cases one is liable to a separate offering for each transgression but according to our Isaac who holds all transgressions liable to Garth have been comprised in a general statement and it Reason that Karath has been singled out in the case of his sister is to render the offense subject to the penalty of Karath and not lashes wherefrom does he then derive that separate offerings have to be brought for each transgression he derives it from and thou shalt not approach unto a woman while she is a nida by her uncleanness a separate offering is brought for each woman but as to the rabbis let them derive the law relating to separate offerings from unto a woman while she is a nida by her uncleanness indeed they do and for which purpose then has the penalty of Karath been mentioned in the case of his sister to teach that separate sacrifices be brought for intercourse with his sister his father's sister and his mother's sister but is a text necessary to separate these various offenses are these transgressions not of different denominations and committed with different persons rather say that three separate sacrifices be required in the case of Intercourse with his sister who is at the same time his father's sister and his mother's sister and whence will our Isaac derive this he will derive it from the latter part of the verse he hath uncovered his sister's nakedness and for which purpose do the rabbis apply his sister in the latter part of the verse they apply it Talmud, Mosque Eretha to his sister who is his father's daughter and his mother's daughter and to teach you that the trespass of Allah deduced ad majus is not punishable. Our Isaac on the other hand holds that it is punishable or if you will I can say he will derive the inclusion of the full sister in the pronouncement of punishment from its inclusion in the pronouncement of prohibition said our Eliezer in the name of our Hashai wherever two negative commands are combined in one collective pronouncement of the penalty of Karath separate sin offerings are to be brought for each of them where is this exemplified in the instances of one who compounds or uses it. Sacred oil of anointment for it is written upon the flesh of man shall it not be poured neither shall ye make any like it according to the composition thereof whilst as to the one pronouncement of Karath it is written whosoever compounded any like it or whosoever putteth any of it upon a stranger he shall be cut off from his people now according to this rule since
follows when one compounds incense or compounds the oil or uses the oil of anointing wherefore has he separated the laws relating to oil one from the other if not to let us know that separate sin offerings are to be brought for them this proves that when a man has connection with a male whom has the tana in mind if a male then you must omit the instance of the woman that is covered by a beast and you are one short if a woman you must omit the instances of the man who has connection with a male or covers a beast and you are short of two set are you had and indeed the tana refers to a male but read thus when a male has connection with a male or causes a male to have connection with him and the mission is in accordance with our Ishmael who holds that one is liable to two sin offerings but since the case of the blasphemer is stated in the latter clause of the mission and has been explained in accordance with our Akiba, have we not to assume that also the earlier clause is in accordance with our Akiba, and if you should argue that the mission is indeed according to our Akiba, but that he himself agrees with our Ishmael's view in the case dealt with in the earlier clause, I would retort, did not our Abab say if a man has connection with a man or causes a man to have connection with him on the view of our Ishmael who derives these prohibitions from two different texts, viz. thou shalt not lie with mankind, and neither shall there be a Sodomite of the sons of Israel, he is liable to two sin offerings, but according to our Akiba, he is liable to one sin offering, since he derives both prohibitions from one and the same text, viz. thou shalt not lie with mankind, interpreting this, thou shalt not cause mankind to lie with thee. Rather, you must say the first clause is according to our Ishmael, but in the case of the blasphemer, he agrees with our Akiba. If so, the mission should have also stated when a man covers a beast or causes a beast to cover him, surely Abay said if a man covers a Beast and causes a beast to cover him even according to our Ishmael he is liable to one offering only because the scriptural text refers to human males only our Eliezer in the name of Rab said the Tana of our Mishnah meant to imply the possibility of one person bringing 33 sin offerings and he mentions the other three instances in order to complete the list of sins punishable with Kareth for it reads in the concluding clause when one transgresses the laws of the Paschal offering and circumcision from among positive commandments now wherefore have the laws concerning the Paschal lamb and circumcision been enumerated should you say to intimate that one has to offer a sacrifice on their account but does one bring a sacrifice on their account has it not been taught all the laws of the Torah have been brought into analogy with idolatry as ye shall have one law for him that doth in error and but the person that doth with a high hand just as the law concerning Idolatry is the subject of a prohibition so have all other transgressions to be the subjects of a prohibition this therefore proves that the Tana speaks of 33 transgressions committed in error and that the other three cases have been mentioned only for the purpose of completing the list of sins punishable with Kareth this proves that when one desecrates the Sabbath it was remarked are there not 39 different classes of work on Sabbath said Aryohan and Artana speaks of it. Case where one was in error in respect of the Sabbath but aware of the prohibition of the various kinds of work thereon in which case one is liable to one sacrifice only for it has been taught how is these resulting in one if one is in error in respect of the Sabbath but aware of the prohibition of various kinds of work but why does not the Tana speak of the case where one was aware of the Sabbath and in error in respect to the prohibition of the various kinds of labor making him then? Liable to 39 sin offerings for has it not been taught and shall do any one of these transgressions sometimes one is liable to one offering for all transgressions and sometimes to an offering for each of them how is one resulting in these if he was aware of the Sabbath and an error in respect of the work Artana prefers to state the instance of the error in respect of the Sabbath and awareness of the prohibition of the various kinds of work to let us know that one is not altogether exempted from a sin offering in such a case and you must likewise explain the instance of idolatry of which our mission speaks as referring to an error in respect of the idol but with an awareness of the prohibition of the forms of idolatry's worship how is error in respect of the idol to be understood shall I say that he stood in a house of idolatry and thinking it was a synagogue prostrate himself but then his heart was directed towards heaven again if he saw a statue and Prostrate himself to it then if he accepted it as a deity he is subject to stoning on the other hand if he did not acknowledge it as a deity what has he done rather he served idols out of love or fear of a fellow man that is right according to Abbe who holds one is liable in such a case but according to Rabbah who says that one is exempted how is it to be understood Talmud, Mosque Herathoth be rather it is to be understood where he thought that the worship of idols was permitted for Rabbis. Question to Arnaman was whether one is liable to one offering or to two that one should be exempted altogether was never suggested by him or Papa said it is possible where one had been captured as a child by heathens he would know that idolatry was forbidden but not that these particular idols were forbidden or if you wish I may say that they can occur also with an adult where he heard in the interpretation of the verse ye shall not make with the gods of silver or gods of gold etc. and Assume that only the prostration before idols of gold or silver was forbidden but not of any other material this would then be a case of error in respect of the idol and awareness of the prohibition of the forms of worship Araha the son of R.I.K. said in the name of R.B.B. Artana enumerates Sabbath as a class and idolatry as a class whence do we know this it says with a woman and her daughter or with a married woman now there is still the case of his daughter from a woman outraged by him. Which is not mentioned in the mission but I might retort the reason of this omission is that the laws written in the Torah are mentioned the laws not written in the Torah are not mentioned surely there are still the instances of his wife's daughter her daughter's daughter and her son's daughter which are written in the Torah and yet not mentioned in our mission you are thus obliged to say that the whole class of woman and daughter is meant to be implied in the mission is similarly interpret. The mission is referring to the class of Sabbath and the class of idolatry Araha the son of R.I.K. found that he or B.B. contradicted himself for how could R.B.B. Abbe say here Artana enumerates the Sabbath as a class and idolatry as a class was it not stated if one offered up the sacrificial limbs of an offering slaughtered inside the temple precincts outside the temple court one is liable similarly if he offered up outside limbs of an offering that was slaughtered outside the temple precincts he is liable and in connection with this R.B.B. Abbe himself raised the difficulty if so how does the mission state there are in the Torah 36 transgressions punishable with extinction are there not 37 such transgressions since there are the two cases of one offering up outside sacrificial portions now what is his difficulty since one can retort that the Tana states the offering up as a class what comparison is there the laws of Sabbath and of idolatry? Are stated elsewhere in their proper place in a mission when being mentioned here again in connection with Karath it suffices to enumerate Sabbath and idolatry as types but as to the laws of offering up where is the place in a mission that they have been stated that you could reply in the same manner our Jeremiah put the following query before our zero what is the ruling when two separate pronouncements of Karath are attended by only one negative command he replied you refer I suppose to slaughtering and offering up outside the temple precincts but are there not in this case two negative commands for according to him who derived slaughtering from Gezerah Shawah based upon the common term have I mentioned in connection with slaughtering and offering up just as in the latter the text did not pronounce punishment without having expressed a warning so also in the former it has not pronounced punishment without an intended implicit warning and according to him who derives if from a Hekish the verse says there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings and there thou shalt do all that I command the scripture has thus compared slaughtering and offering up just as in the case of offering up it has not pronounced punishment without having expressed a warning so also with slaughtering it did not pronounce punishment without an intended implicit warning your query is perhaps in regard to two separate pronouncements of the death penalty attended by only one negative command as is the case with the OB and Yido and I he replied on this there is a dispute between our Yohanan and Resh Lakish for among the transgressions punishable by stoning we find enumerated both the BALOB and Yido and I and the question was raised why was Yido and I mentioned in connection with stoning but omitted in connection with Karath whereupon our Yohanan replied because they were both under one negative command and the reason why BALOB and not Yido and I was chosen is that in Scripture B.A.L.O.B. is mentioned first while Resh Lakish said that it is because the offense of Yido and I involves no action why did not Resh Lakish say as Aryohan and said our Papa because he holds these two laws are after all stated separately in respect of the pronouncement of the death penalty while Aryohan maintains that only where there are separate negative
Action was not essential while Aryul Hanan said the ruling might conform even to the view of the rabbis for the bending of stature was to be considered as an action it thus appears that in the opinion of Resh Lakish the rabbis do not consider the bending of stature an action how then can the clapping of the arms be regarded as an action what then will you maintain that when Resh Lakish stated that the clapping of the arms is considered an action it was made on the view of our Akiva but that according to the rabbis it was not to be considered an action why in this case does a Mishnah state this is to exclude the blasphemer who performs no action it should have stated this is to exclude the blasphemer and the BALOB the Mishnah mentions one of two as an example but then let it mention BALOB instead of the blasphemer the explicit exclusion of the blasphemer was necessary for I might otherwise have thought that since the pronouncement of Karat in his case is in Juxtaposition to laws relating to offerings, the rabbis agreed with our Akiva with regard to the blasphemer. Therefore, the Mishnah teaches us that this is not so. Allah said, Balob mentioned in the Mishnah means the offering of incense to the prince of the demons. Rabbah demurred to this. If this is so, is not this idolatry? Rather, Rabbah explained it means he offers incense to a demon in order to exorcise him. Abay to this. If so, is this not identical with one who charms? He replied, The Torah has said that one who charms after this matter is liable to death by stoning. And what kind of charm then is subject to a mere negative command? He replied, As has been taught, and one who indeed charms implies both the charmer of large and of small animals, even the charmer of a snake or scorpion is guilty. Said Abay, it is prohibited to cast a spell over a wasp and a scorpion, but if they follow him, it is permitted according to our Yohanan, who holds that the bending of stature is regarded as an Action why should not also the curving Talmud, Mosque Eratha of the lips be considered an action said Rabbi different it is with the blasphemer for it is the disposition of his heart that affects the sin but elsewhere the curving of the lips would be considered an action our Zara demur to this we have learned so memem witnesses are exempt from an offering because they have done no action why is this so is it not written in connection with them by the mouth of two witnesses said Rabbi. So memem witness two are an exception because the basis of evidence is seen when one eats halab our rabbis taught the text yeshali no halab of ox or sheep or goat intimates that one is liable to a separate flagellation for each kind of halab thus our Ishmael but the sages say one is liable only once shall we say that this difference of opinion is based on the following principle our Ishmael holds one is liable to a separate flagellation for each specification of a collective. Prohibition while the rabbis hold that one is not liable to a separate flagellation no Arishmael indeed holds that one is ordinarily not liable separately for each specification of a collective prohibition but our case is an exception because the text is superfluous for it should read ye shall not eat any hell of why specify a box or sheep or goat if not for the purpose of establishing a separate prohibition for each of them and the rabbis they argue if ox or sheep or goat were not mentioned I might have said that also the hell of a beast of chase is included it is for this reason that ox or sheep or goat was written to tell us that only the hell of a box sheep or goat is forbidden but that of the beast of chase is permitted the rabbis thus argue well do they not rather this is the reason of Arishmael he holds that if it were as the rabbis say scripture should have written ye shall eat no hell of an ox why have sheep and goat been mentioned if not for the purpose of Establishing a separate prohibition for each of them, the rabbis on the other hand argue that if the divine law wrote no hell of an ox, I might have thought that the term ox here was to be analogous to ox mentioned in connection with Sabbath, as in the case of Sabbath, the beast of chase and the fowl were included. So also in connection with the eating of hell of the beast of chase and fowl are included. It is for this reason that ox or sheep or goat were enumerated to teach us that only the hell of these is forbidden, but that of the beast of chase and the fowl is permitted. The rabbis thus argue well, rather this is the reason of Arishmael he holds scripture should have written, Ye shall eat no hell of sheep or ye shall eat no hell of goat. Why enumerate ox or sheep or goat if not in order to establish a separate prohibition for each of them? The rabbis on the other hand argue had scripture mentioned only no hell of sheep might have assumed that only the hell of sheep was. Forbidden, but that of ox and goat was permitted. And if you were to ask why should sheep be an exception, the retort would be because it was singled out and that its fat tail is offered upon the altar, even as our Hanania taught. Why has Scripture enumerated separately the emirim of the ox and the emirim of the sheep and the emirim of the goat, as it is written? But the firstling of an ox, etc. It is necessary for if ox alone was written, I would not have derived sheep and goat from it, for I might object that ox was an exception since it is singled out with regard to libations. Had the divine law written only sheep, so that ox and goat should be derived from it, I might object that sheep was an exception since it was singled out and that its fat tail is offered upon the altar. Had the divine law written only goat, so that ox and sheep should be derived from it, I might object that goat was an exception since it was singled out as the offering for idolatry. We thus cannot derive from any. Single one the other two but why did not scripture mention two and we might have derived the third from them which one shall we derive ox from sheep and goat I might object that sheep and goat were an exception since they were both singled out to be offered as a paschal sacrifice if scripture would not have written sheep leaving us to derive it from ox and goat I would have objected that ox and goat were an exception since they were both singled out as offerings for idolatry if it would not have written goat leaving us to derive it from ox and sheep I would have objected that ox and sheep were exceptions in that they were both singled out in some aspect regarding the altar hence they cannot be derived one from the other did not then the rabbis argue well rather the reason of our Ishmael is indeed as has been said at the outset is that if it were so scripture should have written ye shall eat no hell of and no more and as to your objection that the mention of ox sheep and goat was necessary to teach that the hell of a beast of chase was permitted. Surely the text in question occurs in connection with a similar text which relates to consecrated animals, and the law is always illuminated by its context. This implies, does it not, that the rabbis do not hold that a law is illuminated by its context? No, all agree that a law is illuminated by its context, but here they differ in the following. Our Ishmael holds that such a law which is the subject of a mere negative command is illuminated by its context, whether the latter is likewise the subject of a mere negative command or of one involving karath, while the rabbis hold that a law which is the subject of a mere negative command is illuminated by its context, which is the subject of a mere negative command, but a law which is the subject of a mere negative command is not illuminated by a context which is the subject of a negative command involving karath, or if you wish I can say that. The reason of the rabbis is that the enumeration of the various kinds of fat was necessary to teach that which is intimated in a question of Armari to Arzi, but if so why should not the fat tail of non-consecrated animals be altogether forbidden? He replied it is to provide against an argument such as yours that scripture specifies all hell of a ox sheep or goat to teach us that only those portions of fat which these three animals have in common are forbidden to the exclusion of the fat tail. The enumeration of ox sheep and goat is thus for the purpose of permitting for use the fat tail of unconsecrated animals or Ishmael on the other hand will argue it for this reason scripture should have said no hell of a ox and sheep therefore when goat was added it was for the purpose of establishing a separate prohibition for each of them said Arhan and Arishmael however agrees that with regard to offerings only one sin offering is brought for the several kinds of hell of what is the reason? Because this prohibition is not like that relating to incestuous relations our sages have taught it is written and he shall do any one sin and also and shall do these this is to render one liable for each transgression separately so that if one ate e.g. two portions of hell of the same designation under two separate spells of unawareness he is liable to two offerings similarly if the portions were of two different designations though they were consumed under one spell of unawareness. One is liable to two offerings said Rami son of Habitu Arhistah it is right that where the portions were of one designation but consumed under two spells of unawareness one should be liable to two offerings because the break in the spell of unawareness affected a division between the two meals but why should one be liable to two offerings in the case where the portions were of different designations and consumed under one spell of unawareness surely we need a break in the spell of Unawareness to affect a division which is not the case here he replied here we deal with the case where he ate hell of nahar when he is liable on account of nahar and on account of hell of said he to him if so he should be liable also on account of the consecrated flesh rather said arshis hated refers to one who ate the hell of a consecrated anim
Nibble one is liable on two counts. Similarly, if one eats hella of consecrated animals, one is liable on two counts. Arjuna holds in the case of hella of consecrated animals, one is liable on three counts. Said Arshus by Jaraba, it is well on the view of Arjuna for this reason are written three verses. It shall be a perpetual statute, etc. Ye shall eat no hella of an ox or sheep or goat, and there shall no common man eat of the holy things constituting three negative commands. But what is the reason? Of the rabbis, they hold the negative command, it shall be a perpetual statute, etc. deals with consecrated animals, and the negative command, no hellab of an ox, deals with unconsecrated animals, and both texts were necessary for if the divine law had written only that of consecrated animals, I might have said that only the hellab of consecrated animals was forbidden by reason of their stringency, but that of unconsecrated animals was not included in the prohibition, therefore the divine law wrote no hellab of an ox, and if only no hellab of an ox was written, I might have thought that only the hellab of unconsecrated animals was forbidden because it has not been excluded from the general prohibition, but as to the hellab of consecrated animals, since it has been excluded from the general prohibition, I might have thought that since it is thus excluded, their fat is permitted, therefore both texts are necessary. Arjuna, on the other hand, holds that when no hellab of an ox is written, it Relates also to consecrated animals. This implies, does it not, that the rabbis hold that a law is not illuminated by its context? No, all agree that a law is illuminated by its context, but they differ in the following. Arjuna holds that a law which is the subject of a mere negative command is illuminated by its context, whether the latter is likewise the subject of a mere negative command or of one involving kareth, while the rabbis hold that a law which is the subject of a mere negative command is illuminated by its context, which is also the subject of a mere negative command, but a law which is the subject of a mere negative command is not illuminated by its context, which is the subject of a negative command involving kareth. It has been taught from the text, yes, shall eat neither hellab nor blood. We learn just as for hellab, one is liable to a twofold flagellation, so also for blood. Thus, the view of Arjuna, while the sages say there is only one prohibition, but why is hellab different in? That one is liable for it to a twofold flagellation, even though there is no hekish to support it, obviously, because there is written in scripture concerning it two texts, ye shall eat neither hellab nor blood, and ye shall eat no hellab of an ox or sheep. Then, similarly, in the case of blood, even without the hekish, one should be liable to a twofold flagellation, since scripture has written in connection there with two texts, ye shall eat neither hellab nor blood, and ye shall eat no manner of blood. Whether it be a fowl or a beast in any of your dwellings, rather read thus just as for hellab, one is liable to a threefold flagellation, so also for blood, one is liable to a threefold flagellation, but why is hellab different in that one is liable for it to a threefold flagellation, obviously, because there is written in connection there with the two negative commands mentioned above, and because of the negative command relating to the eating of holy things by a non priest, making altogether three. Then the same applies to blood the Hekish is necessary for I might otherwise have thought since blood is excluded from the law of sacrilege it is also excluded from the law concerning the eating of holy things by a non-priest it is for this reason that the Hekish is necessary and as to the rabbis what is the purpose of the Hekish it is required for what has been taught ye shall eat neither hellab nor blood just as hellab is singled out in that it is distinct from its flesh and thus does not combine with the latter so also with blood it does not combine with the flesh whenever it is distinct from its flesh to the exclusion of the blood of a reptile since the blood of the reptile is not distinct from its flesh to combine but is this law derived from here is it not rather derived from the following the text and these are they which are unclean unto you teaches that the blood of a reptile and its flesh combine with one another if it were not for the Hekish I might have Thought the law referred to defilement but not to eating the Hekish therefore informs us that the law refers also to eating said Rubina consequently the blood of a snake and its flesh combine one with the other is this not obvious it is just the conclusion drawn from the Hekish I might have thought that with the case of other reptiles since the law applies in respect of uncleanness it applies also in respect of eating but in the case of a snake since it does not apply in respect of defilement he does not apply also in respect of eating therefore he lets us know that the Hekish is to comprise everything in which the blood is not distinct from its flesh said Rubba wherefore has Karat been pronounced three times in connection with blood one pronouncement refers to blood of unconsecrated animals the other to blood of consecrated animals and the third to the dripping blood this is right according to our Judah for it has been taught the dripping blood is the subject of Amir. Prohibition Arjuna says it involves Kareth, but according to the rabbis, what is the purpose of the third pronouncement? And even according to Arjuna, is not the application of Kareth rather derived from the term all blood, for it has been taught. Arjuna said the word blood would suffice in the text. Why does it read all blood? I might have thought that only the blood of consecrated animals and that only with which life departs was meant because this blood brings about atonement. Whence do we know then blood of unconsecrated animals and dripping blood? It is for this reason that all blood was written. Rather say thus one pronouncement refers to blood of unconsecrated animals, the other to blood of consecrated animals, and the third to blood that has been covered. Rabba also said, Wherefore have five negative commandments been mentioned in connection with blood? One for blood of unconsecrated animals, the other for blood of consecrated animals, the third for covered blood, the fourth for Blood left in the limbs and the fifth for the dripping blood. Rla said, if one eats of the second tithe of corn of wine and of oil, one is liable to a threefold flagellation. But our separate lashes administered for each specification of a collective prohibition. This case is an exception for the text is redundant. Consider the divine law states, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. The tithe of thy corn of thy wine and of thine oil, from which we may infer that these shall be consumed within the precincts of Jerusalem and not without. Wherefore does the divine law repeat, thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn of thy wine and of thine oil, if not for the purpose of establishing separate prohibitions for each specification. But it may be retorted if I had the first text only to go by, I would say it is the subject only of a positive command, but not of a negative command. It was. Thus essential Talmud, Mosque thought that the divine law should write thou mayest not eat in order to make it the subject of a negative command. The question thus still stands is it not a collective prohibition if it were so scripture should have said thou mayest not eat them within thy gates why specify the tithe of thy corn thy wine and thine oil if not in order to establish separate prohibitions for each of them said our Isaac if one eats of the bread of the parched corn and of it. Fresh ears one is liable to a threefold flagellation but our separate lashes administered for each specification of a collective prohibition this is an exception as the text is redundant for scripture should have stated only bread and parched corn and fresh ears would have been derived therefrom but one might in this case have objected bread is different because it is subject to hell and parched corn alone should have been written omitting bread and we would derive the others therefrom. But bread could not be derived from parched corn because parched corn is a produce in its natural state, while bread is not in its natural state. Similarly, fresh ears could not be derived from parched corn because parched corn is distinguished in that it is fit for meal offerings, while fresh ears are not fit for meal offerings. Then fresh ears alone should have been written, and we could derive bread and parched corn therefrom. But then I would object fresh ears were different in that they retain their original character. It is thus established that from any single one, the other two cannot be derived. But let us derive one from two. Now, if bread was not written, leaving it to be derived from parched corn and fresh ears, I might object these two were distinguished in that they are in their natural form. If fresh ears was not written, leaving them to be derived from bread and parched corn, I might object that these two were distinguished in that they are included in the law of meal offering. Are Isaac will tell you scripture should not have written parched corn leaving it to be derived from bread and fresh ears for what objection could then be raised if you argued bread was exceptional in that it is subject to hell fresh ears will prove the contrary and if that fresh ears were exceptional because they retain their original character bread will prove the contrary it is from this superfluous text that we learn that separate lashes are inflicted for each specification but why not say then that parched corn the mention of which is superfluous is singled out for flagellation but if one eats them all one is still liable only once to flagellation if this were so scripture should read in this order bread fresh ears and parched corn or parched corn bread and fresh ears why is parched corn placed between the other two apparently that we may understand it thus for bread just as for parched corn one
For behold, the law concerning a man's daughter from an outraged woman is one of the essential precepts of the Torah, and yet it has been derived only through his Israel. What is Rabbi said, Our Isaac, son of Abdimi, told me as to the prohibition this law is derived from the similarity of the expression head, and with regard to the penalty of burning from the similarity of the expression Simma said, Our Ashi never treated his Israel lightly for death by stoning as a penalty for many transgressions. Is an essential regulation of the Torah, and yet in several cases it has been derived only through Israel. What is it has been taught? We find here the expression Dimeham Bam, and we find the same expression in connection with Obi and Yidonai, as in the latter case the penalty prescribed is stoning. So also in the former case it is stoning when one compounds oil of anointing. Our rabbis have taught if one compounds oil of anointing for experimenting or with the intention to hand it over. To the community he is not culpable if for anointment he is culpable though the person that anoints himself there with is exempt because the transgression concerning the use of the oil is limited to the oil of anointment which Moses himself compounded the master said if for experimenting or with the intention to hand it over to the community he is not culpable once do we know this it is derived by means of the common expression math kanto mentioned here and in connection with incense and with reference to incense it is written ye shall not make unto yourselves which implies that one is culpable only if compounded for oneself but not with the intention to hand it over to the community similarly with regard to the oil if it is compounded with the intention to hand it over to the community one is exempted but why not then again derive incense from the oil just as in the case of the oil one is exempted if one compounded half the prescribed quantity so also with incense he should be Exempted if he compounded half the prescribed quantity why then did Rabbah say if one compounds incense in half the quantity prescribed he is culpable but if one compounds oil in half the quantity he is exempt Rabbah will reply in connection with oil it is written ye shall not make any like it according to the composition thereof like it, it is prohibited but in half the prescribed quantity it is permitted but in connection with incense it is written and the incense which thou shalt make all. Compounding of incense is forbidden for one can offer up half the quantity in the morning and half in the evening our rabbis have taught the composition of the oil of anointment is as follows 500 shekels of flowing myrrh 500 of cashew 500 of sweet cinnamon and 250 of sweet calamus together 1750 shekels was it necessary for the tanna to state the sum total to obviate the following assumption for one might say. Sweet calamus was like sweet cinnamon as with sweet cinnamon the figure 250 mentioned in the text is half the prescribed quantity so also with reference to sweet calamus in which case the total weight would be 2000 and indeed why not say so that it should have written sweet cinnamon and sweet calamus half so much of each even 250 shekels or papa asked Abbe when one weighs the incense does one weigh it with overweight or exactly he replied that divine law has written of each shall there be like weight and you say that there shall be an overweight but did not Rab Judah say the holy one blessed be he takes note of overweight and incense which obviously implies that it had an overweight rather said our Judah why are the 500 shekels of sweet cinnamon taken in two portions of 250 each since the total quantity is 500 why not bring a whole at a time from the fact that sweet cinnamon is brought into Portions we may infer that there was an overweight each time, and to be sure, the Holy One blessed be He takes note of overweight. And what is the meaning of each shall there be like weight? Said Rabbi that one should not weigh first with the weight and use afterwards the weight amount as a weight for the others. The rabbis have taught the oil of anointment which Moses compounded in the wilderness was boiled with the roots of the spices. Thus the view of our Judah said to him, Our Jose, surely the oil would not suffice even for smearing the roots. What then did he do? He boiled the roots in water, poured over them the oil which thus absorbed the scent and wiped off the oil from the roots. Our Judah said to him, Talmud, Moskeir Thapi, is this the only miracle that occurred in connection with the oil of anointment? Was it not attended by many miracles from beginning to end? There were only twelve logs of oil, and yet with it were anointed the tabernacle and its vessels, Aaron and his. Sons throughout the seven days of the consecration and the high priest and kings and yet it remained whole for the days to come as it is written this shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations the numerical value of Zay this is twelve meaning that this quantity was preserved our rabbis taught and Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle our Judah said many miracles attended from the beginning to the end the anointing oil which Moses made in the wilderness there were originally only twelve logs consider how much of it must have been absorbed in the boiler how much in the roots of the spices and how much of it was burnt by the fire and yet with it were anointed the tabernacle and its vessels Aaron and his sons throughout the seven days of the consecration and the high priest and kings even a high priest who is the son of a high priest requires anointing though a king who is the son of a king does not require anointing and if you ask why then was Solomon anointed because Adonia disputed his right of succession? Similarly, Jehosh was anointed by reason of Athaliah's claim to the throne and Jehoahaz by reason of the claim to the throne of his brother Jehoiakim who was two years his senior. The master said even the high priest who is the son of a high priest requires anointing. Once do we know this it is written and the anointed priest that shall be in his stead from among his sons. The text should have stated and the priest that shall be in his stead from among his sons. Why add anointed if not to let us know that even from among his sons only the one that is anointed can be high priest but he who is not anointed cannot be high priest. The master said a king who is the son of a king does not require anointing. Once do we know this said our Abba B. Jacob it is written that he may prolong his days in his kingdom he and his children for all days it is an inheritance. Why then was Solomon anointed because Adonia? Disputed his right of succession. Once do we know that in a case of dispute, anointing is required, and that it does not suffice that the king entrust his kingdom to him. So ever he chooses, said our Papa, it is written there in the midst of Israel. Only if there is peace in Israel is it an inheritance. Attended taught also Jehu son of Nimshi was anointed only by reason of the claim to the throne by Joram son of Ahab. Was it indeed for this reason was he not the first king of the dynasty? The text is incomplete and should read thus: Kings from the house of David were anointed, but not the kings of Israel. And if you ask why then was Jehu son of Nimshi anointed because of the dispute of Joram son of Ahab? The master said kings from the house of David were anointed, but not the kings of Israel. Once do we know this? It is written: Arise about him, for this is he. This one requires anointing, but not others. The master said by reason of the claim to the throne by Joram were we indeed justified to. Commit sacrilege with the oil of anointing solely by reason of the claim to the throne by Joram son of Ahab as our Papa replied elsewhere it was done with pure bomb so here too it was done with pure bomb and Jehoahaz by reason of the claim to the throne by his brother Jehoiakim who was two years his senior was he indeed older is it not written and the sons of Josiah the firstborn Yohanan the second Jehoiakim the third Zedekiah and the fourth Shalom upon which our Yohanan remarked that Yohanan was identical with Jehoahaz and Zedekiah with Shalom Jehoiakim was indeed older and the other was called firstborn because he was first in succession but is it permitted to install the younger son in preference to the older is it not written and the kingdom he gave to Jehoram for he was the firstborn that one followed in his forefathers footsteps the master said Shalom is identical with Zedekiah but are not the sons enumerated in numerical order he Zedekiah is called the third because he was the third among the sons, and he is called the fourth, because he was the fourth to reign for Jehoiakim. Reigned before him, Jehoahaz was the first successor. Then followed Jehoiakim, then Jehoiakim, and then Zedekiah. Our rabbis taught Shalom is identical with Zedekiah, and why was he called Shalom? Because he was perfect. Shalom in his deeds, or according to another explanation, because the kingdom of the house of David ended Shalom in his days. What was his real name? Mattania, as it is written, and the king of Babylon made Mattania his father's brother king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. For the king Nebuchadnezzar said to him, God may deal severely with thee if thou wilt rebel against me, as it is written. And he brought him to Babylon, and also, and he also rebelled against king Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by the Lord. But was there any oil of anointing at that time? Has it not been taught when the holy ark was hidden there? Disappeared with it the jar of Man of the flask of the oil of anointing the rod of Aaron together with its almonds and blossoms and the coffer which the Philistines had sent as a present to the God of Israel as it is written and put the jewels of gold which he returned him for a guilt offering in a coffer
But is it not written first and he poured and then and anointed this is what it means wherefore did he pour the oil because he had already anointed him to sanctify him our rabbis have taught it is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard even Aaron's beard two drops of the oil were hanging down like pearls from Aaron's beard said Arkahana it was taught when he Aaron spoke the drops moved upwards and rested by the roots of his beard this caused anxiety to Moses perhaps. Heaven forfend he said I have committed sacrilege with the oil of anointing but a heavenly voice was heard saying like the dew of a hermit that cometh down upon the mountains of Zion as the dew is not subject to sacrilege so the oil that cometh down upon the beard of Aaron is not subject to sacrilege yet Aaron was still worried although Moses did not commit sacrilege I myself am guilty of sacrilege thereupon the heavenly voice pronounced behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren. To dwell together in unity as Moses is not guilty of sacrilege so thou too art not guilty of sacrilege our rabbis have taught kings are anointed only by the side of a spring so that their rule be prolonged as it is written and the king said unto them and bring him down to Gin and anoint him there said R M I when one wishes to know whether he will survive the coming year or not let him take a burning lamp during the ten days between New Year and the Day of Atonement and place it in a house where there is no draft if the lamp burns out to the end he will know that he will survive the year and if one is about to engage in business and wishes to know whether he will succeed or not let him get a cock and feed it if it grows fat and handsome he will know that he will succeed when one is about to go on a journey and wishes to know whether he will return home let him enter a darkened room if he can perceive Talmud, Mosque of the reflection of his shadow he will know that. He will return home but it is not the proper thing to make these tests for one might be discouraged and mar his fortune said Abbe since you hold that symbols are meaningful every man should make it a habit to eat on New Year pumpkin fenugreek, Greek leek beet and dates are measure she has said to his sons when you wish to come before your teacher to learn revise at first your mission and then go to your teacher and when you are sitting before your teacher look at the mouth of your teacher as it is written but thine eyes shall see thy teacher and when you study any teaching do so by the side of water for as the water is drawn out so your learning may be prolonged beyond the dust heaps of Mahamaha rather than in the palaces of Pumpati that eat a stinking fish rather than cutter that breaks rocks and had a prayed and said my heart exalted in the Lord my horn is exalted it says my horn is exalted but not my jar is exalted David and Solomon were anointed from a horn and therefore their rule was prolonged Saul and Jehu however were anointed from a jar and their rule was not prolonged when one compounds incense our rabbis have taught when one compounds incense for experimenting or in order to hand it over to the community he is culpable if in order to smell of it he is guilty he who smells it is not culpable but he is guilty of sacrilege but is smelling subject to the law of sacrilege has not our Simeon son of Pazi stated in the name of our Joshua son of Levi on behalf of Barkabra. Hearing seeing and smelling are not subject to the law of sacrilege the reference to smelling means after the pillar of the incense smoke has ascended in which case it is not subject to the law of sacrilege for nothing is subject to the law of sacrilege after the prescribed command has been performed there with is this indeed so behold the separation of the ashes is subject to the law of sacrilege although the prescribed command has been performed there with the law concerning the separation of the ashes and that of the garments of the high priest are two texts teaching the same thing and where two texts teach the same thing no inference may be made from them this is right according to the rabbis but what is to be said according to our dosa for it has been taught and he shall place them the garments there means that they have to be hidden our dosa holds they may be used by an ordinary priest and he shall place them there means that he the high priest shall not use it again on another day of atonement the law concerning the separation of the ashes and that of the heifer whose neck is broken are two texts teaching the same thing and where two texts teach the same thing no inference may be made from them for other instances what is the case of the separation of the ashes it has been taught he shall place it by the side of the altar this teaches that it has to be hidden what is the case of the heifer whose neck is broken it has been taught and shall break it Heifer's neck there in the valley this teaches that it has to be buried and even according to him who holds one may infer for other instances where two texts teach the same thing here indeed no inference can be made because there are two limitations in connection with the separation of the ashes it is written he shall place it and not anything else in connection with the heifer whose neck is broken it is written whose neck is broken only the one whose neck is broken and not anything else are. Rabbis have taught the compound of incense consisted of bamonica galbanum and frankincense each in the quantity of 70 minas of mercaceous spikenard and saffron each 16 minas by weight of costious 12 of aromatic rind 3 and of cinnamon 9 minas of lye obtained from leek 9 calves of cypress wine 3 seahs and 3 calves though if cypress wine is not available old white wine may be used instead of salt of sodom the fourth of a cab and of myelation a minute quantity are. Nathan says also of Jordan resin a minute quantity if however honey is added the incense is rendered unfit while if one omits one of the ingredients he is liable to the penalty of death our Simeon son of Gamaliel said bomb is nothing but a resin which exudes from the wood of the balsam tree the lye obtained from leek was rubbed over the onica in order to render it beautiful and in the cypress wine the onica was steeped that its odor might be intensified in fact urine might well serve this purpose but urine may not be brought within the precincts of the temple this supports our Jose son of Arhanana who says it is holy and it shall be holy unto you implies that all work in connection therewith must be performed within the sacred precincts an objection was raised if one dedicates his possessions to the temple and there are among them things fit for communal offerings they shall be given to the temple craftsmen as wages now what is meant by things fit for communal offerings if Cattle or beast this has already been taught if wine oil or fine flour this has already been taught hence it must refer to incense said Arashai it refers to that which is given to the craftsmen as their wages for we learned what was done with the remnant of the frankincense they set apart an amount equivalent to the craftsmen's wages from the temple treasury the remnant was then exchanged against this money handed over to the craftsmen as their wages and then bought back again from them. With the money of the new levy to this our Joseph the merchurely in connection with all remnants it teaches and then it is bought back again from the new levy whereas in connection with this teaching this is not stated rather said our Joseph it refers to one of the ingredients of the frankincense our rabbis have taught the frankincense consisted of 368 minus 365 corresponding to the days of the solar year and of the three remaining minas. High priest took his hands full into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement while the remnant was given to the craftsmen for their wages as we have learned what was done with the remnant of the frankincense they set apart an amount equivalent to the craftsmen's wages from the temple treasury the remnant was then exchanged against this money handed over to the craftsmen as their wages and then bought back again from them with the money of the temple chamber Talmud, Mosque Hirathot B.R. Rabbis have taught by reason of the remnants of frankincense once in sixty or seventy years only half the quantity was manufactured therefore if a stranger compounds half the quantity he is culpable thus the view of Rabbin Simeon son of Gamaliel who said this in the name of the Sikhan while there is no tradition that a third or a fourth of the quantity was ever compounded the sages hold he prepared frankincense each day according to its composition and offered it up the supports Rabba for Rabba. Said if one compounds half the quantity of frankincense he is capable for it is written and the incense which thou shalt make etc whatever quantity you make and it is possible for one to prepare half a mina in the morning and half in the evening our rabbis have taught twice in the course of the year is the incense put back into the mortar during the summer it is scattered so that it does not rot away during the winter it is heaped together so that its fragrance may not escape while it is being beaten he calls out pound well well pound these are the words of Abba Jose Bihan and the three remaining minas of which the high priest on the day of atonement separates his handfuls are put back in the mortar on the eve of the day of atonement and pounded very thoroughly so that the incense is of the very finest as it has been taught wherefore is beaten small stated since it is written already and thou shalt beat some of it very small that it has to be the very finest the master said. While it is being beaten, he calls out, Pound well, well, pound. This supports our Yohanan for our Yohanan said, just as speech is harmful to one, so it is beneficial to spices. Said our Yohanan, eleven kinds of spices were named to Moses at Sinai. Said Arhuna, where is the text? Take unto these sweet spices
Its own sake for its odor is unpleasant if so it could have been derived from take unto thee but perhaps say the sweet spices in the latter part of the verse mean two as the sweet spices in the former part then it should have written the two expressions sweet spices next to one another and then write stacti and unica and galbanum in the school of Arishmael and was taught that sweet spices is a generalization stacti and unica and galbanum is a specification sweet spices again is a generalization and from a generalization followed by a specification and then by another generalization one can derive only things sharing the qualities of the specification as the items in the specification are things whose smoke ascends upwards and whose fragrance spreads so all things whose smoke ascends upwards and whose fragrance spreads perhaps this is not so but take the generalization with the first generalization the specification with the first specification say this cannot be Hence you must not expound according to the latter version but according to the former the master said perhaps this is not so but take the generalization with the first generalization and the specification with the first specification say this cannot be hence you cannot expound what is the question this is his difficulty let the sweet spices in the latter part of the verse mean two like sweet spices in the former whereupon he replied as was answered before then it should have written sweet spices sweet spices stack the anika and galbanum what is the meaning of and the specification with the first specification this is his difficulty things of the tree are derived from stack and things of the ground from anika why not then derive from pure frankincense all things which have one quality in common with it is that their fragrance spreads though their smoke does not ascend upwards whereupon he replied if this was so pure frankincense should have been written among the others so that you could derive therefrom, but if pure frankincense was written among the others, we would have twelve spices. Pure frankincense should have been written among the others, and Galbanum at the end Reshlakish says from the word itself it can be inferred for Kitareth frankincense means something whose smoke ascends upwards said our had a in the name of our histah the pious a fast in which none of the sinners of Israel participate is no fast for behold the odor of Galbanum is unpleasant. And yet it was included among the spices for the incense Abbe says we learn this from the text and have found it is evolved upon the earth or uses oil of anointing our rabbis have taught he who pours the oil of anointing over cattle or vessels is not guilty of over heathens or the dead he is not guilty the law relating to cattle and vessels is right for it is written upon the flesh of man Adam shall it not be poured and cattle and vessels are not man also with regard to the dead it is plausible that he is exempt since after death one is called corpse and not man but why is one exempt in the case of heathens are they not in the category of Adam no it is written and yeah my sheep the sheep of my pasture are Adam and yeah are called Adam but heathens are not called Adam but is it not written and the persons Adam were 16,000 because it is used in opposition to cattle but is it not written and should I not have pity on Nineveh that great city wherein are more than 64,000 persons Adam is too is used in opposition to cattle or if you wish I might explain it in the light of what Atana recited before our Eliezer whosoever is subject to the prohibition he shall not pour is subject to the law it shall not be poured over him but he who is not subject to he shall not pour is not subject to it shall not be poured over him another bury the taught if one anoints with the oil of anointing cattle vessels heathens and the dead he is not Culpable if kings and priests are mayor holds he is culpable and Arjuna that he is exempt how much has one to put in order to be culpable our mayor says any quantity Arjuna says as much as that of the bulk of an olive but did not Arjuna say that one is exempt Arjuna exempts only in the case of kings and priests but in the case of layman he declares one culpable what is the ground of dispute between our mayor and Arjuna said Arjuna they dispute in this our mayor holds it is written upon the flesh of man shall it not be poured and it is also written or whosoever putteth of it upon a stranger as the prohibition of anointing applies to any quantity so also the prohibition of putting upon a stranger while Arjuna holds the implication of putting upon a stranger is derived from giving elsewhere as giving implies at least an olive size so also the putting upon a stranger at least an olive size but with regard to the pouring for the anointing of kings and priests both agree that any Quantity suffices then said our Joseph whereupon rests the dispute between our Meir and our Judah with reference to kings and priests our Meir holds it is written or whosoever putteth of it upon a stranger and king and priest are now to be regarded as strangers while our Judah maintains to involve culpability it is essential that one is a stranger from beginning to end but kings and priests were not considered always strangers said R.I.K. the son of R.M.I. they follow their own reasoning elsewhere for we have learned Talmud, Moscow if the daughter of a priest married to an Israelite has eaten terima she has to pay the principal but not the additional fifth and her punishment is death by burning if she is married to one of those disqualified for priesthood she has to pay the principal as well as the additional fifth and her punishment is death by strangulation thus the view of our Meir, but the sages hold in either case she has to pay the principal but not the fifth and is punished. By burning said our Joseph the dispute between our Meir and our Judah is only with reference to the putting of the oil of anointing and as we have explained above but elsewhere all agree that giving implies at least an olive size to turn to the main text a tanner recited before our Eliezer whosoever is subject to the prohibition he shall not pour is subject to the law it shall not be poured over him but he who is not subject to he shall not pour is not subject to it shall not be poured over. Him the latter said to him you speak well it is written it shall not be poured Isaac read he shall not pour Yasek our hand and I recited before Rabbi if a high priest has taken from the oil of anointing that is upon his head and rubbed it upon his stomach whence do we know that he is culpable it says upon the flesh of man shall it not be poured said Araha the son of Rabbi to Arashi why is this different from that which has been taught a priest who is anointed with oil of Terimame without Scribble allow e.g. his Israelite grandson to roll against him he replied in that connection it is written and die therein if they profane it once it is profaned it remains profane but in connection with the oil of anointing it says for the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him the divine law still calls it oil of anointing so that even when it is upon him it does not become profane for these transgressions one is liable to extinction if committed willfully etc. it states. Except in the case of one who defiled the temple or its consecrated things excluded from what read thus excluded is he who defiles the sanctuary or sacred things in that he does not bring a suspensive guilt offering why not also state excluded is one from a suspensive guilt offering where the day of atonement has passed by in the meantime replied Rush Lakish he mentions only cases where a sin offering is prescribed but the divine law has pronounced exemption from a suspensive guilt. Offering in case of a doubt but where the day of atonement had passed by there is no sin offering prescribed for the sin had already been atoned are you had and said the mission refers to a rebellious person that is who says that the day of atonement brings no forgiveness if then he repents after the day of atonement he is liable to a suspensive guilt offering but Rush Lakish holds that the day of atonement affects forgiveness even to a rebellious person their dispute is similar to the Following if one says my sin offering shall affect no atonement for me Abbe says it does not affect atonement Rabbi says it does affect atonement if he said it shall not be offered all agree that it does not affect atonement for it is written he shall bring it with the consent where they differ is when he said it should be offered but should not affect atonement Abbe holds that it does not affect atonement for he said it should not atone Rabbi holds that it does affect atonement since he ordered that it should be offered atonement comes as a matter of course Rabbi however has retracted his view as it has been taught I might assume that the day of atonement atones alike for them who repent and them who do not repent but is there not an argument to the contrary sin and guilt offerings affect atonement and the day of atonement affects atonement just as sin and guilt offerings atone only for them that repent so shall also the day of atonement atone only for them that repent no this is not conclusive you can rightly say that such is the case of sin and guilt offering since they do not atone for willful sins as they do for those in error will you apply the same to the day of atonement which atones alike for willful sins as well as for those in error I might therefore have thought since the day of atonement atones for willful sins as well as those in error so it would atone for them that repent as well as them that do not repent therefore it is written how be it to establish a Distinction between them that repent and them that do not repent what is meant by them that repent and them that do not repent does them that repent mean that the sin has been committed in error and them that do not repent that the sin has been committed willfully but then does it not state no you can rightly say that such is the case of sin and guilt offering since they do not atone for willful sins etc rather explain in the light of what
Other replied Abay, there is no difficulty. The former teaching is that of Rabbi on the view of Arjuna, the latter that of Rabbi himself, as it has been taught. Rabbi says, for all the sins of the Torah, whether one has repented or not, the day of atonement atones, except for throwing off the yoke, interpreting the Torah in opposition to the Halachah and making void the covenant of the flesh, where if one has repented, the day of atonement affects atonement, but if not, the day of atonement affects no. Atonement, Rabbi said, both teachings represent Rabbi's own view, but Rabbi agrees that the transgressions against the sanctity of the day of atonement itself are not atoned for. For if this was not so, how could, according to Rabbi, the penalty of Koreth for offending against the laws of the day of atonement ever take effect? Since there is on that day continuous atonement, this would offer no difficulty. It might take effect when one did work during the night and died at dawn, so that he had no day to atone for him. This is right only as far as sins committed by night are concerned. How can Koreth take effect for sins committed by day? This is no difficulty. It might take effect when one, while partaking of a meal, was choked by a lump of meat and died, so that there was no time during the day for the atonement to atone for him, or when he was working just before sunset, or when while working he cut off his thigh with the axe and died, so that there was no time during the day to atone for him. It Sages say also one who blasphemes etc. What is the meaning of also one who blasphemes? The rabbis heard that our Akiva included Obi but not Yido and I so they said to him the reason why there is no offering in the latter instance is because it involves no action. The blasphemer too performs no action. Our rabbis have taught he who blasphemes is liable to an offering for Karath is written in connection with him thus the view of our Akiva and it further says he will bear his iniquity but is it a rule that wherever Karath is written one has to bring an offering in case of error surely there are the cases of Passover and circumcision in connection with which Karath is written and yet these involve no offerings Talmud. Mosque Karath this is the meaning one who blasphemes brings an offering because the penalty of Karath stands in this case in conjunction with offerings this is the view of our Akiva he holds that since Karath in this instance could have been mentioned independently but is in Fact mentioned in conjunction with offerings, this proves that he who blasphemes brings an offering, and it further says he shall bear his iniquity. This is quoted on the view of the sages, and thus did the rabbi say to our Akiva, You maintain that the blasphemer Megadeth is liable to an offering because Karath in this instance is mentioned in conjunction with offerings. You thus assume that the term Megadeth of the Holy Writ denotes one who blasphemes the name of the Lord. This is not so. Megadeth denotes one who worships idols, and as to the text of the Mishnah, and the sages say also one who blasphemes Megadeth, it is to be understood thus also he who blasphemes the name which you designate as Megadeth, etc. And whence do you know that Karath applies to one who blasphemes the name in connection with blasphemy? We read he shall bear his iniquity, and also in connection with the second Passover, we read he shall bear his iniquity, as in the latter instance Karath is the penalty, so. Also in the former the penalty is Karath our rabbis taught the same blasphemeth Megadeth the Lord Isi Bijuda explains the term Gadaf in the sense of a man who says to his neighbor thou hast scraped Gareth the dish and impaired it he holds Megadeth denotes one who blasphemes the name our Eliezer Bezra explains it in the sense of a man who says to his neighbor thou hast scraped the dish but hast not impaired it he holds Megadeth denotes one who worships idols and other bury the teaches. The same blasphemeth the Lord our Eliezer Bezra says the text speaks of one who worships idols while the sages say the text intends only to pronounce Karath for him who blasphemes the name Mishnah some women after confinement bring an offering which is eaten some bring one which is not eaten and some bring no offering at all some bring an offering which is eaten if a woman bears an abortion which is in the shape of cattle or a beast of chase or a bird thus the view of our Sages hold only if it has a human shape or if a woman discharges a sandal like foetus or a placenta or a developed foetus or a young that came out in pieces similarly if a woman slave miscarries she brings an offering which is eaten the following bring an offering which is not eaten a woman who bears an abortion but does not know what the abortion was or if of two women the one had an abortion of a kind which did not render her liable to an offering and the other of a kind to make her liable. To an offering our Jose said this applies only if the one went towards the east and the other towards the west but if both remain together they bring together one offering which is eaten the following bring no offering at all the woman who discharges a foetus filled with water or with blood or with a many colored substance or if the abortion was in the shape of fish locust unclean animals or reptiles or if the miscarriage to okay place on the 40th day after the conception or if it was. Extracted by means of a caesarean section, our Simeon declares her liable to an offering in the case of a caesarean section. Tomorrow, whence do we know the law concerning the woman slave? For our rabbis taught, speak unto the children of Israel. From this, I only know that the law applies to the children of Israel. Whence do we know its application to a woman proselyte and to a woman slave? The text therefore states, if a woman wise state similarly, if a woman slave, I might have thought that the rule that all commandments which are binding upon a woman apply also to a slave holds good only in respect of laws which are applicable both to men and women. But as to the laws concerning the woman after confinement, which are applicable to women only and not to men, I might have thought that the woman slave is not included. Therefore, a woman slave is mentioned in the mission of the following: bring an offering, etc. How shall they proceed? They bring each a certain burnt dash offering and together. Doubtful sin offering of a bird and stipulate, but does our Jose indeed admit that one can stipulate? Have we not learned our Simeon holds they together bring one sin offering? Our Jose holds two persons cannot bring one sin offering. Does this not prove that our Jose does not agree with the principle of making a stipulation? Said Rabbi, our Jose agrees in the case of one who requires atonement. Also, when Rabin came from Palestine, he said in the name of our Yohanan, our Jose agrees in the case of one who requires atonement. What is the difference there? It is essential that the offender be conscious of his sin as it is written, if his sin be known to him, therefore the offering cannot be brought conditionally. But here the women bring offerings only in order to be permitted to partake of holy things, even as we have learned in the concluding clause of that same mission. Our Jose says no sin offering that is brought for the expiation of sin can be offered by two persons. The following bring no offering are. Simeon declares her liable in the case of a caesarean section. What is the reason of our Simeon said Reshlakish it is written and if she bear a maid child to include another kind of bearing namely by means of a caesarean section and what is the reason of the rabbi said Armani be Patish it is written if a woman conceives seed and bear only when the birth takes place through the seed of conception Mishnah if a woman brings forth an abortion on the eve of the 81st day Beth Shammai say she is exempted from an offering while Beth Hillel say she is liable said Beth Hillel to Beth Shammai what is the difference between the eve of the 81st day and the 81st day itself since these are considered equal with regard to Uncle Anas why should they not be considered equal also with reference to the offerings answered Beth Shammai to them no if you will maintain this in the case where she bears an abortion on the 81st day where it occurred at a time when she was fit. To bring an offering, can you maintain this where she bears an abortion on the eve of the 81st day, seeing that it did not occur at a time when she was fit to bring an offering? Said Beth Hillel again to them, the case of an abortion on the 81st day which fell on a Sabbath shall prove it where the abortion took place at a time when she was unfit to bring an offering, and yet she is liable to bring a new offering. Replied Beth Shammai to them, No, if you will maintain this of it. 81st day which fell on a Sabbath, which though indeed not fit for offerings of an individual is at least fit for communal offerings, would you maintain this of an abortion on the eve of the 81st day, seeing that the night is fit neither for offerings of the individual nor for communal offerings? As to your argument of the uncleanness of the blood, it proves nothing for also when the abortion took place within the period of cleanness, is the blood unclean, and yet she is exempted from. An offering Talmud, Moskhe Ritha Talmud, Moskhe Ritha Igmar it has been taught Beth Hillel said to Beth Shammai lo it says or for a daughter to include the eve of the 81st day our Hashai was a frequent visitor to Barkhapur he then left him and joined Arhai one day he met Barkhapur and asked him if Azab had three new issues during the night of the 8th day what would be the view of Beth Hillel in this case is the reason of Beth Hillel in the case of an abortion on the night of the 81st day because it is written or for a daughter but in the case of Azab there will be no sacrifice since there is no superflu
that an issue which disturbs the period of cleanness does not render one liable to an offering said Rabbi you have explained the teaching that one is exempted from an offering is referring to a zab of three issues why then has this law not been stated in conjunction with the mission of five who bring one sacrifice for many transgressions because this law is not absolute for our Yohan and said if he perceived one issue in the night and two during the day he is liable two in the night and one during the day he is not liable said our Joseph you can prove that one is liable if one was perceived by night and two during the day for the first issue is regarded as a mere discharge of semen and yet if two more issues are perceived they combine one with the other against the said our she's hate son of R.E.D. what argument is this the first issue of a zab took place at a time fit for offerings but in the instance of one by night where the issue was at a time not fit for offerings had not our Yohan Taught us that they combine with one another. I would have thought that they do not combine. But does our Yohanan hold that the night renders a period wanting in time? Did not Hezekiah say if he the Nazi right became unclean during the eighth day he has to bring a second offering? If on the night of the eighth day he does not bring an offering, while our Yohanan holds even on the night of the eighth day he has to bring what our Yohanan said if he perceived two by night and one during the day he has to bring an offering. It was according to him who holds that the night renders a period wanting in time. But according to him is not this obvious the case of one by night and two during the day was necessary to be mentioned. For I might have thought since the one issue was not at a time fit for offerings there is no combination. Therefore we are told that this is not so. Mission if a woman had five doubtful births or five doubtful issues she need bring but one offering and may then. Partake of sacrificial flesh and she is not bound to bring the other offerings if she had five certain issues or five certain births she brings one offering and may then partake of sacrificial flesh but it is still her duty to bring the other offerings it once happened in Jerusalem that the price of a pair of doves rose to a golden dinar said our Simeon be Gamaliel by the sanctuary I shall not go to sleep tonight before they cost but a silver dinar then he entered the Beth Din and taught if a woman had five certain births or five certain issues she need bring but one offering and may then partake of sacrificial flesh and she is not bound to bring the other offerings there upon the price of a pair of births stood at a quarter of a silver dinar each Mara our rabbis taught if she had five certain births and five doubtful ones or five certain issues and five doubtful ones she brings two pairs of birds one for the certain and one for the doubtful cases the one offered for the Certain cases may be eaten and it is still incumbent upon her to bring the remaining offerings that offered for the doubtful cases is not eaten and the woman is not bound to bring any more offerings or Yohanan Binuri said for the certain cases she shall say the offering is for the last occurrence and she will be exempted but for the doubtful cases if there is a certain one among them she shall say that the offering is for the one that is not in doubt and she is exempted if not she says that the offering is for any one of the occurrences and she is exempted our Akiva said both in the instance of the certain cases and in that of the doubtful ones she shall say that the offering is for any one of the occurrences and she is exempted said Arnaman B. Isaac to our Papa I shall tell you in the name of Rabbah in which point these ten aim differ Yohanan Binuri compares these instances to those of sin offerings just as when one is liable to five sin offerings he is not atoned for before all have been offered the same as the ruling in our case our Akiva on the other hand compares them to emergence for if one requires five emergence as soon as he has immersed once he is clean the same as the ruling in our case said our Papa to him if it was to be assumed that our Yohanan Binuri compared our instances to those of sin offerings why does he maintain that for doubtful cases she shall say the offering is for any one of them and she is exempted suppose one was liable Talmud, Mosque Herathoth Bijou. Five suspensive guilt offerings would he indeed be exempted if he offered only one has it not been taught this is the general rule whenever there is a division with regard to sin offerings there is also a division with reference to guilt offerings in fact both compare our instances to that of emergence and they differ as to whether we apprehend negligence or Yohanan Binuri holds it might lead to negligence our Akiva holds we do not apprehend negligence C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I mission there are four. Persons who require a ceremony of atonement and for who bring a sacrifice for willful as well as for inadvertent transgression the following are those who require a ceremony of atonement the Zab the Zabba the woman after confinement and the leper Arlizer B. Jacob said also a proselyte is regarded as a person who still requires a ceremony of atonement until the blood has been sprinkled for him the same applies to the Nazi right with reference to one hair cutting and uncle and Eskimara Y.R. Zab and Zabba enumerated as two separate instances apparently because they differ as to their uncleanness for the Zab is not unclean through discharge by accident and the Zabba is not rendered unclean through issues but through days for it has been taught out of his flesh but not by accident a man is also unclean through issues as well as through days as it has been taught the text has made the uncleanness of the male dependent upon discharge and that of the female upon days a Zabba on the other and is unclean through issue by accident and is not unclean through issue as through days now are not the leprous man and the leprous woman also different with regard to their uncleanness for the leprous man is required to rent his clothes and to let his hair grow loose as it is written his clothes shall be rent and the hair of his head shall grow loose and he is forbidden marital intercourse while the leprous woman is not required to rent her clothes and to let her hair grow loose as it has been taught I know only the law concerning a man once do I know its application to a woman when the text reads and the leper both are included wherefore then is man mentioned the rib removed him from the application of the earlier passage to the latter one to teach us that only a man is required to rent his clothes and to let his hair grow loose but not a woman also the woman is permitted marital intercourse as it is written and he shall dwell outside his tent seven days but not she Outside her tent why then have they not been enumerated as two separate instances the Zab and the Zabba are essentially different with regard to the source of uncleanness whereas the leprous man and the leprous woman are not essentially different in their source of uncleanness for the standard size of both is a bean or a B. Jacob said also a proselyte is regarded as a person who still requires etc and why has the first hand and not mentioned the proselyte he mentions only instances where the offering is to affect the permission of eating consecrated things while in the case of the proselyte the offering is brought in order to qualify him to enter the congregation and why has he not mentioned the Nazi right after all when the Nazi right brings an offering it is in order that he may be permitted to drink unconsecrated wine and our who has mentioned the Nazi right in reference to his qualification why has he not stated also the instance of the unclean Nazi right the latter offers his Sacrifice only to qualify for Nazi rightship and cleanness our rabbis have taught a proselyte is prevented from partaking of consecrated things before he has offered his sacrificial birds if he has offered one single pigeon in the morning he is permitted to partake of consecrated things in the evening all sacrifices of birds consist of one sin offering and one burnt offering in this case both are burnt offerings if he has offered his obligatory sacrifice from the cattle he has done his duty if he has offered a burnt offering and a peace offering he has done his duty if a meal and a peace offering he has not fulfilled his duty the prescription of birds as sacrifices is as it were to be regarded only as a rule towards greater leniency now why do not a meal and a peace offering exempt him from his duty apparently because it is written as ye do so he shall do as ye Israelites offer a burnt offering and a peace offering so shall also the proselyte offer a burnt offering and a peace Offering similarly then it should not suffice for him to offer his obligatory sacrifice from the cattle because it is written as ye do so he shall do said our papa argue thus as he is included regarding the offering of a bird should he not the more so be included regarding the burnt offering of the cattle if so a meal offering should also exempt him the text has excluded it by the word so and whence do we know that he is included regarding the offering of a bird for our rabbis taught it is written as ye do so shall he do as ye offer a burnt and a peace offering so shall also he offer a burnt and a peace offering as it is indeed confirmed in the text as ye are so shall the stranger be whence do we know that he is included concerning the offering of a bird it is written an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the lord which is the offering that is holy unto the lord you must say this is the burnt offering of the bird talmud mosque i might then include also the meal offering therefore it reads so another berry that teaches from the text and will offer an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord I might derive everything that is offered up by fire including a meal offering therefore it is written as ye
One turtle dove as a sin offering their lamb is offered in addition the master said as your forefathers entered into the covenant only etc. It is right concerning circumcision for it is written for all the people that came out were circumcised alternatively and when I passed by thee and saw thee wallowing in thy blood I said unto thee in thy blood life etc. As to the sprinkling of the blood it is mentioned in the text and he sent the young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings but whence do we know the immersion it is written and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and there can be no sprinkling without immersion if so we should nowadays not receive any proselytes since there are no sacrifices today said Araha son of Jacob it is written and if a stranger sojourn with you or whosoever may be among you etc. Our rabbis taught a proselyte in these days has to put aside a fourth of a dinar for his sacrifice of Bird said our Simeon our Yohanan Bizakai held a vote on this rule and abolished it for fear of misuse said our E.D.B. Gershom in the name of our son of Ahab the decision is according to our Simeon some report the latter statement with reference to that which has been taught a resident alien may do work for himself on the Sabbath in the same measure as an Israelite may do on the intermediate days of the festivals our Akiba says as an Israelite on the festival our Jose says a resident alien may do work for himself on the Sabbath in the same measure as an Israelite on weekdays our Simeon says both a resident alien and a male or female sojourning even slave may do work for themselves in the same measure as an Israelite may do on weekdays mission the following offer a sacrifice for willful as well as for inadvertent transgression one who has intercourse with a handmaid a Nazirite who has become unclean one who swore falsely the oath concerning evidence or the oath concerning a deposit there are five persons who bring one sacrifice for several transgressions and five who bring a sacrifice of higher or lesser value the following bring one sacrifice for several transgressions one who has intercourse with a handmaid several times and a Nazi right who became unclean several times tomorrow whence do we know the law concerning the handmaid or rabbis taught and the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering for his sin which he hath sinned as teaches that one may bring one offering for several sins and he shall be forgiven for his sin which he hath sinned that willful transgression is equal to transgression in error a Nazi right who has become unclean whence do we know this it is written and if any man die in sudden be fed unawareness pitho and beside him fed means unintentionally for thus it is written but if he thrust him unintentionally be fed without enmity pitho means unexpectedly and thus it is written and the Lord spoke suddenly Pitho em unto Moses another bury the top pitho em means intentionally and thus it is written a prudent man seek the evil and hide himself but the simple pethaim pass on and are punished why has the text not written just pitho em which denotes error intention and accident at the same time intention and accident as has been explained before it denotes however also error as it is written the thoughtless pethah believeth every word why then mentioned pethah if pitho em alone was mentioned which denotes both error and intention and accident I might have thought that an offering nevertheless was brought only for transgression and error as is the case with all the laws of the Torah but not in the case of accidental or willful transgression therefore the divine law mentions also pethah which denotes error only to indicate that pitho em shall denote accident and willfulness so that also in these circumstances the divine law joins an offering oath concerning evidence Whence do we know this our rabbis have taught in connection with the other laws the term it being hidden from him is used in connection with this law this term is not used to indicate that he is liable to an offering for willful as well as for inadvertent transgression the oath concerning a deposit whence do we know this it is derived from the oath concerning evidence through the common terms in Ftheta there are five persons who bring one sacrifice for several transgressions it is stated one who has intercourse with a handmaid several times whence do we know this our rabbis have taught and the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering for his sin which he hath sinned as teaches that one may bring one offering for several sins and he shall be forgiven for his sin which he hath sinned that willful transgression is equal to transgression in error but does not the text deal with the willful transgression rather say that transgression in error be equal to willful transgression our Hanan of Tirnah put the following query to our Yohanan if one had intercourse with five designated handmaids in one spell of unawareness is he liable to a sacrifice for each of them or altogether only to one sacrifice the latter replied he is guilty for each of them and why the former asked is this case different from one who had intercourse five times with one handmaid in different spells of unawareness he replied in the case of one handmaid one cannot argue that there were different bodies in the instance of the five handmaids there were different bodies and whence do we know that the argument of different bodies holds good in the case of the handmaid he replied did you not say with reference to forbidden relations that the word and a woman implies that one is guilty for each woman also in connection with the handmaid it is written and whosoever leath carnally with a woman Talmud, mosque be that is a bondmaid etc. to enjoin separate Offerings for each handmaid a Nazi right who became unclean several times whose view does this represent said Aristot that of our Jose son of our Judah who holds that the Nazi right ship of cleanness counts from the seventh day and the instance of our mission is realized if he became unclean on the seventh day and then again on the seventh since the time for the offering was not reached he is liable only to one sacrifice how can the instance of the mission be realized according to Rabbi who holds that the Nazi right ship of cleanness does not count before the eighth day if he became unclean on the seventh day and again on the following seventh day is this not one long period of uncleanness if he became unclean on the eighth day and again on the following eighth day since the time of the offering has been reached he should be liable to an offering for each uncleanness it is thus proved that the mission is in accordance with our Jose son of our Judah and where do we find our Jose's view it? Has been taught and he shall hallow his head that same day refers to the day on which the sacrifices are offered. Thus the words of Rabbi our Jose son of our Judah says on the day of the cutting of his hair mission one who warns his wife in regard to several men and a leper who has contracted a leprous disease several times if he has offered the birds and then becomes leprous again they do not count for him until he has offered his sin offering our Judah says until he has offered his guilt offering. Tomorrow whence do we know the law concerning this it is written this is the law concerning jealousies one law for several warnings a leper who has contracted a leprous disease several times whence do we know this it is written this is the law of the leper one law for several cases of leprosy if he has offered the birds and then becomes leprous again they do not count for him until he has offered his sin offering our Judah says until he has offered his guilt offering but did you not say he offers? Only one sacrifice the text is incomplete and should read thus if he has offered the birds and then becomes leprous again he offers but one set of sacrifices the decision whether the sacrifices be those of the poor person or of the rich person is not taken until the sin offering is brought our Judah says until the guilt offering is brought we have learned there if a leper became rich after he had offered his guilt offering you go by his pecuniary status at the time of the offering of the sin. Offering thus our Simeon our Judah says at the time of the offering of the guilt offering it has been taught our Elizabeth Jacob says at the time of the offering of the birds said Rab Judah in the name of Rab all the three rabbis derive their respective views from the same passage whose means suffice not for that which pertaineth to his cleansing our Simeon holds the offering that affects atonement is decisive our Judah holds that which affects his qualification to partake of holy things our Elizabeth. B. Jacob holds that which affects cleanness, namely the birds mission a woman who has undergone several confinements, e.g. if she produced a female abortion within 80 days of the birth of a girl and then she produced again a female abortion within 80 days of the first or if she produced a multiple of abortions our Judah says she brings an offering for the first birth and not for the second for the third again but not for the fourth tomorrow whence do we know this a tanner recited before our she's hate this is a law for her that beareth whether a male or a female teaches that she offers but one offering for several births I might perhaps assume then that also for a birth and a discharge of gonorrhea only one offering is brought therefore it is written this it states I might perhaps assume then that also for a birth and a discharge of gonorrhea only one offering is brought if so she should also bring but one offering if she ate blood and gave birth to a child read thus I might Assume that she also brings but one offering for two births if one was before the period of cleanness had expired and the other after it had expired therefore it is written this if she produced within 80 days etc. If you will assume that according to our Judah the first birth causes the offering and the period of uncleanness is counted from the first
account in that the period of impurity thereof interrupts the period of cleanness of the first and that the latter period is afterwards completed and the period of cleanness of the second birth commences thereafter or does Arjuna uphold his view only if it leads to greater stringency but here since it leads to greater leniency he does not uphold his view said Arjuna of Surah come and here for a woman after confinement one may slaughter the paschal lamb and sprinkle the blood on the fortieth day after the birth of a male and on the eightieth day after the birth of a girl whereon it was asked is she not still unclean and Arjuna answered this is in accordance with Arjuna who holds that the second birth is not taken into account now if you assume that with reference to uncleanness Arjuna agrees that the second birth is taken into account how can the paschal sacrifice be slaughtered for her on the fortieth day seeing that even in the evening she will not be permitted to partake of it you must therefore conclude that also with reference to cleanness and uncleanness does Arjuna hold that the second birth is not taken into account no I may still maintain that with reference to cleanness and uncleanness Arjuna agrees that the second birth is taken into account but that law refers to a paschal lamb that is offered in uncleanness but is she then permitted to partake of it have we not learned a paschal lamb that is offered in uncleanness may not be eaten by Zab or Zaba or by menstruant women or by women after confinement these may not eat if they have not immersed the law however which states that one may slaughter and sprinkle for her refers to a woman who has immersed if so she is fit for the paschal lamb from the eighth day onward she is not fit from the eighth day onward for it is held that a Zab who immersed by day has still the status of a Zab if so she is unfit even on the fortieth day no on the fortieth day she is regarded fit for it is held that a Zab who lacks but offerings is not considered a Zab but what will be your answer according to Rabba who holds that a Zab who lacks but offerings is still considered a Zab said Arashi Rabba will interpret the law as referring to the 40th day of the conception of a male and the 80th day of the conception of a female and as being in accordance with Arish male who holds the limit for a male to be 41 days and for a female 81 days but is she not after all unclean as a menstruant woman it deals with a dry birth if so is the law not obvious I might have thought that the opening of the uterus cannot take place without discharge of blood therefore he lets us know that the uterus can open without a discharge of blood Arshima he has said come and here 60 may convey both a connected and a disconnected spell of time therefore it is written days as the day is a connected spell of time so also the 60 days with whom does this conform shall I say with the rabbis Surely according to them a disconnected spell of time is an impossibility it must thus be in accordance with Arjuna and since it is stated that the time must be connected we are led to decide that he upholds his view only if it leads to greater stringency but not if it leads to greater leniency no it may conform with the view of the rabbis but it refers to a woman who brought forth a male abortion within the 80 days of a female birth but then after all is it not so that the days of it first birth finish before those of the second and the rabbis hold that the second birth is taken into account according to the rabbis the law can be realized in the case of a birth of twins a female first and a male afterwards and where the male was e.g. born after 20 days of the period of cleanness had passed so that she must keep up the days relating to the female birth seven days of impurity the discussion then is thus I might think that when twins are born the female first and the male Afterwards the days of impurity of the latter cause an interruption so that the 66 days are counted disjointedly therefore it is written days as the day is a connected spell of time so also the 60 days must be connected Abbe said come and here 30 may convey both a connected and a disconnected spell of time therefore it is written days as the day is a connected spell of time so also the 30 days with whom does this conform shall I say with the rabbis surely according to the rabbis Talmud, Mosque Herath be a disconnected spell of time is an impossibility for they hold that it is the second birth that is of avail it must therefore be in accordance with the view of Arjuna and it proves that he upholds his view only if it leads to greater stringency but not if it leads to greater leniency Arashi too said come and here 6 days may mean both a connected and disconnected spell of time therefore it is written 60 as the 60 days are connected so also the 6 with whom does this conform shall I say with the rabbis surely according to the rabbis a disconnected spell of time is an impossibility for they hold it is the second birth that is of avail it must therefore be according to Arjuna and this proves that he upholds his view only if it leads to greater stringency but not if it leads to greater leniency this is indeed proof mission the following persons bring an offering of higher or lesser value one who refuses to give evidence one who has broken it word of his lips supported by an oath one who while unclean has entered the sanctuary or has partaken of holy things a woman after confinement and a leper Gemara our rabbis taught some bring the offering of the poor and of the rich some of the poor and some of the poorest a woman after confinement brings the offering of the poor and of the rich a leper that of the poor while one who refuses to give evidence or breaks his word or defiles the sanctuary or holy things offers the offering of it Poor and of the poorest another berry that taught sometimes one offering replaces one sometimes two replace two sometimes two replace one and sometimes one replaces two this teaches that the tenth of an ephah is worth a parata the woman after confinement offers one instead of one namely a single bird in the place of the lamb a leper offers two birds in the place of two lambs one who refuses to give evidence or one who breaks his word or one who defiles the sanctuary or holy things offers two birds instead of one lamb and in the case of direst poverty one tenth of an ephah in the place of two birds it says this teaches that the tenth of an ephah is worth a parata whence do we know this our rabbis have taught if one says I vow an offering for the altar worth a cellar he offers a lamb for no offering can be offered for a cellar but a lamb whence do we know this since the divine law stated that the ram of the guilt offering is valued at two shekels from this we learned that a one year old Lamb is valued at one cellar for it is said a lamb of the first year from which follows that a ram is of the second year then we have learned the pair of sacrificial birds on that day stood at a quarter of a dinar we thus see that the divine law has spared the poor and has fixed their sacrifice at the sixteenth part of that of the rich we may then assume that the sacrifice of the poorest is to be the sixteenth part of that of the poor consequently the offering of the poor is worth a quarter of a dinar since a quarter of a dinar has forty-eight perutas a sixteenth thereof would be three perutas while it has been stated this teaches that the tenth of an ephah is worth a perutah why a perutah did you not say the tenth of an ephah is the offering of the poorest and that this offering is worth one sixteenth part of that of the poor which we found was three perutas the tenth derives its proportions from the instance of the woman after confinement who offers in the place of a lamb one the value of which is one thirty-second part of that of a lamb but is not the offering of the poorest still the sixteenth part of the poor as it is inferred from the comparison of the lamb and the ram the ephah should then be valued at a parata and a half said rabbah all is derived from the instance of the woman after confinement in the following manner since the divine law has spared the poor and has fixed their sacrifice at one thirty-second part of that of the rich as we find in the instance of the woman after confinement so we assume that the divine law has spared the poorest in fixing their sacrifice at the thirty-second part of that of the poor if so the ephah should be valued at three quarters of a parata indeed so it is except that it is not becoming to offer to the lord less than a parata mission what is the difference between the handmaid and the forbidden connections from whom she deviates both in regard to the penalty and the offering in the case of all other Forbidden connections a sin offering is brought in that of a handmaid a guilt offering in the case of the other forbidden connections a female animal is offered in that of a handmaid a male in the case of the other forbidden connections man and woman are alike in respect of lashes and the sacrifice in that of the handmaid the man is unlike the woman regarding the lashes and the woman is unlike the man regarding the sacrifice in the case of all other forbidden connections sexual contact is punishable as well as consummated connection and one is guilty for each connection separately finally the case of the handmaid is more stringent Talmud, Mosque in that willful transgression is of the same status as transgression in error to which handmaid does this refer to one who is half a slave and half a free person as it is written and not at all redeemed thus the view of our Akiva Arishmael says to a slave proper our Eliza B. Jacob says of all other forbidden connections it is Explicitly stated that they are holy free people, there is thus left the instance of one who is half a slave and half a free person. Gemara, whence do we know that she is liable to lashes? But not he, our rabbis taught there shall be inquisition. Bikorat conveys that she is liable to lashes. I might still think that both are liable to lashes,
he shall bring a guilt offering unto the Lord, and if there is no inquisition, he shall not bring his guilt offering, but perhaps he has been exempted from lashes. She, however, is liable to lashes as well as to a sacrifice. It reads, and he shall bring his guilt offering unto the Lord. Our Isaac said, One is liable only in the case of a possessed handmaid, as it is written, that is a bondmaid designated for a man. And where do we find that the term designated near Rephet implies that a change has taken place? It is written, and strewed groats harrowed thereon, or as it is written, though thou shouldest pray a fool in order with a pestle among groats harrowed, and they gave their hand that they would put away their wives, and being guilty, they offered a ram of the flock for their guilt. Said Aristotle, this teaches that they had all had intercourse with designated handmaids, to which handmaid does this refer, etc. Our rabbis taught redeemed might convey altogether free, therefore it continues, she is. Not redeemed this on the other hand might convey not at all redeemed therefore it reads redeemed how is this possible she is redeemed yet not wholly redeemed is one who is half a slave and half a free person and is betrothed to a Hebrew slave thus the view of our Akiva Ishmael says the text refers to a heathen bondmaid who is betrothed unto a Hebrew slave while the phrase redeemed she is not redeemed is used in accordance with the language of men are Eliezer B. Ezra says of all forbidden connections it is explicitly stated that they are free people there is thus left the instance of one who is half a slave and half a free person and is betrothed unto a Hebrew slave others say they shall not be put to death because she was not free indicates that the text refers to a heathen bondmaid who is betrothed unto a heathen slave as to our Ishmael it is plausible that redeemed she is not redeemed may be interpreted as a common parlance but whence do we learn that she was betrothed to a Hebrew slave it is written for she was not free he however was free is not the view of our Eliezer B. Ezra identical with that of our Akiva here Eliezer retorts to our Ishmael I agree with you in general that the Torah uses the language of men but this case is different for the text states for she was not free why add redeemed she is not redeemed to learn therefrom that it refers to one who is half a slave and half a free person as to others it is plausible that redeemed she is not redeemed may be interpreted as a common parlance but once do we learn that she was betrothed to a heathen slave the text reads for she was not free since this is superfluous with reference to her it is taken to refer to him mission in the case of all forbidden connections if one partner was a major and the other a minor the latter is exempted if one is awake and the other asleep the latter is exempted finally if one is an inadvertent and the other a willful transgressor the former is liable to a sin Offering the latter to Gareth Gamara is indeed in our instance a minor guilty said Rab Judah this is meant in the case of all forbidden connections if one was a major and the other a minor the latter is exempted and the former guilty in our instance also the major is exempted because both partners depend upon one another if one is awake and the other asleep the latter is exempted is indeed in our instance a sleeping person guilty said Rab Judah in the name of Rab this is meant in the case of all forbidden connections if one is awake and the other asleep the latter is exempted and the former guilty in our instance even the one awake is exempted because they depend upon one another Tanner resided before our sheets hate they have placed on an equal footing a consummated connection with a mere sexual contact an intentional connection with an unintentional and natural connection with a perverse one and one performed while awake with one performed in sleep he retorted how is this meant if it Refers to a designated bondmaid. How does a consummated connection equal a mere sexual contact? In fact, a consummated connection is in the case of a designated bondmaid subject to the law, but a mere sexual contact is not. Similarly, the statement that intentional connection equals unintentional is wrong for one is guilty only in the case of intentional connection, but not otherwise. Similarly, the statement that natural connection equals perverse is wrong for with the designated bondmaid one is guilty only in the case of natural connection, but not in the case of perverse connection because it is written carnally. And then, what is the meaning of the statement that a wakeful person equals a sleeping person? If, on the other hand, the statement refers to other forbidden connections, how does it state consummated connection equals a mere sexual contact? Talmud, Moskirath, the comparison should be in the reverse direction. Said the former, shall I cancel the dictum? He replied, no, this is. Meant a consummated perverse connection with a designated bondmate equals a natural sexual contact when one is exempted because it is written carnally intentional perverse connection with a bondmate equals unintentional connection when one is exempted because it is written carnally perverse connection with a bondmate while awake equals connection while asleep when one is exempted because it is written carnally we thus find that intentional sexual contact in the case of a bondmate equals unintentional connection in the case of other forbidden relations that natural contact in sleep in the case of the bondmate equals connection in sleep in the case of other forbidden relations that perverse connection with the bondmate while awake equals connection in sleep in the case of other forbidden relations C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I-I mission if they say to a person thou hast eaten hell up, he is liable to a sin offering if one witness says he has eaten and another says he has not eaten or if one Woman says he has eaten and another says he has not eaten he is liable to a suspense of guilt offering if one witness says he has eaten and he himself says I have not eaten he is exempted if two witnesses say he has eaten and he himself says I have not eaten our mayor declares him liable to an offering said our mayor if two witnesses are capable of inflicting the severe penalty of death should they not impose the less severe punishment of a sacrifice they replied suppose he said I was a willful transgressor would he not be exempted if one ate twice hell up in one spell of unawareness he is liable to but one offering if one ate hell up blood pickle and nahar in one spell of unawareness he is liable for each kind of food this is an instance where different kinds of food are more stringent than one kind in the following instance however one kind of food is more stringent than several kinds if one ate half an olive size and then again half an olive size both in one spell of unawareness if of one kind he is liable, if of two kinds he is exempted. Demara it is stated if they say to a person thou hast eaten hell up, he is liable to a sin offering. They say implies at least two. And what does he maintain if you assume that he was silent and did not contradict them? It would then follow that only silence in response to two witnesses evokes a sin offering, but not in response to one. Now read the middle clause. If one witness says he has eaten and he himself says I have not eaten, he is exempted. Now the reason that he is exempted is because he contradicts them. But if he did not deny the charge, he would be guilty. And how much more so if there were two witnesses? Rather you must assume that he contradicts the witness. And the law is in accordance with our mayor who holds a contradiction of two witnesses is of no avail. But according to the rabbis, he would indeed be exempted. But then why has this clause at all been mentioned? We know the law from the concluding clause. This is what. He lets us know that this is a point of dispute between Armeir and the rabbi. Some there are who say they say may well refer to a single person as we have learned if a man has gone overseas and they come and tell his wife that he is dead whereupon she marries again if the husband returns alive she has to leave both men and it has been established that this law refers also to one witness whence do we infer this from that which has been stated in the latter clause if she has married again without authority she may return to her husband now what does without authority mean without the authority of the court but upon the evidence of witnesses from this we infer that in the former clause it was done with the authority of the court but upon the evidence of one witness we thus find that they say is used of one witness similarly when it states they say it refers to one witness and what does he the offender say if he contradicts he should be exempted for we have learned in the middle clause. If one witness says he has eaten and he himself says I have not eaten he is exempted again if you say he is silent surely we know this law already from the middle clause if one witness says etc from which is inferred that he is exempted only when he contradicts but when he is silent he is indeed liable to an offering indeed he does not contradict and understand the mission thus if they say to a person thou hast eaten hell up he is liable to a sin offering namely if he is silent but when he himself says I have not eaten he is exempted where do we find in the Torah that a person is liable to an offering if he does not contradict the evidence of others our rabbis taught if his sin be known to him he shall bring his offering but not if others make it known to him I might then think he is exempted even if he does not contradict it is therefore written if it be known to him in whatever manner now to which case does this refer shall I say to one in which two witnesses gave evidence do we in such a case need a text Talmud, Moscow, it must thus refer to one witness giving evidence and yet it says that if there is no contradiction his evidence is valid we have thus proved it said our mayor etc. The question was asked what is the reason of the rabbis
Witnesses maintain that he has just become unclean. How is it come and here if one witness says to a person thou art unclean and he himself says I am not unclean he is exempted. I might assume this holds good also in the case of two witnesses but says our mayor against this there is an fortiori argument since two witnesses are capable of inflicting the severe penalty of death how much more can they impose the less severe punishment of a sacrifice the rabbis say regarding oneself a man is believed more than a hundred witnesses it thus seems that the argument of the rabbis is that regarding oneself a man is believed more than a hundred witnesses said rmi indeed the argument of the rabbis is the conclusion of Migo and understand their reasoning thus as he could if he wanted have said I did not remain unclean and would then be exempted therefore regarding himself he is to be believed more than a hundred witnesses if so is not this instance identical with that concerning Heleb. I might have thought in the case of Heleb I may assume that he explains his words I did not eat in error but willfully but when he is told thou art unclean and he replies I am not unclean I might think his words are not capable of explanation therefore he lets us know that also in this instance we interpret his words as conveying I have not remained unclean for I have immersed come and here and he shall confess implies that if he confesses he is liable to an offering if he does not confess. He is exempted if therefore a witness says to him thou art unclean and he says I am not unclean he is exempted I might think this holds good even in the case where he contradicts two witnesses but says our mayor since two witnesses are capable of inflicting the severe penalty of death how much more can they impose the less severe punishment of a sacrifice our Judah says regarding oneself a man is believed more than a hundred witnesses the rabbis however agree with our Judah in regard to Heleb and it. Entering of the temple precincts, but not in regard to uncleanness. Now, to which uncleanness does this refer? Shall I say Talmud? Moskirath it refers to old uncleanness. Why do the rabbis agree with our Judah only with regard to Heleb and the entering of the temple precincts? Because he might have said, I did it willfully. Also, in the instance of old uncleanness, he could have interpreted his words and say, if he wanted, I did not remain unclean, but immersed. Said Rabbanit refers in fact to old uncleanness, but to a case where the witnesses said to him, Thou hast eaten sacred food while thy body was unclean, and his reply was, I was not unclean. His words are then not open to an explanation, for we cannot say he meant, I did not remain unclean, but immersed for this would convey, I immersed, and indeed did eat, which statement would contradict the first assertion, at least in respect of the uncleanness through contact. Said Arnab and the Halasha is according to our Judah. Said our Joseph, he holds that. He is clean only in private and when appertaining to himself said Reshlakish Armeir agrees with the rabbis that if two witnesses say to a person thou hast had intercourse with a designated bondmate and he maintains that he has had no intercourse he is to be trusted for he could if he wishes have answered them I did not complete the act of cohabitation said Arshis hey Armeir agrees with the rabbis with regard to the uncleanness of a Nazi right that if two witnesses say to him thou art unclean and he replies I am not unclean he is exempted because he could if he wanted have replied I am absolved from the vow of Nazi rightship said Abay Armeir agrees with the rabbis that if two witnesses say to a person thou knowest evidence against a certain man and he says I do not know he is exempted because he could if he wanted have said I was not intent upon giving evidence if one ate twice hell in one spell of unawareness etc to this Arzera Demurd why is he liable to only one sin offering has he not eaten two olive sizes of Heleb replied to him Abay it is a different spells of unawareness that affect separate offerings but in our instance there was but one spell of unawareness some raised the difficulty in the following version the reason that he is liable only to one offering is that there was only one spell of unawareness if however there were two spells of unawareness he would indeed be liable to two offerings but why were not both meals of the same denomination of Heleb replied to him Abay different spells of unawareness affect separate offerings if one ate Heleb blood pickle and nuthar etc it is stated if of one kind he is liable is this not obvious said Reshlakish in the name of Bartut and I we suppose it was eaten in two different dishes and this law is in conformity with the view of our Joshua who generally holds that different dishes do not combine with one another now I might have thought that our Joshua upholds his opinion no matter whether greater Leniency or greater stringency result from it therefore we are taught that he is liable to an offering implying that he upholds his view only when it leads to greater stringency but not when it leads to greater leniency some refer the discussion to the latter part of the passage if of two kinds he is exempted is this not obvious said Reshlakish in the name of Bartut and I we suppose they were eaten in two different dishes and this law is in accordance with our Joshua who holds different dishes. Do not combine with one another now I might have thought that our Joshua upholds his rule only if it leads to greater stringency but not if greater leniency results from it therefore we are taught if of two kinds he is exempted two kinds means in fact one kind it is called two kinds because the eating was in two different dishes and as it is stated that he is then exempted hence we may conclude that our Joshua upholds his rule both if it leads to greater leniency and if it results in greater. Stringency now since the latter part of the passage deals with one kind consumed in two dishes the former part must as its contrast refer to one kind consumed in one dish is not the law then obvious said Rabbanate refers to a case where he became aware of his sin in between and the law is in accordance with Rabban Gamaliel who holds awareness is of no avail with regard to half sizes as we have learned if one writes two letters in two different spells of unawareness one in the morning and the other in the evening Rabban Gamaliel holds he is guilty but the rabbis exempt him Rabban Gamaliel holds awareness is of no avail with regard to half sizes whereas the rabbis maintain it is of avail mission within what time must he eat and the time he would need if he ate a like bulk of parched grains of corn thus the view of Armeir but the rabbis say he must take from the beginning to the end no more time than is required for the eating of a purse to become liable if one eats unclean edibles. Or drinks unclean drinks, or if a priest drinks a quarter of a log of wine and then enters the temple, if no more time has elapsed than is required for the eating of a purse, he is liable. Our Eliezer says if the drinking was interrupted or the wine diluted with water of the smallest quantity, he is exempted. Demar they asked, is Armeir's statement in the direction of stringency or of leniency? Is it in the direction of stringency? And this is what he means the time he would need if he ate of parched grains of corn, though lasting the whole day, thus even though the time that elapsed between the beginning and the end of the meal was longer than is required for the eating of a purse, yet since it was one protracted meal, he is liable. While the rabbis retorted, if no more time has elapsed than is required for the eating of a purse, he is guilty. If more, he is exempted, or is it in the direction of leniency? And this is what he means the time he would need if he ate of parched grains of corn. Provided it was without interruption, but if with interruption he is exempted, even though the time that elapsed between the beginning and the end of the meal is within that required for the eating of the pears, while the rabbis retorted, since the time elapsed between the beginning and the end of the meal was within that required for the eating of the pears, he is guilty. Come in here, but the sages say he must take from the beginning to the end no more time than is required for the eating of the pears. Talmud, Moskirat the Talmud, Moskirat the Now, if you say that our mayor's view is in the direction of stringency, it is right that it reads he must take no more, meaning that he is not liable unless he takes no more time than is required for the eating of the pears. But if you say our mayor's view is in the direction of leniency, it should have read, but the rabbis say if he has taken as much time as is required, it is thus proved that our mayor's view is in the direction of stringency, it is. Indeed proof said Rabbana in the name of Samuel for Heleb and Nibble he must take from the beginning to the end of the meal no more time than is required for the eating of a pears for unclean food reptiles and unclean drinks he may take even the whole day as much as is required for the eating of a pears what does this mean said our papa thus even the whole day so long as he ate an olive size within the time required for the eating of a pears an objection was raised all kinds of food combine. One with the other to half a pears to render the body unfit now does this not mean that he has to eat the half pears within the time required for the eating of a pears no he has to eat an olive size within the time required for a pears an objection was raised all kinds of food combine one with the other to a half pears consumed within the time required for a pears in order to render the body unfit how is this if he ate and then ate again if from the beginning of the first meal to the end of the last no more time has passed than is required for the eating of the pears they combine with one another if more they do not comb
quantity which combines with the first he might assume that the preceding immersion is of avail not knowing that an immersion is valid only at the end it is stated a pregnant woman is permitted to eat a quantity smaller than the standard size because of her serious position if by reason of her serious position she should be permitted to eat even more said our papa read thus a pregnant woman is permitted to eat even more yet in quantity smaller than the standard size because of her serious position it says she who has been in contact with one unclean by a dead body is permitted to nurse her baby and the baby remains clean why is it clean since it has sucked in milk it should be unclean through the milk and should you say it was not prepared i would reply it is prepared by the drop which moistens the nipple answered our in the name of rabbi abba it sucked with great pulse so that no drop was formed to moisten the nipple said rabbi i have two objections to raise Firstly, we see that a child's mouth is filled with milk, and then the milk source has the status of a well. As we have learned, the milk of a woman renders things unclean, whether it was drawn purposely or unintentionally. While the milk of a cow renders things unclean only when brought forth intentionally, now does not unintentionally mean that the child has no pleasure in it. And yet it says that it renders things unclean. Rather, said Rabbi, the reason why the child remains clean is that it is doubtful whether it has sucked in the requisite quantity or not. And even if it did, it is still doubtful whether it was done within the time required for the eating of a pears or during a longer period. But how can Rabbi maintain that the milk source has the status of a well? Have we not learned if milk drips from the breast of a menstruant woman and falls upon an oven? The oven is unclean. Whereupon it was asked, wherewith has the milk become prepared for uncleanness? And are you and replied by the Drop with which the nipple is moistened, and if you say that Rabbi disagrees with Aryohan and has it not been taught, it is thus found that there are nine kinds of liquids of a gonorrhea ridden person, sweat, ill smelling, discharge, and secretion are altogether clean. The tears of his eyes, the blood of his wound, Talmud, Mosque, Rathapi, and the milk of a woman in the quantity of a fourth of a log contract uncleanness as a liquid saliva flux and urine contract the more severe uncleanness in the smallest quantity. Now, if it was true as you say that the milk source has the status of a well milk, you should contract the more severe uncleanness in the smallest quantity like flux and saliva. It is thus proved that the milk source of a woman has not the status of a well, but then what of the contradiction between this veritha and the mission quoted by Rabbi that the milk of a woman renders things unclean whether drawn purposely or unintentionally? Do you indeed think as has hitherto been assumed? That unintentionally means that the child had no pleasure in it. No unintentionally means generally, for it is accepted that the child has its mind upon the milk. But if the child indicates that he has no pleasure in it, it is indeed clean. If one eats unclean edibles, etc., why is it conditional upon the elapse of a certain time? As it reads, if time has elapsed, said Rab Judah, thus it is to be understood. If one eats unclean edibles or drinks unclean drinks, or if a priest drinks a quarter of a log of wine, spending thereon the time required for the eating of the pears, and then enters the temple precincts, he is guilty. Our Eliezer says, etc., our rabbis taught drink no wine nor strong drink. I might think any quantity, and even if taken from the vet, therefore the text states strong drink. He is guilty only if the quantity suffices to make him drunk, which is the quantity capable of causing intoxication. A fourth of a log of wine of forty days standing. Why then has wine been mentioned to tell you that? One is cautioned in regard to the smallest quantity and one is cautioned also in regard to wine drawn from the vat. Our Judah says it reads wine from here we know only wine whence do we know other intoxicating drinks it therefore reads and strong drink if so why has wine been stated wine involves the death penalty other drinks involve only the disregard of a warning our Eliezer says drink no wine and drink no strong drink drink it not in the manner which causes intoxication if however he interrupts or dilutes it with any quantity of water he is not guilty wherein do they differ the first tana holds we draw an inference from the Nazi right by the common expression strong drink our Judah does not hold this inference while our Eliezer holds that what strong drink implies is something intoxicating with whom does the following dictum comply if one eats pressed fix from Hila or drinks honey or milk and then enters the sanctuary and performs the temple service he is liable to lashes. With our Judah said our Judah son of Ahotai the Halachah is in accordance with our Eliezer also Rab spoke of our Eliezer as the most distinguished of the sages Araha accusal had a vow in regard to his wife he came before our Ashi said the latter to him go now and come back tomorrow for Rab appointed no interpreter from the commencement of the festival till the end of the following day on account of intoxication replied the former but did not Rab say the Halachah is according to our Eliezer while you dilute your wine with water said he there is no difficulty his saying refers to a fourth of a log exactly while I had more than a fourth our rabbis have taught and that you may put difference between the holy and the common refers to vows of worth or vows of valuation or to things devoted or consecrated between the unclean and the clean refers to the laws of uncleanness and purity that you may teach refers to decisions concerning forbidden things all the statutes refers to the expositions of the law which the Lord has spoken refers to traditions passed on from Sinai by the hand of Moses refers to the Gemara I might include also the Mishnah therefore it reads that you may teach our Jose B. Judah says I might include also the Gemara therefore it reads that you may teach according to whom is that which has been taught excluded is the decision that a dead reptile is unclean and a dead frog clean which may be given also by one who is intoxicated with wine may we assume that it conforms with our Jose B. Judah's view and not with that of the rabbis no it may conform also with the view of the rabbis but this problem is so simple that one may say go read it at school said Rab the Halachah is in accordance with our Jose B. Judah but surely Rab did not appoint an interpreter from the commencement of the festival to the end of the following day on account of intoxication different it is with Rab who gave also decisions but then why not appoint the interpreter and lay down the rule that no Decisions be given where Rab said it was impossible to avoid giving decisions mission one may by one act of eating become liable to four sin offerings and one guilt offering because if any unclean person eats halab which was at the same time the nuthar of an offering and it was on the day of atonement our Meir says if it was the Sabbath and he carried it out of private possession he is liable to yet another sin offering but they said to him this is of a different denomination Talmud, Mas. Here the Gemara may we infer that our Meir holds that a prohibition may take hold of something already prohibited no although he may hold that a prohibition cannot take hold where another prohibition exists he holds that a prohibition that is more comprehensive or more extensive can take hold of an already existing prohibition to a clean person only halab is prohibited when he becomes unclean since the other parts of the animal become forbidden to him this more comprehensive prohibition. Embraces also halab then halab is forbidden for consumption only when consecrated since it becomes prohibited for all use this more extensive prohibition takes hold of halab it is still then forbidden to layman only but not for the altar when it becomes nuthar since it becomes forbidden also for the altar this more extensive prohibition applies also in respect of layman again if it occurred on the day of atonement since there is added an injunction which is more comprehensive in that it applies also to common food it applies also to the things dedicated to the altar but then why not instance five sin offerings namely when he ate an olive size of pickle he speaks of one animal and not of two and the meat of one and the same animal cannot be nuthar and pickle at the same time but why not is it not possible where e.g. a limb of pickle was wrongly offered upon the altar in which case its disqualification of pickle is lifted and it can thus become nuthar as Allah said if the fistful of it. Offering rendered pickle has been offered upon the altar its pickle disqualification ceases and it may then become nuthar he speaks of one limb and not of two limbs and one and the same limb cannot be nuthar and pickle at the same time but why not is it not possible where e.g. a limb of pickle was offered upon the altar partly resting upon the altar and partly protruding so that the portion which rested upon the altar loses its pickle disqualification and may become nuthar in accordance with Allah who said if the fistful of an offering rendered pickle has been offered upon the altar its disqualification ceases and it may become nuthar he replied it is not possible for if the major portion rests upon the altar the whole is reckoned as being on the altar if the major portion is protruding the whole is reckoned as being outside but then you could decide there from the query of Rami son of Hama as to whether one goes by the majority in regard to sacrificial limbs or not he speaks of one olive size and not of two but is this indeed so does he not deal with the day of atonement where the
of an appointed man man implies that also a non-priest is qualified appointed implies even if he is unclean and even on the Sabbath appointed means designated for it now it is here stated appointed implies even on the Sabbath whereupon Rafram remarked this proves that the laws concerning Arab and transport apply to the Sabbath and do not apply to the Day of Atonement how is this proof maybe the scapegoat is an exception for its whole validity is bound up with the Day of Atonement the dictum of Rafram is indeed void mission one may by one act of incestuous connection become liable to six sin offerings as if one had intercourse with his daughter he is guilty of incest with his daughter his sister his brother's wife the wife of his father's brother and of intercourse with a married woman and a menstruous woman Talmud Moskirathah Gemara but does not our hold a prohibition cannot take hold of something already forbidden although he generally holds that a prohibition cannot take hold where another prohibition exists he admits that a prohibition which is more comprehensive or more extensive can take hold of an already existing prohibition or instances than to be understood thus he had intercourse with his mother who bore him a daughter so that the latter becomes prohibited to him simultaneously as his daughter and his sister when she marries his brother since she becomes prohibited also to his other brothers this comprehensive prohibition becomes operative. Also with reference to himself when she then marries his father's brother since she becomes prohibited to the other brothers of his father this comprehensive prohibition becomes operative also with reference to himself in her capacity now as a married woman since she becomes prohibited to the whole world this comprehensive prohibition becomes operative also with regard to himself finally as a menstruant woman since she becomes forbidden even to her own husband this comprehensive prohibition become operative also with reference to himself mission if one had intercourse with his daughter's daughter he may thereby become guilty for offending with his daughter's daughter his daughter-in-law his brother's wife the wife of his father's brother his wife's sister a married woman and finally a menstruant woman our jose remarked if the grandfather had committed transgression and married her first he may thereby become guilty for offending with his father's wife so too if one had connection with his wife's daughter or her daughter's daughter Gemara, it is stated he may thereby become guilty for offending with his father's wife was she then permitted to him replied are Yohan, and the case is met if she fell unto him in Levi right marriage if so what means had committed transgression he committed transgression in that she was his son's daughter-in-law which is a forbidden relation in the second degree as has been taught a daughter-in-law is an incestuous relation by law of the Torah of it. Daughter-in-law of a son is forbidden as a relation in the second degree. The same distinction is made between the daughter of a son and the daughter of a son's son, etc. To the end of all generations. But does our Jose indeed hold that a prohibition can take hold of something already forbidden? Have we not learned if one has committed a sin which involves two death penalties, he is condemned to the more stringent of the two forms of execution. Our Jose, however, maintains he is sentenced for the sin that took hold first, and it was taught how is our Jose's ruling that he is sentenced for the sin that took hold first to be understood. If e.g. she was forbidden to him first as his mother-in-law, and then as a married woman, he is sentenced for intercourse with a mother-in-law. If she was forbidden to him first as a married woman, and then as a mother-in-law, he is sentenced for connection with a married woman. Answered Arabab, our Jose admits an exception to the rule when the new prohibition is more. Comprehensive also when Rabin came he said in the name of Aryohan and Arhose admitted when the new prohibition was more comprehensive but in which respect is it more comprehensive here when the grandfather had another son as the new prohibition comprises also the other son it becomes operated with regard to the offender himself mission if one had intercourse with his mother-in-law he may thereby become guilty for offending with his mother-in-law his daughter-in-law his brother's wife the wife of his father's brother his wife's sister a married woman and finally a menstruant woman and so too if one had intercourse with the mother of his father-in-law or of his mother-in-law Aryohan and Binary remarked if one had intercourse with his mother-in-law he may thereby become guilty for offending with his mother-in-law the mother of his mother-in-law and the mother of his father-in-law they said to him all these three are of one denomination Gemara said Aralazer in the name of Arhashiar. Yohanan Binri and Simicus adhere to the same rule. Are Yohanan Binri as stated above as to Simicus we have learned Talmud, Moskirathah if one slaughtered an animal together with its young calf and then the young itself he is liable to forty lashes. Simicus said in the name of our Meir to eighty said Rabba there is perhaps no comparison maybe our Yohanan Binri maintains its view only in the instance of our Mishnah because the prohibitions are at least of different designations for she may be described as his mother-in-law and also as the mother of his mother-in-law and the mother of his father-in-law in the instance however concerning the killing of a mother animal and its young where there is only one designation and all such cases are known by the one name maybe his ruling will not hold good our Naman B. Isaac raised his doubt in the opposite direction maybe Simicus maintains its view only in the case of the law concerning the killing of mother and young because the objects are different in the instance of our mission, however, where there is only one object, I might perhaps argue that he simic is held with the ruling of Arabab delivered in the name of Aryohan and for Arabab said in the name of Aryohan and in the expression they are near kinswomen, it is wickedness. Scripture indicates that they are all one kind of wickedness. Mission said Ar I asked Rabban Gamaliel and Ar Joshua at the meat market of Emmaus whether they went to buy a beast for the wedding feast. Of Rabban Gamaliel's son, what I asked the law of a man had intercourse inadvertently with his sister, his father's sister, and his mother's sister, is he liable to one offering for all the trespasses or to one separate offering for each of them? They replied, We have heard nothing about this, but we have heard that if one had intercourse with his five wives while they were menstruant in one spell of unawareness, he is liable to a sacrifice for each act, and it seems to us that the case you state. May be derived therefrom by an aforciori conclusion. Gemara, how is the query to be understood? If as is stated, what question is there? Seeing that the prohibitions as well as the persons involved are distinct, this is rather what it means to state what is the law. If one had intercourse with a sister who is at the same time his father's sister and his mother's sister, is he liable to one sacrifice for all the trespasses or to one separate sacrifice for each of them? Do we argue that here are diverse prohibitions, or do we argue from the fact that the persons are not diverse? They replied, We have heard nothing about this, but we have heard that if one had intercourse together with his five wives while they were menstruant, whereby only one prohibition has been transgressed, he is liable to a sacrifice for each act of transgressing the law concerning menstruant women. And it seems to us that the case you state may be derived therefrom by an aforciori conclusion. Thus, if one is liable. To separate offerings in the case of intercourse together with his five menstruant wives whereby only one prohibition has been transgressed how much more should one be liable to separate offerings in the case of the sister who is at the same time his father's sister and his mother's sister whereby three different prohibitions have been transgressed but against this conclusion one may object the case of the five menstruant women is rightly more stringent because several persons are involved. The ruling must rather be derived from the scriptural verse which says he has uncovered the nakedness of his sister indicating that one is liable to separate offerings in the case of a sister who is at the same time his father's sister and his mother's sister said are Adabi Ahab this can arise in the case of a wicked man the son of a wicked man visit a man had connection with his mother who bore him two daughters and then had connection with one of these daughters who bore him a son. This son then had connection with his mother's sister who is at the same time his sister and his father's sister he is indeed a wicked man the son of a wicked man our rabbis taught if one had intercourse inadvertently with one of the incestuous relations and then again and then again he is liable to an offering for each act these are the words of our Eliezer but the sages say he is liable only once the sages however agree with our Eliezer that if a man had intercourse at the same time with his five men's true and wives that he is liable for each act since he caused them liability to separate offerings rabbis said to our nom and do we say as an argument since he caused them liability to separate offerings surely it has been taught if the man committed several acts in one spell of unawareness and she in five separate spells of unawareness he is liable to one offering only and she to one for each act say rather since the persons were different the query was raised if one cut plants on the Sabbath and then cut again what would be the law according to our Eliezer is our Eliezer's reason in the previous case because two acts were committed and that was why he ruled that he was liable for each act so here also since he committed two acts he is liable for each act or perhaps our Eliezer's reason in
Here we deal with a branch of a vine which was overhanging a fig tree and he cut off both branches at one time. Our Eliezer therefore declares him culpable since both the denominations and the objects were different in what circumstances then would a man be exempt according to our Eliezer when cutting a plant twice only if he cut off two plants of a dry fig size in one stroke but if he cut off one plant of a dry fig size and then another of a dry fig size he is indeed liable to two. Offerings mission are Akiba further ask if a limb hangs loose from the body of a living beast what is the law they replied we have heard nothing about this but we have heard about a limb hanging loose from the body of a man that it is clean and thus Talmud, Mosque Herathoth be those that were afflicted with boils used to do in Jerusalem the afflicted person would go on the eve of Passover to the physician and he would cut the limb until only contact of a hairbreadth was left he then stuck it on a thorn and then tore himself away from it in this manner both that man and the physician could participate in the Passover offering and it seems to us that your case may be derived from this by an aforciori conclusion tomorrow we have learned elsewhere if one scrapes liquid from off a leak or wrings his hair with a cloth the liquid which remained within does not render foodstuffs susceptible to uncleanness that which came forth does render them susceptible remark Samuel the leak itself is now Susceptible to uncleanness because when its liquid emerged the leak became susceptible but surely we have learned the afflicted person would go on the eve of Passover etc. Now if you are to assert that when its liquid emerged the leak became susceptible why should not the same apply to the loosened limb at the moment of severance it should render the man unclean it is as Rab Joseph stated elsewhere that it was removed with great force so say also here that the afflicted person tore himself away with great force and where was that statement of Rab Joseph made in connection with the following of Azab or one rendered unclean through contact with a dead body was walking while the rain fell upon him though the water was squeezed by him from the upper towards the lower part of his clothes it is regarded as clean for it is of no consequence so long as it is not wholly removed from the clothes if however it is wholly removed from the clothes it renders foodstuffs susceptible to Uncleanness for it is of consequence only after its complete removal from the body in connection with this Rab Joseph said it had been removed with great force mission of furthermore our Akiba asked if a man slaughtered in one spell of unawareness five sacrifices outside the temple precincts what is the law is he liable to a separate offering for each act or only to one for them all they replied we have heard nothing about this said our Joshua I have heard that if one eats of an offering from five different dishes in one spell of unawareness he is guilty of the transgression of the law of sacrilege for each of them and it seems to me that the case in question may be inferred from this by an aforciori conclusion said our Simeon not of such a case did our Akiba ask but of one who ate of the Nahar of five sacrifices in one spell of unawareness what is the law is he liable only to one offering for all of them or is he liable to a separate one for each of them they replied we have heard Nothing about this said our Joshua I have heard that if one ate in one spell of unawareness of one sacrifice from five different dishes he is guilty of the transgression of the law of sacrilege for each of them and it seems to me that the case in question may be derived therefom by an aforciori conclusion retorted to him our Akiba if this is an authentic tradition we shall accept it but if it is only a logical deduction there is a rebuttal said our Eliza rebutted he replied it cannot be you may hold the strict view in the law of sacrilege since in connection with it the person who gives others to eat of holy things is as guilty as the consumer himself and the person who causes others to derive a benefit from them is as guilty as the person who himself made use of them furthermore small quantities are reckoned together in the case of sacrilege even after the lapse of a long period whilst not one of these rulings applies to the case of Nahar tomorrow what objection had our Simeon? This was his objection. How can you prove the case of slaughtering from that of eating? Maybe the ruling holds good only in the case of eating since the offender derived enjoyment. Therefore, what he asked them was this if one ate of the Nahar of five sacrifices in one spell of unawareness, what is the law? Is he liable to a separate offering for each of them or only to one offering for all of them? They replied, We have heard nothing about this. Said our Joshua, I have heard that if one ate in one spell of unawareness of a sacrifice from five different dishes, he is guilty of the transgression of the law of sacrilege for each of them. And it seems to me that the case in question may be derived therefrom by an aforciori conclusion. Thus, if when one eats five different dishes from one sacrifice where there are not distinct bodies, he is liable for each dish because there were separate dishes. How much more would one be liable for each eating in the case of the five sacrifices where there? Our distinct body said our Simeon not of such a case did our Akiba ask but of one who ate of the Nahar of five sacrifices in one spell of unawareness what is the law is he liable only to one offering for all of them or is he liable to a separate offering for each of them they replied we have heard nothing about this said our Joshua I have heard that if one ate in one spell of unawareness of one sacrifice from five different dishes he is guilty of the transgression of the law of sacrilege for each of them and it seems to me that the case in question may be derived therefrom by an aforciori conclusion retorted to him our Akiba if this is an authentic tradition we shall accept it etc did our Joshua give way to our Akiba's objection or not come and here it has been taught if one ate five portions of the Nahar of one sacrifice from five dishes but in one spell of unawareness he is liable to but one sin offering and in case of doubt to but one suspense of guilt offering it from five dishes and in five different spells of unawareness he is liable to a sin offering for each portion and in case of doubt to a suspense of guilt offering for each portion if the portions were from five sacrifices though consumed in one spell of unawareness he is liable for each of them our Jose son of Arjuna holds even if he ate in one spell of unawareness five portions from five different sacrifices he brings but one sin offering and in case of doubt but one suspense of guilt offering the general rule is whenever there is a plurality of sin offerings there is also correspondingly a plurality of suspense of guilt offerings if he ate five portions from five dishes of the meat of one sacrifice prior to the sprinkling of its blood even if he did it in one spell of unawareness he is guilty of the trespass of the law of sacrilege for each of them Talmud, Mosque and now in the last instance it does not continue and in case of doubt he is liable to a suspense of guilt offering now whose view does this statement follow? Shall I say our Akibas then it should have stated in the latter clause and in case of doubt is liable to a suspense of guilt offering for we have learned our Akibas prescribes a suspense of guilt offering in the case of doubtful sacrilege it must therefore follow our Joshua's view and yet we read if in five different spells of unawareness he is liable to five sin offerings we thus learn that our Joshua gave way to his our Akibas objection but cannot the opposite also be proved from one of the latter clauses which reads if the portions were from five offerings though consumed in one spell of unawareness he is liable for each of them thus proving that he did not accept his objection hence you are compelled to assume that we have here the views of two different tanaim according to one tana here Joshua gave way according to another he did not give way to our Akibas objection then you might also answer that our Akibas view is followed but that the Anonymous Tan accepts his one opinion and rejects the other thus he agrees with him or Akiba in the rules relating to unawareness of sin but disagrees with regard to sacrilege how is one guilty fivefold of the law of sacrilege said Samuel as we have learned five things in a burnt offering can combine one with the other the meat the fat the wine the fine flour and the oil Hezekiah said if he ate of five different limbs Resh said you may even say that he ate of one limb yet fivefold sacrilege can arise in the case of the four limb our Isaac the Smith said if he ate it with five different dishes or Yohanan said if he ate it in five different preparations Mishnah said our Akiba asked our Eliza if one performed many acts of work of the same category on different Sabbaths but in one spell of unawareness what is the law is he liable to one offering only for all of them or to a separate one for each of them he replied to me he is liable for each of them and this can be Derived by an aforciori conclusion, if for intercourse with men's true and women in which prohibition there are neither many categories nor many ways of sinning, one is liable for each act. How much more must one be liable to separate offerings in the case of the Sabbath in connection with which there are many categories of work and many ways of sinning? I retorted to him, No, you may hold this view in the case of the men's true and women, since therein there is a twofold prohibition. The man is cautioned against connection with the men's true and women, and the men's true and woman is cautioned against connection with the man. But can you hold the same in the case of the Sabbath where there is only one prohibition? He said to me, Let then the case of interc
Principal acts of work now as to the Sabbaths what was his query are we to say that where a man performed an act of work on several Sabbaths in ignorance of the Sabbath though knowing full well that that act was prohibited Rabbi Akiba had no doubt at all that the intervening weekdays affected a knowledge to separate the occasions and his question was only where he performed the act knowing full well on each occasion that it was Sabbath but not knowing that it was a prohibited act. The query being whether different Sabbaths were comparable to different objects or not or rather that where a man performed an act of work on several Sabbaths with knowledge of the Sabbath on each occasion but in ignorance of its prohibition our Akiba had no doubt at all that the different Sabbaths were comparable to different objects and his question was only where he performed the act in ignorance of the Sabbath though knowing full well that that act was prohibited his query being. Whether the intervening weekdays affected a knowledge to separate the occasions or not said Rabbi Talmud, Moskirathoth be it is reasonable to assume that in the case of the act being performed in ignorance of the Sabbaths and with knowledge of its prohibition he had no doubt at all that the intervening weekdays affected separateness and that his question was only when the act was performed with the knowledge of the Sabbaths but in ignorance of its prohibition the point in doubt being. Whether different Sabbaths are like different objects or not his reply was that in the case of the act being done with knowledge of the Sabbaths but in ignorance of its prohibition the different Sabbaths were like different objects this reply however here Akiba did not accept he then proved that secondary acts of work were on a PAR with principal acts of work but this too he rejected said Rabbi once do I derive this from that which we have learned a great general rule has been laid down. With regard to Sabbath, he who was altogether oblivious of the principle of Sabbath and performed many acts of work on many Sabbaths is liable to one offering only if he knew the principle of Sabbath and did many acts of work on many Sabbaths. He is liable for each Sabbath if he knew each time that the day was Sabbath and did many acts of work on many Sabbaths. He is liable for each principal act of work. Now it does not say he is liable for each principal act of work and for each Sabbath whom does. The mission follow shall I say our Eliza read then the latter clause if he did many secondary acts of work of the same principal class he is liable only to one offering but according to our Eliza he should be liable for each of the secondary acts of work as if they were principal acts of work hence it is clear that this mission then represents our Akiba's view and it is here but proved that he had no doubt at all that in the case of an act being done in ignorance of the Sabbath and with Knowledge of its prohibition the intervening weekdays affected separateness and that his question was only when the act was performed with knowledge of the Sabbath but in ignorance of its prohibition the point being whether different Sabbaths are like different objects or not the other solution was that they were like different objects and that secondary acts were on a PAR with principal acts of work but both answers were rejected by him said Abbe to him indeed I maintain that our Akiva had no doubt that different Sabbaths were not comparable to different objects in the case where an act was done with knowledge of the Sabbath but in ignorance of its prohibition and his question was only in the case where an act was done in ignorance of the Sabbath but with knowledge of its prohibition the query being whether the intervening weekdays affected separateness or not the solution offered was that the intervening weekdays affected separateness and this was accepted by him he also Ruled that secondary acts of work were on a PAR with principal acts of work, but this was rejected by him. Rav Hista said in the case of an act being done with knowledge of the Sabbath, but in ignorance of its prohibition, even our Akiva agrees that the different Sabbath days are like different objects. But his query was whether the intervening weekdays affected separateness in the case where an act was done in ignorance of the Sabbath, but with knowledge of its prohibition, the other solution was that the intervening weekdays affected separateness, and this was accepted by him. He also ruled that secondary acts of work were on a PAR with principal acts of work, but this was rejected by him. Said Rav Hista once do I derive this from that which has been taught if one wrote on Sabbath two letters in one spell of unawareness, he is liable to an offering if in separate spells of unawareness. Rav Gamaliel says he is liable, and the sages say he is not. Rav Gamaliel, however, admits that if. He wrote one letter on one Sabbath and the other on another he is exempt whereas in another Beretha it has been taught if one wrote two letters on two different Sabbaths one on one Sabbath and the other on another Rabban Gamaliel declares him liable and the sages declare him not liable on the assumption that Rabban Gamaliel followed our Akiva's opinion Rabbi Hisda argued thus according to me who hold that in the case of an act being performed with knowledge of the Sabbath but in ignorance of its prohibition even our Akiva agrees that the different Sabbath days are like different objects there is no contradiction for that which taught that he is exempt refers to a case where the letters were written with knowledge of the Sabbath but in ignorance of the prohibition in which case the different Sabbaths are like different objects Talmud, Moscow, Tate, and that which taught that he is liable refers to a case where the letters were written in ignorance of the Sabbath but with knowledge of their prohibition the liability arising in pursuance of the rule that awareness is of no consequence with regard to half sizes but how is it according to Rabbi who says that our Akiva considers different Sabbaths as one object it is true that that which taught he is liable may be met either by the case where the letters were written with knowledge of the Sabbath but in ignorance of their prohibition when it is held that the Sabbaths are considered as one object or by the case where the letters were written in ignorance of the Sabbath but with knowledge of their prohibition when it is held that awareness is of no consequence with regard to half sizes but of which case speaks a statement that he is exempt neither the one nor the other suits Rabbi may retort Rabban Gamaliel follows our Eliezer's opinion who holds different Sabbaths are as different objects but since it states Rabban Gamaliel however admits it follows that they disagree in the other cases now if we say that he holds with our Akiva it is well for then their dispute is in the case where the letters were written in ignorance of the Sabbath but with knowledge of their prohibition Rabban Gamaliel holding awareness is of no consequence with regard to half sizes he admits however that he is exempt in the case where the letters were written with knowledge of the Sabbath but in ignorance of their prohibition because in that case he holds a view that different Sabbaths are regarded as different objects but if as you say that Rabban Gamaliel follows our Eliezer since the phrase Rabban Gamaliel however admits implies that they disagree in some cases then it will be asked which is the case wherein they differ if it is in the case where the letters were written in ignorance of the Sabbath but with knowledge of their prohibition but in that case even our Eliezer agrees with Rabban Gamaliel that awareness is of no consequence with regard to half sizes as has been taught if one wrote Two letters on two Sabbaths, one letter on the one Sabbath and the other on the other Sabbath, our Eliezer holds he is liable, neither can it be in the law concerning the weaving of one thread onto a web, for he declares him liable in that case as we have learned, our Eliezer holds that if one wove on the Sabbath three threads at the beginning of a web or added one thread onto an existing web, he is liable, said Rabbi the phrase Rabban Gamaliel, however, admits implying that elsewhere they disagree is with reference to the following one case, for it has been taught if one carried out on the Sabbath the bulk of half a dry fig and then again the bulk of half a dry fig, if in one spell of unawareness he is liable, if in two spells of unawareness he is exempt, our Jose said if in one spell of unawareness and also into the same domain he is liable, if in different domains he is exempt, Rabban Gamaliel thus follows the view of the first ten and our Eliezer that of our Jose command. Here he replied to me he is liable for each of them and this can be derived by an afortiori conclusion if for intercourse with men's true and women in which prohibition there are neither many categories etc. Now it is well according to our Hista who explained that his query referred to the case where the act was performed in ignorance of the Sabbath but with knowledge of its prohibition and that the question was whether the intervening weekdays affected a division or not for then it is right why. The answer in the Mishnah speaks of a men's true and woman but according to Rabbi who explained that his query referred to the case where the act was performed with knowledge of the Sabbath but in ignorance of its prohibition and that the question was whether different Sabbaths were regarded as different objects the answer should speak of men's true and women Rabbi can tell you read indeed men's true and women Samuel read a men's true and woman Rabbi Abiyah have also read a men's true and woman are Nathan B. Ashai read men's true and women but according to Rav Hista who explained that his query referred to the case where the act was performed in ignorance of the Sabbath but with knowledge of its prohibition and that the question was whether the intervening weekdays affected a division or not how can such a query as to whether the intervening days affected a
There is but one prohibition in that man is cautioned against profaning the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is not cautioned against him. One is liable for each act. How much more should he be liable for each act in the instance of a menstruant woman where the prohibition is twofold in that a man is cautioned against connection with a menstruant woman and a menstruant woman is cautioned against connection with a man here. Akiba retorted, No, you may hold this view in the case of the Sabbath because there are concerning it many categories of work and many ways of sinning, but can you hold the same in the case of the menstruant woman where there are neither many categories nor many ways of sinning? Here Eliza replied, Let the case of intercourse with menstruant minors serve as your premise where there are neither many categories nor many ways of sinning, and yet one is liable for each act. Here Akiba retorted, No, you may hold us in the case of menstruant minors since they are. Different bodies here Eliza replied let the law concerning copulation with a beast serve as your premise where there are not different bodies and one is nevertheless liable for each act here Akiba retorted the law concerning copulation with a beast is indeed comparable to that of the menstruant woman C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-B Mishnah if a person was in doubt whether he had eaten halab or not or even if he had certainly eaten of it but was in doubt as to whether it had the requisite quantity Talmud, Mosque Erethoth B or less or if there were before him permitted fat as well as halab and he ate of one of them and does not know of which of them he ate or if his wife and his sister were with him in the room and he unwittingly united with one of them and does not know with which of them he unwittingly united or if he did forbidden labor and does not know whether it was on the Sabbath or on a weekday he is liable to a suspensive guilt offering just as a person who ate halab. Twice in one spell of unawareness is liable only to one sin offering so too when the transgression is in doubt he is only liable to one suspensive guilt offering if in the meantime he became aware of the possible trespass he is liable to a separate suspensive guilt offering for each act just as he would in similar circumstances be liable to a separate sin offering for each act just as one is liable to separate sin offerings if he ate in one spell of unawareness hellab and blood and pickle. And not so too when the transgression is in doubt he is liable to a suspensive guilt offering for each act Amar it was stated Rabbi C said the first case of the mission refers to one piece about which there was a doubt whether it was hellab or permissible fat Hibi Rab said it refers to one of two pieces what is the basis of their dispute Rabbi C holds that the traditional spelling of the text is authoritative and in scripture it is written a commandment while Hibi Rab holds. That the reading of the text is authoritative and we read commandments are who raised an objection to Rabbi C. Others say Hi Rab raised the objection to Rabbi C. It reads in the Mishnah if there were before him permitted fat as well as halab and he ate of one of them may we not infer therefrom that as this latter clause refers to two pieces so does also the first clause refer to two pieces replied Rab do not draw conclusions from something which may be interpreted in the opposite. Direction I can answer you that the latter clause deals with two pieces and the former with one piece but if so may we not argue if one is liable to an offering in the case of one piece how much more so in the case of two pieces the statement of the Mishnah is after the pattern of this and needless to say also this now according to Hi who holds as the latter clause refers to two pieces so does also the former refer to two pieces why this repetition the latter clause is an Explanation of the former if a person was in doubt whether he had eaten halab or not he is liable to a suspensive guilt offering and how does such a case arise if there were before him permitted fat as well as halab said Rab Judah in the name of Rab if there were before a person two pieces one of permitted fat and the other of halab and he ate of one of them and does not know of which of them he ate he is liable if there was one piece before him about which there was a doubt. Whether it was permitted fat or halab and he ate of it he is exempt said Rabba what is the reason for Rab's view it is that scripture says and will do one of the commandments of the Lord in error the error must be produced by two objects for although the spelling is a commandment we read commandments have a raised an objection to him it has been taught our Eliezer says if one eats of the halab of a koi he is liable to a suspensive guilt offering he replied our Eliezer holds that the spelling is Authoritative and the spelling is a commandment he raised another objection we have learned if it is doubtful whether what is born is a nine-month child of the first husband or a seven-month child of the second he must put her away and the child is deemed legitimate but each is liable to a suspensive guilt offering this too follows our Eliezer's view he raised a further objection we have learned if the stain was found on his cloth they are both unclean and liable to an offering if upon hers and immediately after the coition they are unclean and liable to an offering but if upon hers sometime after they must regard themselves unclean by reason of the doubt but are exempt from offerings and upon this it was taught they are nevertheless liable to suspensive guilt offerings this too follows our Eliezer's view sent our high in the name of rabbit there were before a person two pieces one halab and the other permitted fat and he ate of one of them and does not know of which he Eight is liable if there was only one piece about which there was a doubt whether it was permitted fat or halab and he ate it he is exempt set our zero what is Rab's reason he is of the opinion that in the case of two pieces it is possible to determine the transgression in the case of one piece it is not possible to determine the transgression what is the difference between the reason offered above by Rabba and that of our zero if there were one and a half olive sizes according to Rabba he is exempt for there are not two pieces according to our zero however there is the possibility of determining the transgression our Jeremiah raised an objection to our zero our Eliezer says if one eats of the halab of a koi he is liable to a suspensive guilt offering the latter replied our Eliezer to be sure holds that the possibility of determining the transgression is not an essential condition for the bringing of a suspensive guilt offering Talmud Moskirita he raised another objection we have learned if it is doubtful whether what is born is a nine-month child of the first husband or a seven-month child of the second he must put her away and the child is deemed legitimate but each is liable to a suspensive guilt offering this too is according to our Eliezer he raised a further objection we have learned if the stain was found upon her cloth and immediately after the coition they are unclean and liable to sin offerings if upon her sometime after they must regard themselves unclean by reason of the doubt but are exempt from offerings and upon this it was taught they are nevertheless liable to suspensive guilt offerings this too is according to our Eliezer Rab said in the name of Rabbi Abba who delivered it in the name of Rabbi if there were before a person two pieces one halab and the other permitted fat and he ate of one of them and does not know of which he ate he is liable if there was only one piece about which there was a doubt whether it was halab or permitted fat and he ate it he is exempt said Rab Naman Rab's reason is that in the case of two pieces the presence of the forbidden substance is established in the case of one piece the presence of the forbidden substance is not established what is the practical difference between this reason that the forbidden substance is established and the one stated above that it is possible to determine the transgression a difference will arise in the case of two pieces one halab and the other permitted fat and a gentile first ate one piece and then an Israelite the other according to Rabba he is exempt for there were not two pieces at the time when the Israelite ate is according to our zero two he is exempt for it is not possible to determine the transgression but according to Rab Naman he is liable for the presence of the forbidden substance was established Rabba raised an objection to Rab Naman our Eliezer says if one eats of the halab of a koi he is liable to it. Suspensive guilt offering our Eliezer does not hold that the presence of the forbidden substance must be established he raised another objection we have learned if it is doubtful whether what is born is a nine-month child of the first husband or a seven-month child of the second he must put her away and the child is deemed legitimate but each is liable to a suspensive guilt offering this too is according to our Eliezer he raised a further objection we have learned if the stain was found on his cloth they are both unclean and liable to offerings if upon hers and immediately after the coition they are unclean and liable to offerings but if upon hers sometime after they must regard themselves as unclean by reason of the doubt but are exempt from offerings and upon this it was taught they are nevertheless liable to suspensive guilt offerings to this objection he remained silent when the former had left he said to himself why did I not reply that this law represents it? View of Armeir who holds that the presence of the forbidden substance need not be established as has been taught if one slaughtered a suspensive guilt offering outside the temple precincts Armeir holds him liable to a sin offering the sages declare him exempt but why did he not say I might have retorted that the teaching represented our Eliezer's view to indicate at the same time that Armeir follows our Eliezer
The first deliberately and the second unwittingly he is exempt but Rabbi declares him liable if he ate both pieces deliberately he is altogether exempt if two ate the two pieces both unwittingly they are both liable to suspense of guilt offerings though the second is not liable by law but rather because if you said that he was exempt you would thereby establish a sin offering for the first now whose view does the last clause follow if Rabbis then the second should surely be liable by law if that of the sages then the question arises how can we order the second to bring a sacrifice thereby causing a secular animal to be brought into the temple precincts merely on the ground that otherwise a sin offering would be established for the first said Rabbi Ashi Talmud, Moscow Rathbi it follows our Eliezer's opinion who holds that a man may freely offer every day a suspense of guilt offering we therefore advise the second to bring a suspense of guilt offering and to stipulate thus if it First ate the permitted fat and therefore he the halab let it be an expiatory offering otherwise let it be a free will offering our rabbis taught if one ate doubtful halab and came to know of it then again ate doubtful halab and came to know of it rabbi says I hold just as he would be liable to bring separate sin offerings so is he also liable to bring separate suspensive guilt offerings our Jose son of our Judah our Eliezer and our Simeon hold he is only liable to one suspensive guilt offering for it. Says for his error which he heard even in the case of many errors he is liable to only one offering said our zero rabbi as here taught that the awareness of the doubt separates the acts for sin offerings rabbi said awareness of the doubt does not separate the acts for sin offerings but this is what he rabbi meant to teach just as he would be liable to separate sin offerings if he became aware after each act that the transgression was certain so he is also liable to separate suspensive. Guilt offerings if he became each time aware of the doubt said Abay to him Rabbah and are you not of the opinion that awareness of the doubt separates the acts for sin offerings but surely if you were to assume that awareness of the doubt does not separate the acts for sin offerings so that he brings only one sin offering then why should he bring a separate suspense of guilt offering for each has it not been taught this is the general rule wherever a separation is effected with regard to sin offerings there also a separation is effected with regard to suspense of guilt offerings said Rabbah Behan and to Abay also according to you who hold that the awareness of the doubt separates the acts for sin offerings it should follow that if one ate an olive's bulk of hella before the day of atonement and again an olive's bulk of hella after the day of atonement since the day of atonement is equivalent to a suspense of guilt offering he should have to bring two sin offerings but this cannot before he ate at both times in one spell of unawareness, Abbe replied, who says that the day of atonement atones even when the sin remained unknown, perhaps only when he is aware of it. Said Rabbi to him, We have explicitly learned the day of atonement atones both for known and unknown sins. According to another version, Rabbi Behan and said thus to Abbe, What if one ate an olive's bulk of halab in the morning of the day of atonement and another in the afternoon of the day of atonement? Would he also be liable to two sin offerings? Retorted Abbe, who says that every moment of the day of atonement atones, perhaps only the day as a whole atones from the evening. Said to him, Rabbi Behan and Simpleton, Have we not learned if one committed a doubtful sin on the day of atonement, even if it was already twilight, he is exempt for the whole day affects atonement? Our son of Abin raised an objection. We have learned if one ate and drank on the day of atonement in one spell of unawareness, he is. Liable to one sin offering only now it is hardly possible that between the eating and the drinking there was not an interval during which he might become aware that it was the day of atonement so that that interval of the day of atonement affected atonement for him in accordance with the rule that the day of atonement has the same effect as a suspense of guilt offering yet it states that he is liable to one sin offering only now if it is true that the awareness of the doubt separates it. Acts for sin offerings he should be liable to two sin offerings say Arzara only interpreted rabbis view whilst this follows that of the rabbis but is not the latter clause in the side of Mishnah in pursuance of rabbis opinion for it teaches if he drank brine or pickle juice he is exempt from which it may be inferred that if vinegar he is liable and this is in accordance with rabbi for it has been taught vinegar is not a refreshing drink rabbi says it is now as the latter clause follows. Rabbi, have we not to assume that also the first is in accordance with his view? Say the latter clause follows Rabbi, but the former follows the Rabbi's Rabbi raised an objection to our Zara if one ate of holy things on one day and then again on the following day, or made use thereof on one day and again on the following day, or ate thereof on one day and made use thereof on the following day, or made use thereof on one day and ate thereof on the following day, or even when a period of three years intervened. Whence do we know that they combine one with the other? The text tells us if anyone trespasses a trespass to include every trespass now, why should he be liable? Has not the intervening day of atonement atoned for it? Say the day of atonement affects atonement for the transgression of a prohibition, but not for the misappropriation of money, or you could say the day of atonement affects atonement for transgressions involving full standard measure, but not for half measures, resh -lakish. Also said Rabbi as here taught that the awareness of the doubt separates the acts for sin offerings but our Yohanan said the awareness of the doubt does not separate the acts for sin offerings and what he Rabbi meant to teach is this just as he would be liable to separate sin offerings if he became aware in between the acts of the transgression of a definite sin so he is also liable to separate suspensive guilt offerings if he became each time aware of the doubtful sin now according to our Yohanan it is right that the guilt offering is dependent upon the sin offering but according to Rosh the sin offering should be made dependent upon the guilt offering this is indeed a difficulty now one can point out a contradiction between the statements of our Yohanan and also a contradiction between the statements of Rosh Lakish where it was taught if there were two roads one unclean and the other clean and the person passed through one of them and did not enter the temple precincts and then through the other and entered the temple precincts he is liable if he passed through one and entered the temple precincts he is exempt if he then passed through the other and entered the temple precincts he is liable if he passed through one and entered the temple precincts and was sprinkled upon once and also a second time and immersed himself and then he passed through the other and entered the temple precincts he is liable Talmud, Moscow today our Simeon holds he is exempt. In the latter instance our Simeon Bijuda maintains in the name of our Simeon that he is exempt in all instances even in the former said Rabbi here we are dealing with the case of one who passed through one road and when passing through the other he forgot that he had passed through the first and they differ in this the first tana holds a partial knowledge is like a complete knowledge while our Simeon maintains a partial knowledge is not like a complete knowledge the master said if he passed through one and entered the temple precincts and was sprinkled upon once and also a second time and immersed himself and then he passed through the other and entered the temple precincts he is liable why should he be liable there had at no time been definite knowledge of uncleanness answered Rosh Lakish the statement follows our Ishmael's view that knowledge at the beginning is not essential our Yohanan answered it may conform to the view of the sages but here they made doubtful knowledge of uncleanness like definite knowledge now it is assumed that here they made and the same holds good in all the laws of the Torah there is thus a contradiction between the two expositions of our Yohanan and also a contradiction between the two expositions of Rosh Lakish it will be granted that there is no contradiction between the two expositions of our Yohanan for we may say that he meant only here they made doubtful knowledge like definite knowledge but not everywhere in the whole Torah did they do so the reason being that in the case of uncleanness it is written it being hidden from him that he is unclean indicating that even if there is some uncertainty in connection with his knowledge scripture still renders him liable but regarding the other laws of the Torah he is written if his sin be known to him that is to say only if he has definite knowledge is he liable but with Rosh Lakish there is a difficulty why does he establish the Beritha in accordance with our Ishmael's view? Let him establish it as being in accordance with Rabbi's view he wished to let us know that our Ishmael too does not require knowledge at the beginning but is this not already the contents of a mission as we have learned our Ishmael said scripture mentions twice and it be hidden to teach us that one is liable both for forgetfulness of the uncleanness and for forgetfulness of the temple it is necessary for I might have thought that although your Ishmael does not derive the rule from the text he Yet accepts it as a tradition, therefore he Rashlakish informs us that this is not the case. Mishnah both Halab and Natar lay before a person and he ate one of them, but does not know which or if his menstruant wife and his sister were with him in his house, and he united in error with one
White grapes and he picked black ones or black and he picked white ones. Our Elizer declares him liable and our Joshua declares him exempt. Said our Simeon, I wonder whether our Joshua indeed declared him exempt in such a case. But then why is it written wherein he had sinned to exclude unpurposed action? Gamar, it has been taught. Our Elizer argued in any event he has transgressed. If it was a hell of he is liable. If the Nahar, he is liable. If it was his men's true and wife with whom he united, he is liable. If his sister, he is liable. If it was Sabbath when he did the work, he is liable. If the day of atonement, he is liable. Replied to him, our Joshua, it says wherein he has sinned, it must be known to him wherein he sinned and for what purpose does Elizer employ the word wherein to exclude unpurposed action? Talmud, Moscow, thought be to what kind of unpurposed action does he refer if concerning hell or incestuous intercourse? Surely he is liable for Rabnam and said in the name of Samuel. Unpurposed eating of halab or unpurposed incestuous intercourse is subject to an offering because the offender has after all derived the benefit thereby it rather refers to unpurposed labor on Sabbath when he is exempt because the Torah has forbidden on the Sabbath only purpose of work according to Rabbah the case would arise when one intended e.g. to cut something detached from the ground and he cut something that was attached and according to Abay when one intended to lift up something detached from the ground and he cut something that was attached for it has been stated if one intended to lift up something detached from the ground and he cut something that was attached he is exempt because no cutting was at all intended if he intended to cut something detached from the ground and he cut something that was attached Abay says he is liable because the act of cutting was intended Rabbah says he is exempt for it was not his intention to cut what was forbidden to be cut remarked our Jose, they did not dispute, etc. It has been taught. Our Jose said to them, You are most particular with me. What did they say to him that he remarked, You are most particular with me? Thus they said to him, What if one e.g. lifted up an article at twilight? Thereupon he said, You are most particular with me. But why did he not retort? Part of the lifting up might have been done on the one day and the rest on the following day. This is indeed what he meant by saying, You are most particular with me, but you could not get the best of me. But would our Jose hold that for the conclusion of an act one is according to our Eliza exempt? Surely we know that he declares him liable, for we have learned our Eliza says, If a person wove three threads at the start of the web or added one thread onto a woven piece, he is liable, said Rab Joseph. Our Jose in his exposition of our Eliza's view reads admission as follows Our Eliza says, If a person wove three threads at the start or added two threads to a woven piece. He is liable, said Arjuna, our Joshua exempts him even from a suspensive guilt offering. It has been taught, said Arjuna, our Joshua exempts him even from a suspensive guilt offering because it says if anyone sin, though he know it not excluded, is this case where he knew that the sin said to him, our Simeon, it is just such a case when a suspensive guilt offering should be brought for it reads and do though he know it not, and in this instance he in fact did not know wherein he did the wrong as. To the case of one being in doubt whether he did eat halab or not, go forth and inquire whether he is then liable to a suspensive guilt offering or not. What was the decision come and here it has been stated if one committed a sin and does not know wherein or if he is in doubt whether he did sin or not, he is liable to a suspensive guilt offering. Now who is it that maintains that if one committed a sin and does not know wherein he is liable to a suspensive guilt offering, obviously our Simeon. And yet it is stated if he is in doubt whether he did sin or not he is liable to a suspensive guilt offering this proves that our Simeon holds that if one is in doubt whether he did sin or not he is liable to a suspensive guilt offering our Simeon Chizuri and our Simeon said they did not dispute but then why is it written wherein he has sinned to exclude unpurposed action said Rab in the name of Samuel unpurposed eating of halab or unpurposed incestuous intercourse is subject to an offering because the offender has after all derived the benefit thereby unpurposed labor on the Sabbath is exempt because the Torah has forbidden only purpose of work said Rabbi to Rab and surely the case concerning the circumcision of boys is comparable to unpurposed action and yet we have learned regarding it if there were two boys one who was due to be circumcised on the Sabbath and another who was due to be circumcised after the Sabbath and a person in error circumcised on the Sabbath it one who was due to be circumcised after the Sabbath, our Eliza declares him liable to a sin offering. Our Joshua holds he is exempt now. Our Joshua declares him exempt only because he maintains that for a transgression committed an error in the course of the intended performance of a commandment, even though the commandment was not in fact performed, one is exempt. If, however, one performed an unpurposed act which was not in the course of the performance of a commandment, he would be liable even. According to our Joshua, he replied to him, Leave the case concerning the circumcision of boys alone, since it is exceptional in that one is liable, although the wound is an act of damage, so too for unpurposed wounding one is also liable. Rab Judah raised an objection to Samuel. We have learned, said our Judah, even if he intended to pick fix and he picked grapes or grapes and he picked fix white grapes and he picked black ones or black and he picked white ones, our Eliza declares him liable and are. Joshua declares him exempt now is not this a case of unpurposed action and yet it seems that our Joshua declared him exempt solely because different kinds of fruit are involved but if one kind only was involved even our Joshua would declare him liable he replied thou keen thinker leave this mission and follow me for here it refers to a gatherer whose intention escaped his mind he set out to gather grapes and forgot about it and thinking that he wanted to fix his hand unwittingly reached for the grapes our Eliza argues his purpose was after all achieved our Joshua argues his purpose and design were not realized Talmud Moscow that they are Ashai raised an objection we have learned our Simeon Chizuri and our Simeon said they did not dispute regarding transgressions of the same denomination when IT is agreed that he is liable about what did they dispute about transgressions of different denominations our Eliza declares him liable to a sin offering and our Joshua declares him exempt and what did Arjuna in the mission say that their dispute was in the case of a person who intended to pick grapes and he picked fix or black grapes and he gathered white ones now are not fix and grapes or black grapes and white grapes of two different denominations is this not then identical with the views of Arsimian and Arsimian Chizuri what then does Arjuna come to teach us hence you must say that they differ concerning unpurposed action Arjuna holding that one is liable for unpurposed action whereas Arsimian and Arsimian Chizuri hold that one is exempt for unpurposed action no all agree that for unpurposed action one is exempt they differ rather in this point Arsimian Chizuri holds that if the purpose escaped the gatherer's mind and he erred in respect of the same denomination all agree that he is liable and that their dispute is in the case where the error related to two different denominations whilst Arjuna maintains that they differ both in the instance of one denomination and in that of two denominations, Rabbah said they differ in the matter of sequence as it has been taught if there were before a person on the Sabbath two burning or extinguished candles and he intended to extinguish the one but extinguish the other or to kindle the one but kindle the other he is exempt if he intended first to kindle the one and then to extinguish the other and he first extinguished and then kindled if with one breath he is liable if with two breaths he is exempt but is this not obvious I might have thought that since his design was not realized seeing that he wanted first to kindle and then to extinguish but in his act we might regard it as if the extinguishing was done first and then the kindling he should accordingly be exempt therefore we are told that this is not so for although the kindling did not precede the extinguishing neither did it follow our rabbis taught if one removed coals from a burning pile on the Sabbath he is Liable to a sin offering, our Simeon B. Eliezer says in the name of our Eliezer son of Arzadak, he is liable to two offerings because he extinguished the upper coals and kindled the lower ones. How is this case to be understood if he intended to extinguish as well as to kindle what is the reason of the one who exempts him from the second offering? And if he did not intend to kindle what is the reason of the one who holds him liable to two, our Eliezer and our Hannah both explain the case as follows. He intended to extinguish the upper coals, knowing that this would set the lower ones ablaze. The first Hannah holds that one is exempt for any kindling which is to his disadvantage, while our Eliezer son of Arzadak holds him liable. Our Yohanan also said it speaks of a blacksmith, said our Yohanan until now the reason for this law has not been found. M.I.B. Avin and our Hannah B. Avin both explain the case as follows. Talmud, Moskirath B. He intended to extinguish as well as to kindle the first Hannah. Follows our Jose's view
is liable for secondary blood. Gemara, our rabbis taught from the text, Yeshel eat no manner of blood. I might infer that even the blood of those that walk on two legs and the blood found in eggs and the blood of locusts and of fish were included. Therefore, the text teaches whether it be of fowl or of beast, as fowl and beast are characterized in that they are subject both to light and weighty uncleanness and are at times forbidden and permitted and are of the category of flesh, so all are included that are subject to light and weighty uncleanness. I must therefore exclude the blood of those that walk on two legs, for they are subject to weighty uncleanness and not to light uncleanness. Talmud, Moskirathay, I must also exclude the blood of reptiles, for they are not subject to weighty uncleanness. I must further exclude the blood found in eggs, for they are not of the category of flesh and the blood of fish and of locusts, for they are always permitted whether it be of fowl or of Beast if fowl alone was mentioned I might have said as this is not subject to killing so should be included only those animals that are not subject to killing therefore beast is added if beast alone was mentioned I might have said as this is not subject to the law concerning the mother and its young so should be included only those fowl that are not subject to the law concerning the mother and its young therefore both fowl and beast had to be stated but why not argue thus any matter of blood is a generalization whether it be fowl or beast is a specification and whenever a generalization is followed by a specification it is meant to comprise only the instances of the specification consequently fowl and beast are included but no other things whosoever eat any blood represents a second generalization and whenever a generalization is followed by a specification and then again by a generalization all things similar to the specification are to be included but is not the last Generalization different from the first in that the first contains a mere prohibition whilst the last comprises the penalty of correct this tana agrees with the school of Arishmael who apply the rules relating to generalizations and specifications even though the last generalization is unlike the first the master said here we have a generalization followed by a specification and then again by a generalization in which case all things similar to the specification are to be included just as the instances of the specification are characterized in that they are subject both to light and to weighty uncleanness and are at times forbidden and at times permitted and are of the category of flesh so all are included which are subject to light and to weighty uncleanness etc. What does the term all serve to include said Rabbi Avin it includes the blood of the koi what is his opinion with regard to the koi if he holds that the koi is a doubtful creature do we need a special text to Forbid the blood of an animal about which there is doubt. He holds that the koi is a class of animal of its own. We have now learned about its blood. Once do we know that its halav is forbidden from the text? All halav once that its nibbla is forbidden from the text. All nibbla once that its gid hanasha is forbidden. The divine law defines it as a sinew upon the hollow of the thigh, and this too has a hollow of the thigh. Once do we know that its nibbla causes uncleanness and that it requires slaughtering? This stands to reason since the divine law has placed it on the same footing as cattle in respect of all other laws. It is also like cattle in regard to uncleanness and slaughtering. The master said, I must therefore exclude the blood of those that walk on two legs, for they are subject to weighty uncleanness and not to light uncleanness. A contradiction was pointed out. We have learned the flesh which one cut from off a man requires both intention. And preparation upon this the question was raised wherefore does it require intention let the cutting express his intention and Reshlakish replied he cut it for the use of a dog and such a purpose is not a proper intention is this indeed so surely we have learned they laid down this general rule concerning uncleanness everything that serves as food for man and became unclean remains unclean until it becomes unfit to be food for dogs this ruling relates to the annulment of existing uncleanness the argument being since it was at one time fit for man its uncleanness does not depart unless it has become unfit for a dog that other instance however relates to the state in which it can receive uncleanness we therefore say if it is fit for man it is fit for a dog if it is unfit for a man it is unfit for a dog it states at all events that with flesh of man intention is required though intention is essential only for light uncleanness this is so while the man is alive but after death there is indeed weighty uncleanness only but then the corresponding dictum relating to cattle must accordingly also refer to the time after death now if the flesh is meant it surely conveys weighty uncleanness if the blood it too conveys weighty uncleanness as we have learned the blood of a dead animal is clean according to Beth Shammai Beth Hillel say it is unclean it speaks of an instance similar to that which we have learned in a mission of the carcass of an unclean beast anywhere and the carcass of a clean bird in the villages require intention and not preparation Rab remarked thereupon to our high wherefore is an intention required to qualify it for light uncleanness is it not already unclean the latter replied it is a case where there was less than an olive's bulk of nibble joined to another edible which was less than an egg's bulk but together they made up an egg's bulk but then preparation should also be required for the school of Arishmael have taught the text if out of their carcass fall upon any sowing seed which is to be sown implies a seed is characterized in that it will at no time convey weighty uncleanness and requires preparation so everything that will at no time convey weighty uncleanness requires preparation he replied this holds good in cases where the edibles have not joined to them less than an olive's bulk of nibble in our instance however the food has joined to it less than an olive's bulk of nibble and since it would require no preparation if it the nibble was made up to a full olive's bulk so it requires no preparation even now Talmud Mosque here thought be an exception however is the flesh of a dead man for even though it is joined to a food stuff to make up the requisite eggs bulk it does not convey food uncleanness for his view is set aside by general opinion our Hanania said you may also say that there was a whole olive's bulk of nibble but in this case it was entirely covered with dough if so it should also Require preparation this holds good only with regard to other foodstuffs which transmit uncleanness neither by contact not by carrying in this instance however granted that it does not transmit uncleanness by contact because it is covered with dough it may nevertheless transmit uncleanness by carrying for it is after all carried an exception however is the flesh of a dead man for even though it is covered with dough it will convey weighty uncleanness for its uncleanness breaks through and rises and breaks through and descends the master said I must exclude the blood of fish and of locusts for they are always permitted what is the meaning of always permitted if that their halab is permitted behold also the halab of a beast of chase is permitted and yet its blood is forbidden if that the prohibition of the gidhanasha is not applicable to them behold also the fowl is not subject to the law of gidhanasha and yet its blood is forbidden always permitted means rather that they do not require slaughtering the master said if fowl alone was mentioned I might have said as this is not subject to kilim so should be included only those animals that are not subject to kilim therefore the text teaches beast which kind of kilim is meant if that relating to breeding diverse kinds or to plowing with diverse kinds have we not learned beasts and fowl are subject to similar laws said abay it refers to its fluff which is not subject to the law of kilim said rab judah in the name of rab for an olive's bulk of the blood of reptiles one incurs the penalty of stripes an objection was raised it has been taught the blood of the spleen or of the heart or of the kidneys or of any other limb is subject to a prohibition the blood of those that walk on two legs or that of reptiles and creeping creatures is forbidden but one is not liable for it what does but one is not liable for it mean this cannot mean that one is not liable for it to Karath, but only to a prohibition for in the first place this would be identical with the ruling of the first clause and secondly the tana expressly excludes it even from a prohibition as we have learned I must exclude the blood of reptiles for they are not subject to weighty uncleanness replied Arzara if the warning related to reptiles he incurs stripes if to blood he is exempt said Rab the blood of fish collected in a vessel is forbidden an objection was raised it has been taught the blood of fish and locusts may deliberately be eaten this is when it is not collected whilst Rab speaks of collected blood and the clause relating to those that walk on two legs would likewise refer to uncollected blood but is such blood at all forbidden has it not been taught the blood found on a loaf of bread must be scraped away and the loaf may be eaten that between the teeth may be sucked and swallowed without hesitation in the instance of that bury the blood contained fish scales Rab on the other and who rules that it is forbidden refers to a case where there were no fish scales said Rab she's hate in the case of human blood one is not even enjoined to refrain from it an objection was raised it was taught the blood of the spleen or of the heart or of the kidneys or of any other limb is subject to a prohibition the blood of those that walk on two legs or that of reptiles and creeping things is forbidden but one is not liable for it the ruling of the barrier that it is forbidden refers
blood in relation to which the law is constant therefore the text teaches this is unclean unto you this is unclean human blood however is not unclean but clean upon this remark rab she's hate one is not even enjoined to refrain from it we have learned elsewhere the heart must be torn and its blood removed if he had not torn it he has nevertheless not transgressed said arzara in the name of rab this holds good only with regard to the heart of a fowl which is not as big as an olive's bulk in all the heart of a beast, however, which comprises an olive's bulk is forbidden, and whoso eats it incurs the penalty of Karath. An objection was raised. It has been taught the blood of the spleen or of the heart or of the kidneys or of any other limb is subject to a prohibition. The blood of those that walk on two legs or that of reptiles and creeping things is forbidden, but one is not liable for it. That which is there taught refers to the blood within Rab, however, refers to blood that came from elsewhere, but is not the blood within identical with the blood of a limb, and even according to you is not the blood of the kidneys mentioned. In addition to the blood of a limb, you must thus admit that the one is stated and then the other, then say here too that the one is stated and then the other. It says from elsewhere, from where said Arzara, it absorbs it with the last breath of the blood of the arteries whereby life escapes. He is liable. It has been stated what is the definition of it. Blood of arteries upon which life depends are Yohanan says that which gushes forth Reshlakish says from the black drop onward an objection was raised which is the blood of arteries whereby life escapes that which gushes forth to the exclusion of secondary blood because it flows gently may we not assume that the first as well as the last blood that flow gently are regarded as secondary blood and this is then in contradiction to Reshlakish no only the blackened blood is excluded but the first and the last blood though flowing gently are regarded as life blood an objection was raised which is regarded as life blood that which gushes forth to the exclusion of the first and last blood which flow gently this is in contradiction to Reshlakish he might retort Tanaim differ on this point as has been taught which is regarded as life blood that which gushes forth this is the view of our Eliza our Simeon holds from the black drop onward the school of our Ishmael taught the text and drink it. Blood of the slain excludes the gushing blood from rendering plants susceptible to uncleanness. Our Jeremiah put the following query before our zero. What is the law if one drew blood from an animal and received it in two vessels for the blood which is in the first vessel according to all views one is liable but what of that in the second is one liable for it or not? He replied therein differ our Yohanan and Reshlakish as has been stated if one drew blood from an animal and received it in two vessels. Reshlakish says he is liable to two sin offerings. Our Yohanan says he is liable to one sin offering only. Our Judah holds he is liable for secondary blood set. Our Eliezer our Judah admits however with reference to atonement for it is written for it is the blood that make the atonement by reason of the life. The blood whereby life escapes causes atonement. The blood whereby life does not escape does not cause atonement said Rabnam and B. Isaac we have also learned in confirmation thereof for it has been taught it would have sufficed had the text stated blood why does it say any matter of blood because scripture reads for it is the blood that make the atonement by reason of the life from this we only learn that the blood of consecrated animals whereby life escapes and which makes atonement is forbidden whence do we know that blood of unconsecrated animals and secondary blood are forbidden because it reads any matter of blood and it is established that an anonymous tradition in the cipher represents the view of our judah mission for doubtful misappropriation of sacred property our akiba declares one liable to a suspensive guilt offering while the sages declare him exempt our akiba however admits that he need not make restitution until he becomes aware of his trespass when he must bring with it an unconditional guilt offering said our wherefore should he bring two guilt offerings let him rather restore the capital together with the fifth offer a guilt offering of the value of two sellers and stipulate if I did commit sacrilege here is my restitution and this my guilt offering and if the sacrilege was doubtful let the money be a free will gift and the offering a suspense of guilt offering since that which is offered for a known trespass is of the same kind as that offered for a doubtful one said our Akiva his words seem plausible in the case of a minor misappropriation but if his doubt related to the misappropriation of a hundred minas would it not be more advantageous for him to bring a guilt offering for two sellers rather than restore out of doubt the sum of a hundred minas our Akiva indeed agrees with our Tarfan in the case of a minor misappropriation Talmud Moscow it has been taught the expression and if anyone intimates that one is liable to a suspense of guilt offering in the case of doubtful sacrilege thus the view of our Akiva the sages declare him exempt may we assume that they differ in the following point our Akiva holds we May derive the law above from the law below while the other rabbis hold we may not derive the law above from the law below said our papa all agree that we may derive the law above from the law below otherwise we should not find a basis for the law that a bullet has to be slaughtered on the north side of the altar but the reason why the rabbis here declare him exemplifies in the textual analogy to a sin offering based on the common term mitzvah as the text there speaks of an offense for which one is liable to karath in the case of willful transgression to a sin offering in the case of erroneous transgression and to a suspense of guilt offering in the case of doubt so for all other offenses for which one is liable to karath in the case of willful transgression and to a sin offering in the case of erroneous transgression one is liable to a suspense of guilt offering in the case of doubt this excludes sacrilege since for the willful transgression thereof one is not liable to karath as has been taught if one committed sacrilege willfully rabbi says he is liable to the death penalty the sages say he has merely transgressed the prohibition and our akiba he maintains that the textual analogy regarding the sin offering for hell based upon the common term mitzvah is to be applied only for the following purpose as the text relates to a fixed sacrifice so must all be fixed sacrifices thus excluding sacrifices of higher or lesser value and the rabbis they hold exerish a cannot be applied partially are we then to conclude that our akiba holds that one may apply exerish a partially say rather all agree that exerish a cannot be applied partially but this is the reason of our akiba the text says and if anyone and implies an addition to the foregoing so we therefore derive the law above from the law below and the rabbis they hold that the inference is in the reverse direction and we must derive the law below from the law above regarding silver Shekels for guilt offerings and our Akiva he holds a Hekish cannot be applied partially. Are we then to conclude that the rabbis hold that a Hekish can be applied partially? Is it not definitely established that a Hekish cannot be applied partially? All agree that a Hekish cannot be applied partially, but here the rabbis maintain that the textual analogy founded upon the common term mitzvah supersedes the Hekish and our Akiva the law regarding silver shekels for guilt offerings he derives from. This is the law of the guilt offering. There is one law for all guilt offerings which includes the silver shekels and the rabbis. Although it is written this is the law of the guilt offering, there is still need for the phrase and if anyone the end implying an addition to the foregoing and thereby deriving the law below from the law above for as to the passage this is the law of the guilt offering from which is derived that one law rules all guilt offerings it might be said to apply to. Unconditional guilt offerings only and not to suspensive guilt offerings for since the suspensive guilt offering is brought e.g. for the eating of doubtful hella I might have argued that doubtful transgression should not be more stringent than certain transgression and as in the case of certain transgression a sin offering of the value of a dunk suffices so also in the case of doubtful transgression a guilt offering of the value of a dunk should suffice it is for this reason that the divine law wrote and if anyone the end implying in addition to the foregoing the above conclusion of our Akiva is valid according to him who holds that an inference may be made from the text this is the law of the guilt offering but according to him who holds that one cannot make any inference from this is the law of the guilt offering what can be said the law will then be derived from that relating to the guilt offering of sacrilege by a textual analogy based upon the common term Birkika. Whilst regarding the guilt offering of the designated bond made in connection with which Birkika is not mentioned, the law will be derived by an analogy based upon the common term Ayal or Akiva, however, admits, etc. What is the meaning of and if the sacrilege was doubtful, said Robert Reed, and if the doubt remains forever, it shall be a suspensive guilt offering, since that which is offered for a known trespass is of the same kind as that offered for a doubtful one, but has he not after all to bring an unconditional guilt offering when he becomes aware of the transgression, said Robert. From this ruling of both, we learn that knowledge at the outset is not essential with regard to an unconditional guilt offering mission. If a woman brought a sin offering of a bird by reason of a doubt and prior to the pinching of its neck
Offering sent are Jose two persons cannot bring one sin offering if there was a piece of halab and a piece of consecrated permitted fat and a person ate one of them and does not know which he is liable to a suspensive guilt offering if he then ate the second piece he is liable to a sin offering and an unconditional guilt offering if he ate the one piece and another came and ate the other each of them brings a suspensive guilt offering our Simeon holds they together bring a sin offering and a guilt offering sent are Jose two persons cannot together bring one sin offering and one guilt offering if there was a piece of unconsecrated halab and a piece of consecrated halab and a person ate one of them and does not know which he is liable to a sin offering our Akibah sent also to a suspensive guilt offering if he then ate the second piece he is liable to two sin offerings and one unconditional guilt offering if he ate the one piece and another came and ate the other each of them is liable to a sin offering our Akiba says each of them brings an addition a suspensive guilt offering our Simeon holds each of them brings a sin offering and together they bring one guilt offering said our Jose two persons cannot bring one guilt offering if there was a piece of halab and a piece of halab which was at the same time that our and a person ate one of them and does not know which he is liable to a sin offering and to a suspensive guilt offering if he then ate the second piece he is liable to three sin offerings if he ate the one piece and another came and ate the other each of them brings a sin offering and a suspensive guilt offering our Simeon holds each of them brings a sin offering and together they bring a sin offering said our Jose no sin offering that is brought for the expiation of sin can be offered by two persons Kamara said Rabba to our and according to our Jose it is only a sin offering that cannot be brought by two persons but a suspensive guilt offering can be brought by two Persons is this then not identical with the view of the first tana and should you say they differ as to whether one out of two pieces is required I would reply has it not been taught our Jose holds that each of them brings a suspensive guilt offering he replied what he wishes to let us know is that the first tana is our Jose if a piece of halab and a piece of consecrated permitted fat a piece of unconsecrated halab and a piece of consecrated halab a piece of halab and a piece of halab which was at the same time that har etc said Rabbi to Rabnam and let him also bring an unconditional guilt offering for the nathar is at the same time consecrated food he replied it is a case where the food was not worth a parata but do not the preceding instances relate to food worth a parata for it is stated he must bring an unconditional guilt offering he replied in that instance since it was not nathar it was worth a parata but one of the Mishnah one made by one act of eating which Speaks of Nathar as one of the trespasses involved, nevertheless, it states that he is liable to four sin offerings and one guilt offering. That mission refers to a large meal, ours to a scanty meal. Alternatively, that mission relates to the winter season and ours to the summer season. If one person ate one piece, etc., said Rabbi to Rabnam, and does our Simeon indeed hold that a prohibition can take effect on an existing prohibition? Has it not been taught? Our Simeon says he who eats Nebula on the Day of Atonement is exempt, said Arshis, hates son of Edi. Our mission refers to one who ate the kidney with the hell of attached thereto, but even in the case of the kidney with the hell of attached thereto, is it not subject to prohibition relating to things offered upon the altar? How then can the prohibition regarding Nathar take effect on it? And should you argue that our Simeon maintains that the prohibition relating to Nathar is a stringent one and therefore takes effect on the existing lighter? Prohibition regarding things offered upon the altar I might retort behold the prohibition of Nibla is light and that of the day of atonement is stringent and yet the latter does not take effect on the former one must say that in connection with consecrated things the divine law has revealed that one prohibition can take effect on an existing prohibition Talmud, Moskirath B.S. has been taught the expression which pertain unto the Lord includes the sacrificial portions destined for the altar now these portions are subject to the prohibition relating to things offered upon the altar moreover the hell of thereof is subject to a prohibition involving Karath and yet the prohibition regarding uncleanness takes effect on them a further proof that this is so behold Rabbi is of the opinion that one prohibition can take effect on another provided it is a stringent prohibition being applied to an existing light one and not a light one to a stringent one yet in the matter of Consecrated things he maintains that even a light prohibition can take effect on a stringent one for the prohibition of sacrilege is light being subject to death whereas the prohibition relating to the eating of consecrated things is stringent involving karath yet the prohibition involving death takes effect on the prohibition involving karath as has been taught rabbi says the text all fat is the lord's includes the sacrificial portions of offerings of a lower degree of holiness destined for the altar as being subject to the law of sacrilege now sacrilege is a prohibition involving death and yet it takes effect on the prohibition of halab which involves karath this proves that scripture revealed a special case with regard to consecrated things but has it not been taught elsewhere our Simeon says neither the law of pickle nor that of nathar applies to things that are offered upon the altar there are two contradictory tanatic traditions in the name of our Simeon. some there are who hold that in relation to consecrated things a prohibition can take effect on an existing prohibition but others hold that even in relation to consecrated things a prohibition cannot take effect on an existing prohibition and for what purpose will they who hold that also in relation to consecrated things one prohibition cannot take effect on another employ the text all fat is the lords they will employ it for the young of consecrated animals for they hold that the young of consecrated animals are sacred only from birth so that both prohibitions come into force simultaneously chapter -E if a person brought a suspensive guilt offering and learned afterwards that he did not sin if it was before the animal was slaughtered it may go out to pasture among the flock thus the view of our mayor the sages say it shall be left to pasture until it becomes blemished and then sold and its price goes to the temple fund for free will offerings our Eliezer says it shall be offered up for if it does not expiate the sin it will expiate another sin if he learns of it after it was slaughtered the blood shall be poured out and the flesh is removed to the place of burning if the blood had already been tossed the flesh may be eaten our Jose says even if the blood is still in the vessel it should be tossed and the flesh then eaten the law however is different with an unconditional guilt offering if before the animal was slaughtered it may go out to pasture among the flock if after it was slaughtered it shall be buried if after the sprinkling of the blood the flesh must be removed to the place of burning the law is also different regarding an ox to be stoned if before it was stoned it may go out to pasture among the flock if after it was stoned it is permitted for use the law is also different regarding the heifer whose neck is to be broken if before its neck was broken it may go out to pasture among the flock if after its neck was broken it shall be buried on it Spot for it was from the outset brought in a matter of doubt it has atoned for the doubt and so has served its purpose tomorrow wherein do they differ our many reasons as he no longer requires the offering he does not dedicate it to other rabbis hold because of his troubled conscience he resolved to dedicate it to Tana taught whether he learned that he did sin or learned that he did not sin our Meir and the rabbis differ in the case where he learned that he did sin the dispute is taught to present the force of our Meir's view although he is now aware of his sin since he did not know this when the sacrifice was set aside it may therefore go out to pasture among the flock and in the case where he learned that he did not sin the dispute is taught to present the force of the view of the rabbis although he is now aware that he did not sin since he did not know this when the sacrifice was set aside his conscience troubled him and so resolved to dedicate it absolutely said Rabbi Shizhar. Meir concedes to the rabbis Talmud, Moskirath in the case of a person who dedicated two guilt offerings as a surety and was atoned for by one of them that the second shall be left to pasture until it becomes blemished and then sold and its price goes to the fund for free will offerings what is the reason our Meir disagrees with the rabbis only in the case where the offerer had given no proof that his conscience troubled him in this instance however behold only one sacrifice was required of him for what reason then did he separate two sacrifices obviously because he thought should one be lost I shall be atoned for by the other now since he has proved that his conscience troubled him we therefore assume that his dedication was absolute said Rab Judah in the name of Rab the rabbis concede to our Meir in the case of a suspensive guilt offering which was brought on the strength of the evidence of witnesses who were subsequently proved to be plotters that it shall go out to pasture. Among the flock what is the reason the rabbis disagree with our Meir only in the case where the offerer brought the sacrifice of his own accord when we may assume that his conscience troubled him but when he brought it on the strength of the evidence of two witnesses he did not entirely rely on the witn
Subsequently proved to be plotters, R. Eliezer says it is treated like the meal offering of jealousy, of which it was taught that if the witnesses against the woman were proved to be plotters, it the meal offering reverts to its profane character. But R. Yohanan holds it shall be left to pasture until it becomes blemished and then sold, and its price goes to the fund for free will offerings. And why does not R. Yohanan compare it to the meal offering of jealousy? They are not comparable one to another. The meal offering of jealousy is not offered for atonement, but to ascertain her guilt, the suspense of guilt offering, however, is offered for atonement. And since we assume that his conscience troubled him, he resolved to dedicate it absolutely. R. Kiruspade said in the name of R. Yohanan, if an ox was condemned to be stoned and the witnesses were proved to be plotters, whosoever takes possession of it is its legal owner. Said Rabbi R. Yohanan's view is plausible in the case where the witnesses. Testified that his beast was abused, but if they asserted that he himself abused his beast, since he is certain that he did not abuse it, he certainly does not renounce his ownership of it, but will take pains to find witnesses to disprove the charge. But in what respect does this case differ from that which Rabbi is taught in the name of Reshlakish in the case of a beguiled city whose witnesses were proved to be plotters, whosoever takes hold of the property thereof is its legal owner in the beguiled city. There are a multitude of people, and each of them thinks, even though I did not sin, others might have sinned, and he therefore renounces the ownership of his property. In our instance, however, the matter rests with him alone, as he knows that he did not abuse the animal, he does not renounce his ownership of it, but rather endeavors to find witnesses to disprove the charge. Reshlakish said, if a person offers a gift to his fellow, and the latter says, I do not want it, whosoever takes. Hold of it becomes its legal owner, but in what respect does this differ from that which Rabbi Biyeva said in the name of Rabshi's hate, or as some report are about in the name of Rabshi's hate, if the recipient of a gift declared after it had come into his possession, let this gift be annulled, or it is to be annulled, or I do not want it, his words have effect. If he said it is annulled, or it is no gift, his words are of no effect. Talmud, Moskira Thafi does not the ruling his words have effect imply that it returns to the original owner, no, his words have effect implies that he too has not acquired it, but whoever takes hold of it becomes its legal owner. An objection was raised if a person says to his partner, I have neither right nor claim on this field, or I have no concern in it, or I entirely dissociate myself from it, his words are of no effect. Now the expression I entirely dissociate myself from it corresponds to I do not want it, and yet we learn here that his words are of no effect. This Case is different for what he meant was that he dissociates himself from all rights and claims but not from the real ownership of the field. An objection was raised if a dying man assigned his possessions in writing to another and there were among them slaves and the other said I do not want them if the second master was a priest they may eat of Teramah. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel says as soon as that other said I do not want them ears at once become their legal owners now according to our Simeon. B. Gamaliel it is well for he argues when a man bestows a gift it is with the understanding that it be accepted and if it is not accepted it automatically returns to its original owner but what of the first tenet if it is right to say that whenever a beneficiary says I do not want it whoever takes hold of the property becomes its legal owner here since the second master said I do not want them the slaves should be strangers and how can strangers eat Teramah he holds if a man renounces it. Ownership of his slave the latter is free but still requires a bill of emancipation from his master and he also maintains that one who awaits a bill of emancipation may still eat of Teramah. Our Eliezer says it shall be offered up etc. Why does our Eliezer state that IT will expiate another sin does not our Eliezer hold that a suspensive guilt offering may be brought at any time as a free will offering as we have learned our Eliezer says a man may freely offer a suspensive guilt offering every day. Replied Rab Ashi our Eliezer takes here into consideration what they the sages said to him as we have learned but they said unto me wait until you fall into a state of doubt if he learns of it after it was slaughtered etc. It is stated here the flesh is removed to the place of burning from which it follows that non-consecrated animals that were slaughtered in the temple court are to be burnt whilst we read later in contradiction thereto the law however is different with an unconditional. Guilt offering it before the animal was slaughtered, it may go out to pasture among the flock. If after it was slaughtered, it shall be buried. Replied R. Eliezer, the contradiction is obvious. He who taught the one clause cannot have taught the other. Rabbi said, Do you point out a contradiction between the unconditional guilt offering and the suspensive guilt offering? As to the unconditional guilt offering, since it is no longer required, we may assume that its owner has not dedicated it. But as to the suspensive guilt offering, since his conscience troubled him, we may assume that he has dedicated it. Absolutely, there is, however, a contradiction between two statements relating to the unconditional guilt offering itself. For here we learn it shall be buried, whilst the concluding clause reads, The flesh is removed to the place of burning. This is doubtlessly a contradiction. He who taught the one clause cannot have taught the other. Rabbi Ashi said, Because it has the appearance of it is qualified. Offering if the blood had already been tossed the flesh may be eaten why has he not in the meantime reached a state of certainty replied Rabbi the text says though he knew it not and he shall be forgiven and this man was in doubt during the ceremony of forgiving our Jose says even if the blood is still in the vessel etc how can our Jose maintain that the blood should be tossed has he not arrived at a condition of certainty at the time of the ceremony of forgiving replied Rabbi our Jose follows our Simeon who holds whatever is ready to be tossed is to be regarded as if it had already been tossed but perhaps our Simeon maintains his view only with regard to things that are indeed ready to be tossed whilst this is not ready to be tossed in the west they replied our Jose holds that the vessels of ministry render fit for offering that which is disqualified from the outset the law however is different with an unconditional guilt offering etc it was stated when does the heifer whose neck is to be Broken become forbidden for use our Hamnana says in its lifetime Rabbah says after the breaking of the neck now Rabbah's opinion is clear for it is from the time that an act was done to it but from what specific time according to our Hamnana Talmud, Moskirathah said our I had heard a time limit regarding it but it has escaped my memory his colleagues however suggested its conveyance to the rough valley renders it unfit for use said our Hamnana once do I derive this my opinion from that which we have learned if a person slaughtered the heifer of purification or an ox condemned to be stoned or the heifer whose neck is to be broken our Simeon declares him exempt the sages declare him guilty now according to me who hold it is forbidden in its lifetime the meaning is clear for the dispute between our Simeon and the sages lies in this our Simeon holds that ineffective slaughtering is no slaughtering while the sages hold that ineffective slaughtering is regarded as slaughtering but According to you who hold it is forbidden after the breaking of the neck why does our Simeon exempt him the slaughtering is indeed effective should you say however that our Simeon considers slaughtering valid in the case of the heifer whose neck is to be broken surely we have learned that which is valid with the red heifer is invalid with the heifer whose neck is to be broken and that which is invalid with the red heifer is valid with the heifer whose neck is to be broken with the red heifer slaughtering is valid and the breaking of the neck invalid and with the heifer whose neck is to be broken the breaking of the neck is valid and slaughtering invalid thereupon he was silent after the former had left he said why did I not retort our Simeon is nevertheless of the opinion that slaughtering is valid with the heifer whose neck is to be broken our Hamnana on the other hand might then have objected the Tana should not have failed to mention the view that slaughtering is valid with the heifer whose neck is to be broken when you might have said it represents our Simeon's opinion Rabbah said once do I derive this my view from that which we have learned the law is also different regarding the heifer whose neck is to be broken if before its neck was broken it may go out to pasture among the flock now if it were forbidden in its lifetime how could it go out to pasture among the flock surely it was forbidden while still alive read it before it was ready for the breaking of the neck then read the following clause if after its neck was broken it shall be buried on the spot read if after it was ready for the breaking of the neck if so read the concluding clause for it was from the outset brought in a matter of doubt it has atoned for the doubt and so has served its purpose now if it were forbidden while still alive then it has not yet atoned for the doubt on this point there is a dispute between ten has been taught qualifying and atoning sacrifices are mentioned within the temple and qualifying and atoning sacrifices are mentioned without just as with the qualifying and atoning sacrifices mentioned within the temple the qualifying
liable to a sin offering of a bird for a doubt and the Day of Atonement had intervened is still bound to offer it after the Day of Atonement because it renders her fit to partake of sacrificial flesh if a sin offering of a bird was brought for a matter of doubt and after the pinching of its neck it became known that there was no need for it. IT must be buried tomorrow. What is the reason for our Eliezer's view where it obligatory? Why is he to bring a sin offering when the sin becomes known as? Proves that it is voluntary to other rabbis. On the other hand, say burnt offerings and peace offerings may be brought either in fulfillment of a vow or as free will sacrifices, but sin offerings and guilt offerings only as obligatory sacrifices. And the reason why one brings at all a suspensive sin offering, although the sin is uncertain, is to afford him protection because the Torah has compassion upon the lives of Israel. Said Rabbah, the son of Rabbah to Rabbah, may it not be that the suspensive guilt offering is analogous to burnt offerings and peace offerings, as burnt offerings and peace offerings are brought either by free will or by obligation. So may suspensive guilt offerings be brought either by free will or by obligation. He replied, burnt offerings and peace offerings are mentioned in Scripture mainly as free will sacrifices. Suspensive guilt offerings mainly as obligatory sacrifices are high recited before Rabbah Talmud. Moskirathoth be is subject to a suspensive guilt. Offering said the latter to him have we not learned the sages hold that one may not bring a suspensive guilt offering except for a particular sin the willful transgression of which is subject to Karath and the inadvertent transgression of which is subject to a sin offering and should you follow our Eliezer's view behold he maintains that it may be offered as a free will sacrifice replied the former why do you not study thoroughly many a time I put this question before the master namely Rabbi. And he replied this represents the view of our Eliezer as suggested by those who spoke to him as we have learned but they said unto me wait until you have come to a state of doubt said Rabbah what is the reason of those that spoke to him the text reads and do through error any one of all the things which the Lord his God hath commanded not to be done and is guilty Rabbah also said what is the reason of the rabbis who maintain that one may not bring a suspensive guilt offering except for a Particular sin the willful transgression of which is subject to Karath and the inadvertent transgression of which is subject to a sin offering they derive their ruling from a sin offering for Hela by the analogy based upon the common term mitzvah as in that instance it is brought for a sin that is subject to Karath in the case of willfulness and to a sin offering in the case of error so also in our instance it is brought for such sins as are subject to Karath in the case of willfulness. And to a sin offering in the case of error our rabbis taught the five guilt offerings affect complete atonement the suspensive guilt offering does not affect complete atonement how is this to be understood said Rab Joseph as follows the five guilt offerings affect complete atonement the suspensive guilt offering does not affect complete atonement thus dissenting from our Eliezer who holds that Nebula is subject to a suspensive guilt offering Robin has said it is to be understood thus in respect. Of the five guilt offerings, nothing else can take their place to effect atonement for when it is known to him, he must still bring it with reference to the suspensive guilt offering. However, something else can take its place to effect atonement for when it is known to him, he does not bring it as we have learned they that are liable to sin offerings or to unconditional guilt offerings and the day of atonement had intervened are still bound to offer them after the day of atonement. They that are liable to suspensive guilt offerings are exempt, they that are liable to sin offerings or to unconditional guilt offerings, etc. It is stated they that are liable to sin offerings or to unconditional guilt offerings and the day of atonement had intervened are still bound to offer them after the day of atonement. They that are liable to suspensive guilt offerings are exempt. Whence do we know this when Rabdimi arrived? He said in the name of RMI who reported it in the name of Arhan of the verse. Reads and he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions even all their sins sins are analogous to transgressions as transgressions are not subject to a sacrifice so also only those sins which are not subject to a sacrifice are atoned for by the day of atonement sins however which are subject to a sacrifice are not atoned for said Abbe to him but this verse refers to the goat that is offered up within which does not atone for the conscious transgression of Allah the scapegoat however which does atone for the conscious transgression of Allah I may say will atone also for sins that are subject to a sacrifice rather said Abbe it is derived from the following text and he shall confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions even all their sins sins are analogous to transgressions as transgressions are not subject to a sacrifice so also only those sins which are not subject to a sacrifice are atoned for by the day of atonement sins however which are subject to a sacrifice are not atoned for by its scripture has thus suggested a limitation in the text relating to the scapegoat to teach us that it does not atone for sins that are subject to a sacrifice said to him Rabdimi whence do you know that the transgressions referred to are those that are not subject to a sacrifice perhaps they are those that are subject to a sacrifice as we have learned four persons offer a sacrifice for willful as for inadvertent transgression in confirmation of his abbe's view it was stated when Rabin arrived he said in the name of our Jose who reported it in the name of Resh Lakish and he shall confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their sins sins are analogous to transgressions as transgressions are not subject to a sacrifice and are atoned for by the day of atonement so also only those sins which are not subject to a sacrifice are atoned for by its sins, however, which are subject to a sacrifice are not atoned for by it. Remarked Abai too derived it from this text, but Rabdimi objected. Once do we know that the transgressions referred to are those that are not subject to a sacrifice? Perhaps they are those that are subject to a sacrifice, as we have learned. Four persons offer a sacrifice for willful as for inadvertent transgression. Replied Rabin to him, the majority of transgressions are not subject to a sacrifice. Said the other to him, does the passage mention majority? Rather said Abai, the proof comes from the beginning of the same verse, and he shall confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. And it was taught iniquities to note willful transgressions, and so it is written, his iniquity shall be upon him. Now why did the verse add and all their transgressions, even all their sins, to establish an analogy to transgressions, as transgressions are not subject to a sacrifice? So also. Only those sins are implied which are not subject to a sacrifice sins however which are subject to a sacrifice are not atoned for by the day of atonement they that are liable to suspensive guilt offerings etc. Once do we learn this said our Eliezer the scriptural text reads from all your sins shall yet be clean before the Lord the day of atonement expiate sins that are known to the Lord alone said Rab Talafah the father of Rab who not in the name of Rab also the preceding instance need no longer Talmud, Moscow thought to be expounded in the manner of Rab Dimi and Abbe but it may be derived from this argument the day of atonement expiate sins that are known to the Lord alone from which it follows that the day of atonement expiates only sins known to the Lord alone but it does not expiate sins of which the transgressor himself is conscious furthermore said Rab Talafah father of Rab who not in the name of Rab they that are liable to stripes and the day of atonement had intervened are still liable thereto is this not obvious for wherein does it differ from the instance relating to sin offerings and unconditional guilt offerings I might have argued their money only is involved in this instance however since his person is involved I might say that it is not so he therefore teaches us that the law is the same but have we not learned known as well as unknown sins positive as well as negative commandments this is no contradiction in the one instance the transgressor was warned in the other he was not warned but if this is so Nimonic a woman after confinement a leper a Nazi right a woman suspected of infidelity to have her a woman after a doubtful confinement if the day of atonement had intervened should also not bring her offering for the day of atonement had affected atonement since the sin is one known to the Lord alone said our Hashai it reads even all their sins but not all their uncleanness but according to our Simeon son of Yohei who holds that a woman in confinement is a sinner what can be said the sacrifice that she brings is nevertheless for the purpose of permitting her to partake of consecrated food and is not expiatory remarked Rab Ashi we have also learned likewise a woman who is liable to a sin offering of a bird for a doubt and the day of atonement had intervened is still bound to offer it after the day of atonement because it renders her fit to partake of sacrificial flesh than a doubtful leper if the day of atonement had intervened should not bring this offering for the day of atonement had affected atonement since the sin is one known to the Lord alone said Rab
Intervene should not be offered said Abay the murderer is aware of the sin Rabbah said scripture reads and no expiation can be made for the land for the blood that is shed therein etc. Our Papa said scripture reads forgive thy people Israel etc. This atonement was applicable even to those who went out from Egypt now that you have established that a sin known to the Lord alone is atoned for by the day of atonement then I might say that when one becomes aware of the sin after the day of Atonement he should not need to bring a sin offering said RZEIRA you cannot say so for scripture states knowledge in connection with the sin offering of the individual and also with that of the prince and of the congregation but is it not necessary with each of these for if it was only mentioned in connection with the ordinary individual I should have said that the others could not be derived from the ordinary individual because of this objection it is so with the ordinary individual. Since his offering is invariably female then let it be stated in connection with the prince alone and I should derive the others from the case of the prince the case of the individual cannot be derived from that of the prince for it can be objected to it is so with the prince since he is not included in the law regarding the refusal of evidence but can you say so of the individual who is included in this law similarly the instance of the congregation cannot be derived from that of the prince. For I might object it is so with the prince since his offering may at times be female then let it be stated only in connection with the congregation and I should derive the case of the individual and of the prince from it I can object it is so with the congregation since they are liable only when ignorance of the law is followed by action in error from the mention of knowledge in any one case you cannot indeed derive the others but from its mention in two instances you might derive the third. Let knowledge be omitted in connection with the ordinary individual and let it be derived from knowledge mentioned in connection with the prince and the congregation I might object it is so with the prince and the congregation since they are not subject to the law regarding the refusal of evidence but can you say so of the individual who is subject to this law let then knowledge be omitted in connection with the congregation and let it be derived from knowledge mentioned with the individual. And the prince I might object it is so with the individual and the prince since their sacrifice may at times be female but can you say so of the congregation whose sacrifice can never be female let then knowledge be omitted in connection with the prince and let it be derived from knowledge mentioned in connection with the individual and the congregation for what argument can be raised in objection thereto if the fact that the sacrifice is offered only where ignorance of the law is followed by action in error the individual proves the opposite and if that the sacrifice is at all times a female the congregation prove the opposite for they never offer a female and are nevertheless liable only when aware of the sin wherefore then was knowledge mentioned in connection with the prince as it is not required for its own purpose since it may be derived from that of the individual and the congregation apply it to the case where the transgressor becomes aware of the sin after the day of Atonement to the effect that he must bring a sin offering of a set if knowledge were omitted in the text relating to the prince I should not have derived it from the cases of the individual and the congregation for I might object it is so with the individual and the congregation since they cannot change their status can you say so Talmud, Mos Kerithoth be of the prince whose status is liable to change Abbe therefore said the law is rather inferred from the following since the common term. Mitzwith has established between them a textual analogy thus rendering them analogous one to the other why then was knowledge mentioned thrice i.e. in connection with the commoner the prince and the congregation as it is not required for their own cases for they can be inferred from each other by reason of the analogy based upon the common term Mitzwith apply it to the case where the transgressor becomes aware of his sin after the day of atonement to the effect that he must bring a sin. Offering but why not argue thus granted that when the transgressor becomes aware of his sin after the day of atonement he must still bring a sin offering because the day of atonement does not apply to this specific sin but in the case of the suspensive guilt offering since the offering is brought for the specific sin he thereby receives atonement so that when he becomes aware of his sin after he had offered the suspensive guilt offering he need not bring a sin offering robber replied scripture. Reads that the sin be known to him at all events now that it is established that when he becomes aware of the sin he must still bring a sin offering what purpose did the suspensive guilt offering serve answered Arzara it had the effect that if he died he died without sin robber demurred but if he died death purged him robber therefore answered it had the effect of guarding him from chastisement if a sin offering of a bird was brought for a matter of doubt etc said rabbit nevertheless affected. Atonement if so why must it be buried because it was not guarded when was it not guarded if at the beginning was it not alive if at the end does he not guard it the Mishnah speaks rather of the case where the woman became aware that she did not give birth and by law therefore it should be permitted for use but why must it be buried it is a rabbinical enactment Rab's remark however was stated in connection with the following if a woman brought a sin offering of a bird by reason of a doubt and prior to the pinching of its neck she learned that the birth was a certainty she shall offer it for a certainty for that which she offers in the case of doubt is of the same kind as that which she offers in the case of certainty but if she learned after the pinching of the neck that the birth was normal then Rab says the blood is sprinkled and drained out atonement is affected and the bird is permitted to be eaten or Yohanan says it is forbidden to be eaten as a precautionary measure lest it be Said that a sin offering of a bird in a matter of doubt may be eaten. Levi taught in support of Rab in the case of a sin offering of a bird brought by reason of a doubt. If it is learned after the pinching of the neck that the birth was normal, the blood is sprinkled and drained out. Atonement is effected and it is permitted to be eaten. It was taught in a very in support of our Yohanan in the case of a sin offering of a bird brought by reason of a doubt. If it is learned prior to the pinching of the neck that the birth did not take place, the bird reverts to its profane status or it may be sold to a fellow woman. If it is learned prior to the pinching of the neck that the birth was certain, it is offered as a certain sacrifice for that which she offers in the case of doubt is of the same kind as that which she offers in the case of certainty. If it is learned after the pinching of the neck that the birth did take place, the offering is forbidden even for all use for it was offered from it. Outset for a doubt it has atoned for the doubt and so has served its purpose mission if a man set apart two cellars for a guilt offering and brought there with two rams for a guilt offering if one was of the value of two cellars it may be offered for his guilt offering and the other must be left to pasture until it becomes blemished when it is sold and its price goes to the fund for free will offerings if he had bought with the money two rams for ordinary use one worth two cellars and the other worth ten zuz that which is worth two cellars shall be offered for his guilt offering and the other for his trespass if he had bought with the money one ram for a guilt offering and the other for ordinary use if that for the guilt offering was worth two cellars it shall be offered for his guilt offering and the other for his trespass and with it he shall bring a cellar and its fifth tomorrow what means his trespass which is stated in the first clause and the other for his trespass shall I say it means the ram for the sacrilege guilt offering but can it be said that the fifth is brought together with the ram for the guilt offering bold it is written and he shall make restitution for that which he hath done amiss in the holy thing and shall add the fifth part thereto once we see that it is brought together with the restitution of his misappropriation moreover the last clause states if he had bought with the money one ram for a guilt offering and the other for ordinary use if that for the guilt offering was worth two cellars it shall be offered for his guilt offering and the other for his trespass and with it he shall bring a cellar and its fifth from this too we see that the fifth is brought together with the restitution of his misappropriation rather his trespass means the value he had benefited from the sanctuary which is the amount of the two cellars he had originally set apart for a guilt offering and with which he bought two rams for ordinary use so that the one which is worth two cellars he brings as the ram for his guilt offering and the other which is worth ten zoos he gives as restitution for what he had benefited from the sanctuary which exactly equals the amount of his misappropriation plus one fifth and his trespass means his misappropriation now how did you interpret his trespass stated in the first clause his misappropriation then read the last clause if he had bought with the money one ram for a guilt offering and the other for ordinary use if that for the guilt offering was worth two cellars it shall be offered for his guilt offering and the other for his trespass and with it he shall bring a cellars and its fifth once we see that his trespass means the ram for the sacrilege guilt offering accordingly in the first clause his trespass means his misappropriation Talmud, Moscow the while in the last clause his trespass means the ram for his sacrilege guilt offering in the first clause where the ram which he Bought is exactly equal to the principal and its fifth the tana implies by his trespass his misappropriation in the last clause however where the ram which he bought is not equal to
Not that he bought it for four zoos and improved it so that it is now worth eight zoos. We thus see that a man can obtain atonement with the increase of consecrated property. No, here we are dealing with the case where the shepherd sold it to him at a reduced price. Come and here if a man bought a ram for one cell and he fattened it so that it is now worth two cells, it is valid for a guilt offering. Does not this prove that a man can obtain atonement with the increase of consecrated property? No, it is different where he fattened it for it actually cost him eight zoos. Come and here if a man bought a ram for one cell and it is now worth two cells, it is valid for a guilt offering. Here too he fattened it. If so, is not this identical with the previous case? In the first case, he bought it for four zoos and improved it with four zoos more so that in fact it cost him in all eight zoos. In the second case, he bought the ram for four zoos and improved it with three zoos more and now it is worth eight zoos. If so, read the last clause. But he must pay one seller to the sanctuary. Why so has it not cost him seven zoos? What he must pay is what is wanting to make up the second seller. Now, if you say that a man cannot obtain atonement with the increase of consecrated property, then even if he pays one zoos to make up the seller, what then surely we require a ram costing two sellers, and it is not so. Here, rather, the Tana holds that a man can obtain atonement with the increase of consecrated property. If so, he should not have to make up the seller. This is the reason that he has to make up the seller. It is a precautionary measure. Less people say that a ram worth less than two sellers can make atonement. What is the decision? Come in here. If at the time the ram was set apart, it was worth one seller, but at the time of atonement, it was worth two sellers. He has fulfilled his obligation. Our allies raised the question: Can a man obtain atonement with the increase of consecrated? Property or not thereupon our Yohanan exclaimed how many years is it that this one has been in our midst and has not heard this law from me it would seem then that our Yohanan actually gave a ruling on this indeed yes and he stated it in connection with the following which we learned the young of a thank offering or the substitutes of a thank offering or if a man set aside an animal for his thank offering and it was lost and he then set aside another in its stead and later the original animal was found these do not require the loaves and our Hanan I sent this ruling in the name of our Yohanan they taught so only after atonement had been effected but before atonement had been effected it would require the loaves thus we see that our Yohanan holds that a man can obtain atonement with the increase of consecrated property our Eliezer raised the question can living animals be rejected or not thereupon our Yohanan exclaimed how many years is it that this one has been in our midst and has not Heard this law from me, it would seem then that our Yohanan actually gave a ruling on this. Indeed, yes, for our Yohanan said in the case of an animal belonging to two partners, if one dedicated his half and later bought up the other's half and also dedicated it, the animal is holy but cannot be offered as a sacrifice. Moreover, it can make another animal holy as its substitute, and the substitute is like itself. We learn from this three rulings. We learn that living animals can be rejected, and we learn that what is consecrated only for its value can cause rejection, and we also learn that the law of rejection applies also to what is consecrated only for its value. Our Eliezer raised the question, What is the law if in the whole world lambs became cheap? Do we say that we require your choice vows, which is the case here, or do we require two silver shekels, which is not the case here? Thereupon our Yohanan exclaimed, Many years have we spent in the Beth Hamadrash, but we have not heard this law. We have. Not behold, our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon Biyohe, why did not the Torah fix a value for the animal offerings brought by those lacking atonement? Because it might happen that lambs would become cheap in the whole world and these would never be rendered fit to partake of consecrated food. Say we have not taught this law, but was not our high Abba in the habit of revising all his studies every month before him. Our Yohanan say rather this law was not sought from us in the Beth. Hamadrash the above text stated, our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon Biyohe, why did not the Torah fix a value for the animal offerings brought by those lacking atonement? Because it might happen that lambs would become cheap throughout the world and these would never be rendered fit to partake of consecrated food. Abba in that case the sin offering for eating forbidden fat should have a fixed value since it is brought for atonement and not to render one fit to eat. Consecrated food, Rabbi also demurred in that case the guilt offering of the Nazarite should have a fixed value since it is brought for no apparent reason for our Yohanan said in the name of our Simeon Biyohe the only offering that is brought for no reason is the guilt offering of the Nazarite this is indeed a difficulty Talmud, Moscow the Mishnah if a man set apart his sin offering and then died his son may not offer it after him a man may not offer what was set apart for one sin in respect of another sin moreover even if he had set apart the sin offering for forbidden fat that he had eaten yesterday he may not offer it for forbidden fat that he has eaten today for it is written his offering for his sin the offering must be for that particular sin for which it was set apart tomorrow once do we know this for our rabbis taught his offering implies that he fulfills his obligation with his own offering but not with that of his father I might think that this means that he does not fulfill his obligation in respect of a serious offense with his father's offering which had been set apart for a light offense or vice versa but he does fulfill his obligation in respect of a light offense with what his father had set apart also for a light offense or his obligation in respect of a serious offense with what his father had set apart also for a serious offense therefore scripture states once again his offering to show that he fulfills his obligation with his own offering only but not with that of his father again I might think that he does not fulfill his obligation in respect of either a light or serious offense with the animal which his father had set apart also for an offense of a similar degree of gravity since it is established that a man cannot make use of his Nazi right father's animal for his own Nazi right offerings but he does fulfill his obligation with money which his father had set apart and even transfer what was assigned for a light offense to a serious offense and vice versa since it is established that a man may make use of his Nazi right father's money for his own Nazi right offerings provided that it was unspecified money and not earmarked therefore scripture states at the time his offering to show that he fulfills his obligation with his own offering only but not with that of his father I might further think that he does not fulfill his obligation even with money which his father had set apart albeit for an offense of equal gravity but he does fulfill his obligation with an offering which he himself had set apart even transferring what was set apart for a serious offense to a light offense or vice versa scripture therefore states his offering for his sin to show that the offering must be for the particular sin for which the animal was set apart I might further think that he does not fulfill his obligation with an animal which he had set apart for himself albeit for an offense of Equal gravity since we know that if he set apart an animal as an offering for his eating forbidden fat and brought it as an offering for his eating blood or vice versa he has thereby not been guilty of misappropriation and he has not received atonement therewith but he does fulfill his obligation with money which he had set apart for himself whether or not there is a change in the gravity of the offense since we know that if he set apart for himself money for an offering for his eating forbidden fat and used it for an offering for his eating blood or vice versa he has thereby become guilty of misappropriation and he receives atonement therewith therefore scripture states his offering for his sin to show that the offering must be for the particular sin for which the money was assigned what is meant by he has thereby not been guilty of misappropriation and he has not received atonement therewith Rab Samuel B. Shimei explained it before Rab Papa it means since he cannot Possibly thereby become guilty of misappropriation consequently he cannot receive atonement therewith and this being so he obviously cannot use it the animal for something else in the case of money however which was set apart for one purpose since if he used it for something else he has thereby become guilty of misappropriation and must bring a guilt offering for his misappropriation I might think that he may bring another offering even at the outset we are therefore informed that he may not do so Mishnah one may bring with money dedicated to buy a lamb for a sin offering a goat or with what was dedicated to buy a goat one may bring a lamb or with what was dedicated to buy a lamb or a goat one may bring turtle doves or young pigeons or with what was dedicated to buy turtle doves or young pigeons one may bring the tenth of an ephah how is this thus if a man set apart money for a lamb or a goat and he became poor he may bring a bird offering if he became still Poor he may bring the tenth of an ephah if a man set apart money for the tenth of an ephah and he became rich he must bring a burnt offering if he became still richer he must bring a lamb or a goat if a man set apart a lamb or a goat and they suffered a blemish he may if he so wishes bring with their price a burnt offering but if he set apart a burnt offering and it suffered a
a part of burnt offering and it suffered a blemish he may not bring with its price the tenth of an ephah since a burnt offering cannot be redeemed therefore scripture states from his sin offering and to his sin offering and it is necessary for scripture to state from his sin offering in connection with a lamb or a goat as well as in connection with the burnt offering for if the expression had only been stated in connection with money set apart for a lamb or a goat then I might have said that if he set apart money for a lamb or a goat and he became poor part of that money may be applied to a burnt offering and he brings a burnt offering since a lamb and a burnt offering are both blood offerings but as for the tenth of an ephah since it is not a blood offering I might have said had not the expression from his sin offering been stated in connection with the burnt offering that if he set apart money for a pair of birds and he became poor he may not bring with it the tenth of an ephah for it is not a blood offering but he must bring the tenth of an ephah from his house whilst that money which he had set apart shall fall to the fund for free will offerings therefore scripture also stated from his sin offering in connection with the burnt offering to teach you that with the money dedicated to buy a burnt offering he may also bring the tenth of an ephah and why is the expression to his sin offering stated in connection with the tenth of an ephah to teach you that if a man set apart money for the tenth of an ephah and before he brought the offering he became rich he must add more money to it and bring a burnt offering and if he became still richer he must add further money to it and bring a lamb or a goat and why is the expression to his sin offering stated in connection with the tenth of an ephah and not in connection with the burnt offering if the expression to his sin offering were stated in connection with the burnt offering I might have said that only if he had said Apart money for a pair of birds and he became rich may he add more money to it and bring a lamb or a goat since they are both blood offerings but if he set apart money for the tenth of an ephah and he became rich then if he did not become very rich he must bring from his house a bird offering and if he became very rich he must bring from his house a lamb or a goat whilst that money which he had originally set apart shall fall to the fund for free will offerings therefore scripture stated the expressions from his sin offering in connection with the offering brought by a man when rich and also in connection with the offering brought by a man when poor and the expression to his sin offering in connection with the offering brought by a man when very poor to teach you the expositions as we have stated above our Eliezer said in the name of our Ashai if a rich man who defiled the sanctuary had set apart a pair of birds Talmud, Moskirita instead of his lamb that he was due. To bring and he became poor since the offering was rejected it remains rejected said Rabbi the son of our Joshua from this we learn three things we learn that living animals can be rejected that what is consecrated only for its money value can cause rejection and that what was rejected be it even at the very outset remains rejected permanently our Akbabi had raised an objection if a man set apart before the Passover a female lamb for his Passover offering it must be left to pasture until it suffers a blemish when it must be sold and with the price thereof he may bring a Passover offering if it gave birth to a male it must be left to pasture until it suffers a blemish when it is sold and with the price thereof he may bring a Passover offering our Simeon says it itself may be brought as a Passover offering we thus learn from the opinion of our Simeon that living animals are not rejected our Ashai replied I stated my view in accordance with the opinion of the rabbis for it is only our Simeon who holds that living animals are not rejected for it was taught if one of the two goats died he may bring another without further casting of lots this is the opinion of our Simeon we thus see that he holds that living animals are not rejected neither is the casting of lots indispensable Rav Hisdah said bird offerings are designated only at the time of purchase by the owner or at the time of offering by the priest said Rav Shimai B. Ashi what is the reason for Rav Hisdah's view because it is written and she shall take two turtle doves etc and also and the priest shall offer etc thereby indicating that the designation is made either at the time of purchase by the owner or at the time of offering by the priest an objection was raised and Aaron shall present the goat upon which the lot fell for the Lord and make it a sin offering this implies that the lot makes it a sin offering but designation does not make it a sin offering for without this text I would have argued that Reverse by a fortiori reasoning thus if in a case where the lot does not sanctify designation does then surely where the lot sanctifies designation does so all the more therefore scripture stated and make it a sin offering to intimate that the lot only makes it a sin offering but designation does not make it a sin offering now in the argument designation was equated with the lot and as the lot is effective not necessarily at the time of purchase or at the time of offering so designation is effective not necessarily at the time of purchase or at the time of offering Rabbi answered this was the argument if in a case where the lot does not sanctify even when cast at the time of purchase or at the time of offering designation does sanctify if made either at the time of purchase or at the time of offering then surely where the lot sanctifies outside the time of purchase or the time of offering designation sanctifies all the more either at the time of purchase or at the time of offering therefore scripture stated and make it a sin offering to intimate that the lot only makes it a sin offering but designation does not make it a sin offering an objection was raised if a poor man who defiled the sanctuary had set apart money for his burnt offering and he became rich and afterwards said this money shall be for my sin offering and this for my burnt offering he may add to the money assigned for his burnt sin offering and bring there with his obligation but he may not add to the money assigned for his burnt burnt offering and bring there with his obligation now here the designation was made neither at the time of purchase nor at the time of offering and yet it states that he may bring his obligation from the money assigned for his sin offering but not from that assigned for his burnt offering thereupon rap she's hate said and do you think that the very is in order it surely is not for it says and he became rich and afterwards said Whereas our Eliezer said in the name of our Ashai that if a rich man who defiled the sanctuary brought a poor man's offering he has not fulfilled his obligation but you must rather say that he had already designated it when he was still poor than here too we will say that he had already designated it when he set apart the money but according to our Haggah who said in the name of our Ashai that he thereby fulfilled his obligation what can be said read in the very and afterwards he bought and said an objection was raised if a poor leper brought the offerings of a rich leper he has fulfilled his obligation if a rich leper brought the offerings of a poor leper he has not fulfilled his obligation is not this a refutation of our Haggah's ruling in the name of our Ashai he can reply it is different in the case of a leper for the divine law imposed their limitation by the word this if so then even a poor leper who brought the offerings of a rich leper should not thereby fulfill his Obligation how could this be surely this case was included by the expression the law and so it was taught the expression the law includes the case of a poor leper who brought a rich leper's offering that he has thereby fulfilled his obligation I might think however that even where a rich leper brought a poor leper's offering he has also fulfilled his obligation therefore scripture added this let us then infer from its scripture states and if he be poor and his means suffice not signifying that only he the leper when rich does not fulfill his obligation with a poor man's offering but a rich man who defiled the sanctuary and who brought a poor man's offering has thereby fulfilled his obligation Mishnah Simeon says lambs come before goats in all places you might think that it is because they are choicer therefore scripture stated and if he bring a lamb as his offering to teach that both are equal turtle doves come before young pigeons in all places you might think that it is because they are choicer therefore scripture stated a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering to teach that both are equal the father comes before the mother in all places you might think that it is because the honor due to the father exceeds the honor due to the mother therefore scripture stated yes shall fear every man his mother and his father to teach that both are equal but the sages have said the father comes before the mother in all places because both a man and his mother are bound to honor the father and so it is also with the study of the law if the son has been worthy to sit before the teacher the teacher comes before the father in all places because both a man and his father are bound to honor the teacher Gemara our rabbis taught four cries did the temple court cry out the first cry caused the sons of Eli Hophni and Phinehas to depart hence for they defiled the temple the second cry open O ye gates and let Yohan and the son of Nidbei the disciple of Pinkai enter and Fill his stomach with the divine sacrifices. It was said of the son of Nidbei that he used to eat for sea of young birds Talmud. Mosque Hirath be as a dessert for his meal. It was said that as long as he lived, never was there not heart in the temple. The third cry lift up your heads, O ye gates, and let Elis Hamma, the son of Pekai, the disciple of Phinehas, enter and serve in the office of the high priest. With the fourth cry open, O ye gates, and cause his Ishara of
All places you might think that it is because they are choice or therefore scripture stated and if he bring a lamb as his sin offering to teach that both are equal, Robin has said he had not studied even scripture for it is written if he brings a lamb and if his offering be a goat or Eliezer said in the name of our hand of the disciples of the sages increase peace in the world as it is said and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children read not thy children but thy builders bonaic.